Section 34 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. The fasci and muscles of the trunk, the deep muscles of the back. The muscles of the trunk may be arranged in six groups. One, deep muscles of the back. Two, suboccipital muscles. Three, muscles of the thorax. Four, muscles of the abdomen. Five, muscles of the pelvis. Six, muscles of the perineum. The deep muscles of the back. The deep or intrinsic muscles of the back consist of a complex group of muscles extending from the pelvis to the skull. They are splenius capitis, splenius cervicis, sacrospinalis, semispinalis, multifidus, rotatories, interspinalis, intertransversarii. The lumbodorsal fascia, fascia lumbodorsalis, lumbar aponeurosis, and vertebral fascia. The lumbodorsal fascia is a deep investing membrane which covers the deep muscles of the back of the trunk. Above, it passes in front of the serratus posterior superior and is continuous with a similar investing layer on the back of the neck, the nuchal fascia. In the thoracic region, the lumbodorsal fascia is a thin fibrous lamina which serves to bind down the extensor muscles of the vertebral column and to separate them from the muscles connecting the vertebral column to the upper extremity. It contains both longitudinal and transverse fibers and is attached medially to the spinous processes of the thoracic vertebrae, laterally to the angles of the ribs. In the lumbar region, the fascia, lumbar aponeurosis, is in two layers, anterior and posterior. The posterior layer is attached to the spinous processes of the lumbar and sacral vertebrae and to the supraspinal ligament. The anterior layer is attached medially to the tips of the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae and to the intertransverse ligaments, below to the iliolumbar ligament and above to the lumbocostal ligament. The two layers unite at the lateral margin of the sacrospinalis to form the tendon of origin of the transversus abdominis. The aponeurosis of origin of the serratus posterior inferior and the latissimus dorsi are intimately blended with the lumbodorsal fascia. The splenius capitis arises from the lower half of the ligamentum nuchae, from the spinous process of the seventh cervical vertebra, and from the spinous processes of the upper three or four thoracic vertebrae. The fibers of the muscle are directed upward and lateralward and are inserted under cover of the sternocleidomastoideus into the mastoid process of the temporal bone and into the rough surface on the occipital bone just below the lateral third of the superior nuchal line. The splenius cervices, splenius cali, arises by a narrow tendinous band from the spinous processes of the third to the sixth thoracic vertebrae. It is inserted by tendinous fasciculi into the posterior tubercles of the transverse processes of the upper two or three cervical vertebrae. Variations The origin is frequently moved up or down one or two vertebrae. Accessory slips are occasionally found. Nerves. The splenii are supplied by the lateral branches of the posterior divisions of the middle and lower cervical nerves. Actions. The splenii of the two sides, acting together, draw the head directly backward, assisting the trapezius and semispinalis capitis. Acting separately, they draw the head to one side and slightly rotate it, turning the face to the same side. They also assist in supporting the head in the erect position. The sacrospinalis, erector spiny, and its prolongations in the thoracic and cervical regions lie in the groove on the side of the vertebral column. They are covered in the lumbar and thoracic regions by the lumbodorsal fascia and in the cervical region by the nuchal fascia. This large muscular and tendinous mass varies in size and structure at different parts of the vertebral column. In the sacral region it is narrow and pointed, and in its origin chiefly tendinous in structure. In the lumbar region it is larger and forms a thick fleshy mass which, on being followed upward, is subdivided into three columns. These gradually diminish in size as they ascend to be inserted into the vertebrae and ribs. The sacrospinalis arises from the anterior surface of a broad and thick tendon which is attached to the medial crest of the sacrum, to the spinous processes of the lumbar and the eleventh and twelfth thoracic vertebrae, and the supraspinal ligament to the back part of the inner lip of the iliac crest and to the lateral crest of the sacrum where it blends with the sacrotuberous and posterior sacroiliac ligaments. 
Some of its fibers are continuous with the fibers of origin of the gluteus maximus. The muscular fibers form a large fleshy mass which splits in the upper lumbar region into three columns, vitalicet a lateral, the iliocostalis, an intermediate, the longissimus, and a medial, the spinalis. Each of these consists from below upward of three parts as follows. Lateral column, iliocostalis. A, I lumborum. B, I dorsi. C, I cervices. Intermediate column, longissimus. A, L dorsi. B, L cervices. C, L capitis. Medial column, spinalis. A, S dorsi. B, S cervices. C, S capitis. The iliocostalis lumborum, iliocostalis muscle, sacrolumbalis muscle, is inserted by six or seven flattened tendons into the inferior borders of the angles of the lower six or seven ribs. The iliocostalis dorsi, musculus accessorius, arises by flattened tendons from the upper borders of the angles of the lower six ribs medial to the tendons of insertion of the iliocostalis lumborum. These become muscular and are inserted into the upper borders of the angles of the upper six ribs and into the back of the transverse process of the seventh cervical vertebra. The iliocostalis cervicis, cervicalis ascendens, arises from the angles of the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth ribs, and is inserted into the posterior tubercles of the transverse processes of the fourth, fifth, and sixth cervical vertebrae. The longissimus dorsi is the intermediate and largest of the continuations of the sacrospinalis. In the lumbar region, where it is as yet blended with the iliocostalis lumborum, some of its fibers are attached to the whole length of the posterior surfaces of the transverse processes and the accessory processes of the lumbar vertebrae, and to the anterior layer of the lumbodorsal fascia. In the thoracic region, it is inserted by rounded tendons into the tips of the transverse processes of all the thoracic vertebrae, and by fleshy processes into the lower nine or ten ribs between their tubercles and angles. The longissimus cervicis, transversalis cervicis, situated medial to the longissimus dorsi, arises by long thin tendons from the summits of the transverse processes of the upper four or five thoracic vertebrae, and is inserted by similar tendons into the posterior tubercles of the transverse processes of the cervical vertebrae from the second to the sixth inclusive. The longissimus capitis, trachylomastoid muscle, lies medial to the longissimus cervicis between it and the semispinalis capitis. It arises by tendons from the transverse processes of the upper four or five thoracic vertebrae and the articular processes of the lower three or four cervical vertebrae and is inserted into the posterior margin of the mastoid process beneath the splenius capitis and sternocleida mastoideus. It is almost always crossed by a tendinous intersection near its insertion. The spinalis dorsi, the medial continuation of the sacrospinalis, is scarcely separable as a distinct muscle. It is situated at the medial side of the longissimus dorsi and is intimately blended with it. It arises by three or four tendons from the spinous processes of the first two lumbar and the last two thoracic vertebrae. These uniting form a small muscle which is inserted by separate tendons into the spinous processes of the upper thoracic vertebrae, the number varying from four to eight. It is intimately united with the semispinalis dorsi situated beneath it. The spinalis cervicis, spinalis colli, is an inconstant muscle which arises from the lower part of the ligamentum nuchae, the spinous process of the seventh cervical, and sometimes from the spinous processes of the first and second thoracic vertebrae, and is inserted into the spinous process of the axis, and occasionally into the spinous processes of the two vertebrae below it. The spinalis capitis, biventer cervicis, is usually inseparably connected with the semispinalis capitis. See below. The semispinalis dorsi consists of thin, narrow, fleshy fasciculi interposed between tendons of considerable length. It arises by a series of small tendons from the transverse processes of the sixth to the tenth thoracic vertebrae and is inserted by tendons into the spinous processes of the upper four thoracic and lower two cervical vertebrae. The semispinalis cervices, semispinalis colli, thicker than the preceding, arises by a series of tendinous and fleshy fibers from the transverse processes of the upper five or six thoracic vertebrae, and is inserted into the cervical spinous processes from the axis to the fifth inclusive. The fasciculus connected with the axis is the largest and is chiefly muscular in structure.
The semispinalis capitis, complexus, is situated at the upper and back part of the neck, beneath the splenius, and medial to the longissimus cervicis in capitis. It arises by a series of tendons from the tips of the transverse processes of the upper six or seven thoracic and the seventh cervical vertebrae, and from the articular processes of the three cervical above this. The tendons, uniting, form a broad muscle which passes upward and is inserted between the superior and inferior nuchal lines of the occipital bone. The medial part, usually more or less distinct from the remainder of the muscle, is frequently termed the spinalis capitis. It is also named the biventer cervices, since it is traversed by an imperfect tendinous inscription. The multifidus, multifidus spiny, consists of a number of fleshy and tendinous fasciculi which fill up the groove on either side of the spinous processes of the vertebrae, from the sacrum to the axis. In the sacral region, these fasciculi arise from the back of the sacrum, as low as the fourth sacral foramen, from the aponeurosis of origin of the sacrospinalis, from the medial surface of the posterior superior iliac spine, and from the posterior sacroiliac ligaments. In the lumbar region, from all the mammillary processes, in the thoracic region, from all the transverse processes, and in the cervical region, from the articular processes of the lower four vertebrae. Each fasciculus, passing obliquely upward and medialward, is inserted into the whole length of the spinous process of one of the vertebrae above. These fasciculi vary in length. The most superficial, the longest, pass from one vertebra to the third or fourth above. Those next in order run from one vertebra to the second or third above, while the deepest connect two contiguous vertebrae. The rotatories, rotatories spiny, lie beneath the multifidus and are found only in the thoracic region. They are eleven in number on either side. Each muscle is small and somewhat quadrilateral in form. It arises from the upper and back part of the transverse process and is inserted into the lower border and lateral surface of the lamina of the vertebra above, the fibers extending as far as the root of the spinous process. The first is found between the first and second thoracic vertebrae, the last between the eleventh and twelfth. Sometimes the number of these muscles is diminished by the absence of one or more from the upper or lower end. The interspinales are short muscular fasciculi placed in pairs between the spinous processes of the contiguous vertebrae, one on either side of the interspinal ligament. In the cervical region they are most distinct and consist of six pairs, the first being situated between the axis and third vertebra, and the last between the seventh cervical and the first thoracic. They are small narrow bundles attached above and below to the apices of the spinous processes. In the thoracic region they are found between the first and second vertebrae, and sometimes between the second and third, and between the eleventh and twelfth. In the lumbar region there are four pairs in the intervals between the five lumbar vertebrae. There is also occasionally one between the last thoracic and first lumbar, and one between the fifth lumbar and the sacrum. The extensor coccygis is a slender muscular fasciculus which is not always present. It extends over the lower part of the posterior surface of the sacrum and coccyx. It arises by tendinous fibers from the last segment of the sacrum, or first piece of the coccyx, and passes downward to be inserted into the lower part of the coccyx. It is a rudiment of the extensor muscle of the caudal vertebrae of the lower animals. The intertransversarii Intertransversales are small muscles placed between the transverse processes of the vertebrae. In the cervical region they are best developed, consisting of rounded muscular and tendinous fasciculi, and are placed in pairs passing between the anterior and the posterior tubercles, respectively, of the transverse processes of two contiguous vertebrae, and separated from one another by an anterior primary division of the cervical nerve, which lies in the groove between them. The muscles connecting the anterior tubercles are termed the intertransversarii anterioris, those between the posterior tubercles, the intertransversarii posterioris, both sets are supplied by the anterior divisions of the spinal nerves. There are seven pairs of these muscles, the first pair being between the atlas and axis, and the last pair between the seventh cervical and first thoracic vertebrae. In the thoracic region, they are present between the transverse processes of the lower three thoracic vertebrae, and between the transverse processes of the last thoracic and the first lumbar. In the lumbar region, they are arranged in pairs on either side of the vertebral column, one set occupying the entire interspace between the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae, the intertransversarii laterales, the other set, intertransversarii mediales, passing from the accessory process of one vertebra to the mammillary of the vertebra below. 
The intertransversaria laterales are supplied by the anterior divisions and the intertransversaria mediales by the posterior divisions of the spinal nerves. End of section 34. Section 35 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. Suboccipital Muscles. The suboccipital group comprises rectus capitis posterior major, rectus capitis posterior minor, obliquus capitis inferior, obliquus capitis superior. The rectus capitis posterior major, rectus capitis posticus major, arises by a pointed tendon from the spinous process of the axis, and, becoming broader as it ascends, is inserted into the lateral part of the inferior nuchal line of the occipital bone and the surface of the bone immediately below the line. As the muscles of the two sides pass upward and lateralward, they leave between them a triangular space, in which the recti capitis posteriores minores are seen. The rectus capitis posterior minor, rectus capitis posticus minor, arises by a narrow pointed tendon from the tubercle on the posterior arch of the atlas, and, widening as it ascends, is inserted into the medial part of the inferior nuchal line of the occipital bone and the surface between it and the foramen magnum. The obliquus capitis inferior, obliquus inferior, the larger of the two oblique muscles, arises from the apex of the spinous process of the axis, and passes lateralward and slightly upward to be inserted into the lower and back part of the transverse process of the atlas. The obliquus capitis superior, obliquus superior, narrow below, wide and expanded above, arises by tendinous fibers from the upper surface of the transverse process of the atlas, joining with the insertion of the preceding. It passes upward and medialward, and is inserted into the occipital bone between the superior and inferior nuchal lines, lateral to the semispinalis capitis. The suboccipital triangle between the obliquy and the rectus capitis posterior major is the suboccipital triangle. It is bounded above and medially by the rectus capitis posterior major, above and laterally by the obliquus capitis superior, below and laterally by the obliquus capitis inferior. It is covered by a layer of dense fibro fatty tissue situated beneath the semispinalis capitis. The floor is formed by the posterior occipital atlantal membrane and the posterior arch of the atlas. In the deep groove on the upper surface of the posterior arch of the atlas are the vertebral artery and the first cervical or suboccipital nerve. Nerves. The deep muscles of the back and the suboccipital muscles are supplied by the posterior primary divisions of the spinal nerves. Actions. The sacrospinalis and its upward continuations and the spinalis serve to maintain the vertebral column in the erect posture. They also serve to bend the trunk backward when it is required to counterbalance the influence of any weight at the front of the body, as, for instance, when a heavy weight is suspended from the neck, or when there is any great abdominal distension, as in pregnancy or dropsy. The peculiar gait under such circumstances depends upon the vertebral column being drawn backward by the counterbalancing action of the sacrospinalis. The muscles which form the continuation of the sacrospinalis onto the head and neck steady those parts and fix them in a, the upright position. If the iliocostalis lumborum and longissimus dorsi of one side act, they serve to draw down the chest and vertebral column to the corresponding side. The iliocostalis cervicus taking their fixed points from the cervical vertebrae, elevate those ribs to which they are attached. Taking their fixed points from the ribs, both muscles help to extend the neck, while one muscle bends the neck to its own side. When both longissimi cervicus act from below, they bend the neck backward. When both longissimi capitis act from below, they bend the head backward, while, if only one muscle acts, the face is turned to the side on which the muscle is acting and then the head is bent to the shoulder. The two recti draw the head backward. 
the rectus capitis posterior major, owing to its obliquity, rotates the skull, with the atlas, around the odontoid process, turning the face to the same side. The multifidus acts successively upon the different parts of the column, thus the sacrum furnishes a fixed point from which the fasciculi of this muscle acts upon the lumbar region, which in turn becomes the fixed point for the fasciculi moving the thoracic region, and so on throughout the entire length of the column. The multifidus also serves to rotate the column, so that the front of the trunk is turned to the side opposite to that from which the muscle acts this muscle being assisted in its action by the obliquus externus abdominis. The obliquus capitis superior draws the head backward and to its own side. The obliquus inferior rotates the atlas, and with it the skull, around the odontoid process, turning the face to the same side. When the semispinales of the two sides act together, they help to extend the vertebral column. When the muscles of only one side act, they rotate the thoracic and cervical parts of the column, turning the body to the opposite side. The semispinales capitis draw the head directly backward if one muscle acts. It draws the head to one side and rotates it so that the face is turned to the opposite side. The interspinales, by approximating the spinous processes, help to extend the column. The intertransversarii approximate the transverse processes and help to bend the column to one side. The rotatores assist the multifidus to rotate the vertebral column so that the front of the trunk is turned to the side opposite to that from which the muscles act. End of section number 35。section 36 of Gray's Anatomy, part 2。this is a LibriVox recording。all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain。for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by morgan scorpion anatomy of the human body part 2 by henry gray muscles of the thorax part 1 6 c the muscles of the thorax the muscles belonging to this group are the intercostales externi intercostales interni subcostales Transversus thoracis, levatores costarum, serratus posterior superior, serratus posterior inferior, diaphragm. Intercostal fasciae. In each intercostal space, thin but firm layers of fascia cover the outer surface of the intercostalis externus and the inner surface of the intercostalis internus, and a third, more delicate layer, is interposed between the two planes of muscular fibres. They are best marked in those situations where the muscular fibres are deficient, as between the intercostales externi and sternum in front, and between the intercostales interni and vertebral column behind. The intercostales, intercostal muscles, are two thin planes of muscular and tendinous fibres occupying each of the intercostal spaces. They are named external and internal from their surface relations the external being superficial to the internal. The intercostales externi, external intercostals, are eleven in number on either side. They extend from the tubercles of the ribs behind to the cartilages of the ribs in front, where they end in thin membranes, the anterior intercostal membranes, which are continued forward to the sternum. Each arises from the lower border of a rib and is inserted into the upper border of the rib below. In the two lower spaces they extend to the ends of the cartilages, and in the upper two or three spaces they do not quite reach the ends of the ribs. They are thicker than the intercostales interni, and their fibres are directed obliquely downward and lateralward on the back of the thorax, and downward, forward, and medialward on the front. Variations Continuation with the obliquus externus or serratus anterior. A supracostalis muscle, from the anterior end of the first rib down to the second, third, or fourth ribs occasionally occurs. The intercostales interni, internal intercostals, are also eleven in number on either side. They commence anteriorly at the sternum in the interspaces between the cartilages of the true ribs and the anterior extremities of the cartilages of the false ribs, and extend backward as far as the angles of the ribs, whence they are continued to the vertebral column by thin aponeuroses the posterior intercostal membranes. 
each arises from the ridge on the inner surface of a rib, as well as from the corresponding costal cartilage, and is inserted into the upper border of the rib below. Their fibres are also directed obliquely, but pass in a direction opposite to those of the intercostales externi. The subcostales, infracostales, consist of muscular and aponeurotic fasciculi, which are usually well developed only in the lower part of the thorax. Each arises from the inner surface of one rib near its angle, and is inserted into the inner surface of the second or third rib below. Their fibres run in the same direction as those of the intercostales interni. The transversus thoracis, triangularis sterni, is a thin plate of muscular and tendinous fibres situated upon the inner surface of the front wall of the chest. It arises on either side from the lower third of the posterior surface of the body of the sternum, from the posterior surface of the xiphoid process, and from the sternal ends of the costal cartilages of the lower three or four true ribs. Its fibres diverge upward and lateralward, to be inserted by slips into the lower borders and inner surfaces of the costal cartilages of the second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth ribs. The lowest fibres of this muscle are horizontal in their direction, and are continuous with those of the transversus abdominis. The intermediate fibres are oblique, while the highest are almost vertical. This muscle varies in its attachments, not only in different subjects, but on opposite sides of the same subject. The levatoris costarum, twelve in number on either side, are small tendinous and fleshy bundles, which arise from the ends of the transverse processes of the seventh cervical and upper eleven thoracic vertebrae. They pass obliquely downward and lateralward, like the fibres of the intercostales externi, and each is inserted into the outer surface of the rib immediately below the vertebra from which it takes origin, between the tubercle and the angle, levatoris costarum breves. Each of the four lower muscles divides into two fasciculae, one of which is inserted as above described, the other passes down to the second rib below its origin, levatoris costarum longi. The serratus posterior superior, serratus posticus superior, is a thin quadrilateral muscle situated at the upper and back part of the thorax. It arises by a thin and broad upper neurosis from the lower part of the ligamentum nuci, from the spinous processes of the seventh cervical and upper two or three thoracic vertebrae, and from the supraspinal ligament. Inclining downward and lateralward, it becomes muscular, and is inserted, by four fleshy digitations, into the upper borders of the second, third, fourth, and fifth ribs, a little beyond their angles. Variations Increase or decrease in size and number of slips, or entire absence. The serratus posterior inferior, serratus posticus inferior, is situated at the junction of the thoracic and lumbar regions. It is of an irregularly quadrilateral form, broader than the preceding, and separated from it by a wide interval. It arises by a thin aponeurosis from the spinous processes of the lower two thoracic and upper two or three lumbar vertebrae, and from the supraspinal ligament. Passing obliquely upward and lateralward, it becomes fleshy, and divides into four flat digitations, which are inserted into the inferior borders of the lower four ribs, a little beyond their angles. The thin aponeurosis of origin is intimately blended with the lumbar dorsal fascia and aponeurosis of the latissimus dorsi. Variations Increase or decrease in size and number of slips or entire absence. Nerves The muscles of this group are supplied by the intercostal nerves. The diaphragm is a dome-shaped muscular fibrous septum which separates the thoracic from the abdominal cavity, its convex upper surface forming the floor of the former, and its concave undersurface the roof of the latter. Its peripheral part consists of muscular fibres which take origin from the circumference of the thoracic outlet and converge to be inserted into a central tendon. The muscular fibres may be grouped according to their origins into three parts, sternal, costal and lumbar. The sternal part arises by two fleshy slips from the back of the xiphoid process. The costal part from the inner surfaces of the cartilages and adjacent portions of the lower six ribs on either side, interdigitating with the transversus abdominis, and the lumbar part from the upper neurotic arches, named the lumbocostal arches, and from the lumbar vertebrae by two pillars or crura. There are two lumbocostal arches, 
a medial and a lateral on either side. The medial lumbar costal arch, arcus lumbar costalis medialis, haleri, internal arcuate ligament, is a tendinous arch in the fascia covering the upper part of the psoas major. Medially it is continuous with the lateral tendinous margin of the corresponding cruce, and is attached to the side of the body of the first or second lumbar vertebra. Laterally it is fixed to the front of the transverse process of the first, and sometimes also to that of the second lumbar vertebra. The lateral lumbar costal arch, arcus lumbar costalis lateralis, haleri, external arcuate ligament, arches across the upper part of the quadratus lumborum, and is attached, medially, to the front of the transverse process of the first lumbar vertebra, and, laterally, to the tip and lower margin of the twelfth rib. The crura. At their origins the crura are tenderness in structure, and blend with the anterior longitudinal ligament of the vertebral column. The right crus, larger and longer than the left, arises from the anterior surfaces of the bodies and intervertebral fibre cartilages of the upper three lumbar vertebrae, while the left crus arises from the corresponding parts of the upper two only. The medial tendinous margins of the crura pass forward and medialward, and meet in the middle line to form an arch across the front of the aorta. This arch is often poorly defined. From this series of origins, the fibres of the diaphragm converge to be inserted into the central tendon. The fibres arising from the xiphoid process are very short, and occasionally aponeurotic. Those from the medial and lateral lumbar costal arches, and more especially those from the ribs and their cartilages, are longer, and describe marked curves as they ascend and converge to their insertion. The fibres of the crura diverge as they ascend, the most lateral being directed upward and lateralward, to the central tendon. The medial fibres of the right crus ascend on the left side of the oesophageal hiatus, and occasionally a fasciculus of the left crus crosses the aorta and runs obliquely through the fibres of the right crus toward the vena cabal foramen. The central tendon. The central tendon of the diaphragm is a thin but strong aponeurosis situated near the centre of the vault formed by the muscle but somewhat closer to the front than to the back of the thorax, so that the posterior muscular fibres are the longer. It is situated immediately below the pericardium, with which it is partially blended. It is shaped somewhat like a trefoil leaf, consisting of three divisions or leaflets, separated from one another by slight indentations. The right leaflet is the largest, the middle, directed towards the xiphoid process, the next in size, and the left the smallest. In structure the tendon is composed of several planes of fibres, which intersect one another at various angles and unite into straight or curved bundles, an arrangement which gives it additional strength. End of section number 36「Section 37 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2 – this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray Muscles of the Thorax, Part 2 Openings in the Diaphragm the diaphragm is pierced by a series of apertures to permit of the passage of structures between the thorax and the abdomen. Three large openings, the aortic, the esophageal, and the vena cava, and a series of smaller ones are described. The aortic hiatus is the lowest and most posterior of the large apertures. It lies at the level of the twelfth thoracic vertebra. Strictly speaking, it is not an aperture in the diaphragm, but an osseoaponeurotic opening between it and the vertebral column, and therefore behind the diaphragm. Occasionally, some tendinous fibres, prolonged across the bodies of the vertebrae from the medial part of the lower ends of the crura, pass behind the aorta, and thus convert the hiatus into a fibrous ring. The hiatus is situated slightly to the left of the middle line, and is bounded in front by the crura, and behind by the body of the first lumbar vertebra. Through it pass the aorta, the azygous vein, and the thoracic duct. Occasionally the azygous vein is transmitted through the right crus. 
The esophageal hiatus is situated in the muscular part of the diaphragm at the level of the tenth thoracic vertebra, and is elliptical in shape. It is placed above, in front, and a little to the left of the aortic hiatus, and transmits the esophagus, the vagus nerves, and some small esophageal arteries. The vena carval foramen is the highest of the three, and is situated about the level of the fibrocartilage between the eighth and ninth thoracic vertebrae. It is quadrilateral in form, and is placed at the junction of the right and middle leaflets of the central tendon, so that its margins are tendinous. It transmits the inferior vena cava, the wall of which is adherent to the margins of the opening, and some lesser branches of the right phrenic nerve. Of the lesser apertures, two in the right crus transmit the greater and lesser right splanchnic nerves, three in the left crus give passage to the greater and lesser left splanchnic nerves and the hemiozygous vein. The gangliated trunks of the sympathetic usually enter the abdominal cavity behind the diaphragm under the medial lumbocostal arches. On either side, two small intervals exist at which the muscular fibres of the diaphragm are deficient and are replaced by areolar tissue. One between the sternal and costal parts transmits the superior epigastric branch of the internal mammary artery and some lymphatics from the abdominal wall and convex surface of the liver. The other, between the fibres springing from the medial and lateral lumbocostal arches, is less constant. When this interval exists, the upper and back part of the kidney is separated from the pleura by areolar tissue only. Variations The sternal portion of the muscle is sometimes wanting, and more rarely defects occur in the lateral part of the central tendon or adjoining muscle fibres. Nerves The diaphragm is supplied by the phrenic and lower intercostal nerves. Actions the diaphragm is the principal muscle of inspiration, and presents the form of a dome concave towards the abdomen. The central part of the dome is tenderness, and the pericardium is attached to its upper surface. The circumference is muscular. During inspiration, the lowest ribs are fixed, and from these and the crura, the muscular fibres contract and draw downward and forward the central tendon with the attached pericardium. In this movement, the curvature of the diaphragm is scarcely altered, the dome moving downward nearly parallel to its original position and pushing before it the abdominal viscera. The descent of the abdominal viscera is permitted by the elasticity of the abdominal wall, but the limit of this is soon reached. The central tendon applied to the abdominal viscera then becomes a fixed point for the action of the diaphragm, the effect of which is to elevate the lower ribs and through them to push forward the body of the sternum and the upper ribs. The right cupola of the diaphragm, lying on the liver, has a greater resistance to overcome than the left, which lies over the stomach. But to compensate for this, the right crus and the fibres of the right side generally are stronger than those of the left. In all expulsive acts, the diaphragm is called into action to give additional power to each expulsive effort. Thus, before sneezing, coughing, laughing, crying or vomiting, and previous to the expulsion of urine or faeces, or of the fetus from the uterus, a deep inspiration takes place. The height of the diaphragm is constantly varying during respiration. It also varies with the degree of distension of the stomach and intestines and with the size of the liver. After a forced expiration, the right cupola is on a level in front with the fourth costal cartilage, at the side with the fifth, sixth and seventh ribs, and behind with the eighth rib. The left cupola is a little lower than the right. Hall's Daly, Journal of Anatomy and Physiology, 1908, Volume XLIII, states that the absolute range of movement between deep inspiration and deep expiration averages in the male and female 30 mm on the right side and 28 mm on the left. In quiet respiration, the average movement is 12.5 mm on the right side and 12 mm on the left. Skiography shows that the height of the diaphragm in the thorax varies considerably with the position of the body. It stands highest when the body is horizontal and the patient on his back, and in this position it performs the largest respiratory excursions with normal breathing. When the body is erect, the dome of the diaphragm falls, and its respiratory movements become smaller. The dome falls still lower when the sitting posture is assumed, and in this position its respiratory excursions are smallest. 
These facts may, perhaps, explain why it is that patients suffering from severe dyspnea are most comfortable and least short of breath when they sit up. When the body is horizontal and the patient on his side, the two halves of the diaphragm do not behave alike. The uppermost half sinks to a level lower even than when the patient sits, and moves little with respiration. The lower half rises higher in the thorax than it does when the patient is supine, and its respiratory excursions are much increased. In unilateral disease of the pleura, or lungs, analogous interference with the position or movement of the diaphragm can generally be observed geographically. It appears that the position of the diaphragm in the thorax depends upon three main factors, viz. 1. The elastic retraction of the lung tissue tending to pull it upward. 2. The pressure exerted on its undersurface by the viscera. This naturally tends to be a negative pressure, or downward suction, when the patient sits or stands, and positive, or an upward pressure, when he lies. 3. The intra-abdominal tension due to the abdominal muscles. These are in a state of contraction in the standing position and not in the sitting, hence the diaphragm, when the patient stands, is pushed up higher than when he sits. The intercostales interni and externi have probably no action in moving the ribs. They contract simultaneously and form strong elastic supports which prevent the intercostal spaces being pushed out or drawn in during respiration. The anterior portions of the intercostales interni probably have an additional function in keeping the sternocostal and intercondyl joint surfaces in apposition. The posterior parts of the intercostales externi performing a similar function for the costovertebral articulations. The levatoris costarum being inserted near the fulcra of the ribs can have little action on the ribs. They act as rotators and lateral flexors of the vertebral column. The transversus thoracus draws down the costal cartilages, and is therefore a muscle of expiration. The serrati are respiratory muscles. The serratus posterior superior elevates the ribs and is therefore an inspiratory muscle. The serratus posterior inferior draws the lower ribs downward and backward, and thus elongates the thorax. It also fixes the lower ribs, thus assisting the inspiratory action of the diaphragm and resisting the tendency it has to draw the lower ribs upward and forward. It must therefore be regarded as a muscle of inspiration. Mechanism of Respiration The respiratory movements must be examined during a. Quiet respiration and b. Deep respiration. Quiet respiration the first and second pairs of ribs are fixed by the resistance of the cervical structures, the last pair, and through it the eleventh, by the quadratus lumborum. The other ribs are elevated, so that the first two intercostal spaces are diminished while the others are increased in width. It has already been shown that elevation of the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth ribs leads to an increase in the anteroposterior and transverse diameters of the thorax. The vertical diameter is increased by the descent of the diaphragmatic dome so that the lungs are expanded in all directions except backward and upward. Elevation of the eighth, ninth and tenth ribs is accompanied by a lateral and backward movement, leading to an increase in the transverse diameter of the upper part of the abdomen. The elasticity of the anterior abdominal wall allows a slight increase in the anteroposterior diameter of this part and in this way the decrease in the vertical diameter of the abdomen is compensated and space provided for its displaced viscera. Expiration is effected by the elastic recoil of its walls and by the action of the abdominal muscles, which push back the viscera displaced downward by the diaphragm. Deep respiration. All the movements of quiet respiration are here carried out, but to a greater extent. In deep inspiration, the shoulders and the vertebral borders of the scapulae are fixed and the limb muscles, trapezius, serratus anterior, pectoralis and latissimus dorsi are called into play. The scalini are in strong action, and the sternocleidomastoidae also assist when the head is fixed by drawing up the sternum and by fixing the clavicles. The first rib is therefore no longer stationary, but, with the sternum, is raised. With it, all the other ribs except the last are raised to a higher level. In conjunction with the increased descent of the diaphragm, this provides for a considerable augmentation of all the thoracic diameters. The anterior abdominal muscles come into action so that the umbilicus is drawn upward and backward, but this allows the diaphragm to exert a more powerful influence on the lower ribs. Transverse diameter of the upper part of the abdomen is greatly increased and the subcostal angle opened out. 
the deeper muscles of the back, e.g. the serrati posteriores superiores and the sacrospinales and their continuations, are also brought into action. The thoracic curve of the vertebral column is partially straightened, and the whole column, above the lower lumbar vertebrae, drawn backward. This increases the anteroposterior diameters of the thorax and upper part of the abdomen and widens the intercostal spaces. Deep expiration is effected by the recoil of the walls and by the contraction of the anterolateral muscles of the abdominal wall, and the serrati posteriores inferiores and transversus thoracis. Hall's Dally, of Sid, gives the following figures as representing the average changes which occurred during deepest possible respiration. The manubrium sterni moves 30 mm in an upward and 14 mm in a forward direction. The width of the subcostal angle at a level of 30 mm below the articulation between the body of the sternum and the xiphoid process is increased by 26 mm. The umbilicus is retracted and drawn upward for a distance of 13 mm. End of section 37. Section 38 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To find out more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rebecca Case. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. Muscles and Fascia of the Abdomen, Part 1. The muscles of the abdomen may be divided into two groups. One, the anterolateral muscles. Two, the posterior muscles. One, the anterolateral muscles of the abdomen. The muscles of this group are obliquus externus, obliquus internus, transversus, rectus, pyramidalis. The superficial fascia. The superficial fascia of the abdomen consists, over the greater part of the abdominal wall, of a single layer containing a variable amount of fat, but near the groin it is easily divisible into two layers, between which are found the superficial vessels and nerves and the superficial inguinal lymph glands. The superficial layer, fascia of camper, is thick, areolar in texture, and contains in its meshes a varying quantity of adipose tissue. Below, it passes over the inguinal ligament and is continuous with the superficial fascia of the thigh. In the male, Camper's fascia is continued over the penis and outer surface of the spermatic cord to the scrotum, where it helps to form the dartos. As it passes to the scrotum, it changes its characteristics, becoming thin, destitute of adipose tissue, and of a pale reddish color, and in the scrotum it acquires some involuntary muscular fibers. From the scrotum it may be traced backward into continuity with the superficial fascia of the perineum. In the female, Camper's fascia is continued from the abdomen into the labia majora. The deep layer, fascia of scarpa, is thinner and more membranous in character than the superficial and contains a considerable quantity of yellow elastic fibers. It is loosely connected by areolar tissue to the aponeurosis of the obliquus externus abdominis, but in the middle line it is more intimately adherent to the linea alba and to the pubic symphysis, and is prolonged onto the dorsum of the penis, forming the fundiform ligament. Above, it is continuous with the superficial fascia over the rest of the trunk. Below and laterally, it blends with the fascia lata of the thigh, a little below the inguinal ligament. Medially and below, it is continued over the penis and spermatic cord to the scrotum, where it helps to form the dartos. From the scrotum, it may be traced backward into continuity with the deep layer of the superficial fascia of the perineum, fascia of collies. In the female, it is continued into the labia majora and thence to the fascia of collies. The obliquus externus abdominis, external or descending oblique muscle, situated on the lateral and anterior parts of the abdomen, is the largest and the most superficial of the three flat muscles in this region. It is broad, thin, and irregularly quadrilateral, 
its muscular portion occupying the side, its aponeurosis, the anterior wall of the abdomen. It arises, by eight fleshy digitations, from the external surfaces and inferior borders of the lower eight ribs. These digitations are arranged in an oblique line which run downward and backward, the upper ones being attached close to the cartilages of the corresponding ribs, the lowest to the apex of the cartilage of the last rib, the intermediate ones to the ribs at some distance from their cartilages. The five superior serrations increase in size from above downward and are received between corresponding processes of the serratus anterior. The three lower ones diminish in size from above downward and receive between them corresponding processes from the latissimus dorsi. From these attachments, the fleshy fibers proceed in various directions. Those from the lowest ribs pass nearly vertically downward and are inserted into the anterior half of the outer lip of the iliac crest. The middle and upper fibers, directed downward and forward, end in an aponeurosis, opposite a line drawn from the prominence of the ninth costal cartilage to the anterior superior iliac spine. The aponeurosis of the obliquus externus abdominis is a thin but strong membranous structure, the fibers of which are directed downward and medialward. It is joined with that of the opposite muscle along the middle line and covers the whole of the front of the abdomen. Above, it is covered by and gives origin to the lower fibers of the pectoralis major. Below, its fibers are closely aggregated together and extend obliquely across from the anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle and the pectineal line. In the middle line, it interlaces with the aponeurosis of the opposite muscle, forming the linea alba, which extends from the xiphoid process to the symphysis pubis. That portion of the aponeurosis, which extends between the anterior superior iliac spine and the pubic tubercle, is a thick band, folded inward and continuous below with the fascia lata. It is called the inguinal ligament. The portion which is reflected from the inguinal ligament at the pubic tubercle is attached to the pectineal line and is called the lacunar ligament. From the point of attachment of the latter to the pectineal line, a few fibers pass upward and medialward behind the medial cruce of the subcutaneous inguinal ring to the linea alba. They diverge as they ascend and form a thin triangular fibrous band which is called the reflected inguinal ligament. In the aponeurosis of the obliquus externus, immediately above the crest of the pubis, is a triangular opening, the cutaneous inguinal ring formed by a separation of the fibers of the aponeurosis in this situation. The following structures require further description, viz. the subcutaneous inguinal ring, the intracrural fibers and fascia, and the inguinal, lacunar, and reflected inguinal ligaments. The subcutaneous inguinal ring, annulus inguinalis subcutaneous, external abdominal ring. The subcutaneous inguinal ring is an interval in the aponeurosis of the obliquus externus, just above and lateral to the crest of the pubis. The aperture is oblique in direction, somewhat triangular in form, and corresponds with the course of the fibers of the aponeurosis. It usually measures from base to apex about 2.5 centimeters and transversely about 1.25 centimeters. It is bounded below by the crest of the pubis, on either side by the margins of the opening in the aponeurosis, which are called the crura of the ring, and above by a series of curved intracrural fibers. The inferior crus, external pillar, is the stronger and is formed by that portion of the inguinal ligament which is inserted into the pubic tubercle. It is curved so as to form a kind of groove upon which, in the male, the spermatic cord rests. The superior crus, or internal pillar, is a broad, thin, flat band attached to the front of the symphysis pubis and interlacing with its fellow on the opposite side. The subcutaneous inguinal ring gives passage to the spermatic cord and ilioinguinal nerve in the male and to the round ligament of the uterus and the ilioinguinal nerve in the female. It is much larger in men than in women on account of the large size of the spermatic cord. 
the intracrural fibers, fibrae intracoralis, intercolumnar fibers. The intracrural fibers are a series of curved tendinous fibers which arch across the lower part of the aponeurosis of the obliquus externus, describing curves with the convexities downward. They have received their name from stretching across between the two crura of the subcutaneous inguinal ring, and they are much thicker and stronger at the inferior crus, where they are connected to the inguinal ligament, than superiorly, where they are inserted into the linea alba. The intracural fibers increase the strength of the lower part of the aponeurosis and prevent the divergence of the crura from one another. They are more strongly developed in the male than in the female. As they pass across the subcutaneous inguinal ring, they are connected together by delicate fibrous tissue, forming a fascia called the intracural fascia. This intracural fascia is continued down as a tubular prolongation around the spermatic cord and testes, and encloses them in a sheath. Hence, it is also called the external spermatic fascia. The subcutaneous inguinal ring is seen as a distinct aperture only after the intracural fascia has been removed. The inguinal ligament, ligamentum inguinae, poparte, or poparts ligament. The inguinal ligament is the lower border of the aponeurosis of the obliquus externus and extends from the anterior superior iliac spine to the pubic tubercle. From this latter point it is reflected backward and lateralward to be attached to the pectineal line for about 1.25 centimeters, forming the lacunar ligament. Its general direction is convex downward toward the thigh, where it is continuous with the fascia lata. Its lateral half is rounded and oblique in direction. Its medial half gradually widens at its attachment to the pubis and is more horizontal in direction and lies beneath the spermatic cord. The lacunar ligament, ligamentum lacunar, gimbernati, gimbernauts ligament. The lacunar ligament is that part of the aponeurosis of the obliquus externus which is reflected backward and lateralward and is attached to the pectineal line. It is about 1.25 centimeters long, larger in the male than in the female, almost horizontal in direction in the erect posture, and of a triangular form with the base directed lateralward. Its base is concave, thin, and sharp, and forms the medial boundary of the femoral ring. Its apex corresponds to the pubic tubercle, its posterior margin is attached to the pectineal line, and is continuous with the pectineal fascia. Its anterior margin is attached to the inguinal ligament. Its surfaces are directed upward and downward. The reflected inguinal ligament, ligamentum inguinale reflexum, colesi, triangular fascia. The reflected inguinal ligament is a layer of tendinous fibers of a triangular shape formed by an expansion from the lacunar ligament and the inferior crust of the subcutaneous inguinal ring. It passes medialward behind the spermatic cord and expands into a somewhat fan-shaped band lying behind the superior crus of the subcutaneous inguinal ring and in front of the inguinal aponeurotic falcs and interlaces with the ligament on the other side of the linea alba. Ligament of Cooper this is a strong fibrous band, which was first described by Sir Astley Cooper. It extends lateralward from the base of the lacunar ligament along the pectineal line to which it is attached. It is strengthened by the pectineal fascia and by a lateral expansion from the lower attachment of the linea alba. Admoniculum linea albae. Variations. The obliquus externus may show decrease or doubling of its attachments to the ribs. Addition slips from lumbar aponeurosis. Doubling between lower ribs and ilium or inguinal ligament. Rarely tendinous inscriptions occur. The obliquus internus abdominis, internal or ascending oblique muscle, Thinner and smaller than the obliquus externus, beneath which it lies, is of an irregularly quadrilateral form 
and situated at the lateral and anterior parts of the abdomen. It arises by fleshy fibers from the lateral half of the grooved upper surface of the inguinal ligament, from the anterior two-thirds of the middle lip of the iliac crest, and from the posterior lamina of the lumbodorsal fascia. From this origin, the fibers diverge. Those from the inguinal ligament, few in number and paler in color than the rest, arch downward and medialward across the spermatic cord in the male and the round ligament of the uterus in the female, and, becoming tendinous, are inserted, conjointly with those of the transversus, into the crest of the pubis and medial part of the pectineal line behind the lacunar ligament, forming what is known as the inguinal aponeurotic falks. Those from the anterior third of the iliac origin are horizontal in their direction and, becoming tendinous along the lower fourth of the linea semilunaris, pass in front of the rectus abdominis to be inserted into the linea alba. Those arising from the middle third of the iliac origin run obliquely upward and medial word and end in an aponeurosis. This divides at the lateral border of the rectus into two laminae, which are continued forward, one in front of and the other behind this muscle, to the linea alba. The posterior lamina has an attachment to the cartilages of the 7th, 8th, and ninth ribs. The most posterior fibers pass almost vertically upward to be inserted into the inferior borders of the cartilages of the lower three ribs, being continuous with the intercostalis interni. Variations. Occasionally, tendinous inscriptions occur from the tips of the 10th or 11th cartilages or even from the 9th. An additional slip to the 9th cartilage is sometimes found. Separation between iliac and inguinal parts may occur. End of section 38. Section 39 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To find out more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rebecca Case. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. Muscles and Fascia of the Abdomen, Part 2. The chromaster is a thin muscular layer composed of a number of fasciculi which arise from the middle of the inguinal ligament where its fibers are continuous with those of the obliquus internus and also occasionally with the transversus. It passes along the lateral side of the spermatic cord, descends with it through the subcutaneous inguinal ring upon the front and sides of the cord, and forms a series of loops which differ in thickness and length in different subjects. At the upper part of the cord, the loops are short, but they become in succession longer and longer, the longest reaching down as low as the testis, where a few are inserted into the tunica vaginalis. These loops are united together by areolar tissue and form a thin covering over the cord and testis, the cremasteric fascia. The fibers ascend along the medial side of the cord and are inserted by a small pointed tendon into the tubercle and crest of the pubis and into the front of the sheath of the rectus abdominis. The transversus abdominis, transversalis muscle, so called from the direction of its fibers, is the most internal of the flat muscles of the abdomen, being placed immediately beneath the obliquus internus. It arises by fleshy fibers from the lateral third of the inguinal ligament from the anterior three-fourths of the inner lip of the iliac crest, from the inner surfaces of the cartilages of the lower six ribs, interdigitating with the diaphragm, and from the lumbodorsal fascia. The muscle ends in front in a broad aponeurosis, the lower fibers of which curve downward and medialward and are inserted, together with those of the obliquus internus, into the crest of the pubis and pectineal line forming the inguinal aponeurotic falks. Throughout the rest of its extent, the aponeurosis passes horizontally to the middle line as inserted into the linea alba. Its upper three-fourths lie behind the rectus and blend with the posterior lamina of the aponeurosis of the obliquus internus, 
its lower fourth is in front of the rectus. Variations. It may be more or less fused with the obliquus internus or absent. The spermatic cord may pierce its lower border. Slender muscle slips from the iliopectineal line to transversalis fascia, the aponeurosis of the transversus abdominis, or the outer end of the linea semicircularis, and other slender slips are occasionally found. The inguinal aponeurotic falcs, falcs aponeurotica inguinalis, conjoined tendon of internal oblique and transversalis muscle, of the obliquus internus and transversus is mainly formed by the lower part of the tendon of the transversus and is inserted into the crest of the pubis and pectineal line immediately behind the subcutaneous inguinal ring, serving to protect what would otherwise be a weak point in the abdominal wall. Lateral to the falcs is a ligamentous band connected with the lower margin of the transversus and extending down in front of the inferior epigastric artery to the superior ramus of the pubis. It is termed the interfovular ligament of Hasselbeck and sometimes contains a few muscular fibers. The rectus abdominis is a long, flat muscle which extends along the whole length of the front of the abdomen and is separated from its fellow on the opposite side by the linea alba. It is much broader but thinner above than below and arises by two tendons. The lateral or larger is attached to the crest of the pubis the medial interlaces with its fellow of the opposite side, and is connected with the ligaments covering the front of the symphysis pubis. The muscle is inserted by three portions of unequal size into the cartilages of the fifth, sixth, and seventh ribs. The upper portion, attached principally to the cartilage of the fifth rib, usually has some fibers of insertion into the anterior extremity of the rib itself. Some fibers are occasionally connected with the costoxiphoid ligaments and the side of the xiphoid process. The rectus is crossed by fibrous bands, three in number, which are named the tendinous inscriptions. One is usually situated opposite the umbilicus, one at the extremity of the xiphoid process, and the third about midway between the xiphoid process and the umbilicus. These inscriptions pass transversely or obliquely across the muscle in a zigzag course. They rarely extend completely through its substance and may pass only halfway across it. They are intimately adherent in front to the sheath of the muscle. Sometimes one or two additional inscriptions, generally incomplete, are present below the umbilicus. The rectus is enclosed in a sheath formed by the aponeurosis of the obliqui and transversus, which are arranged in the following manner. At the lateral margin of the rectus, the aponeurosis of the obliquus internus divides into two laminae, one of which passes in front of the rectus, blending with the aponeurosis of the obliquus externus, the other behind it, blending with the aponeurosis of the transversus, and these, joining again at the medial border of the rectus, are inserted into the linea alba. This arrangement of the aponeurosis exists from the costal margin to midway between the umbilicus and the symphysis pubis, where the posterior wall of the sheath ends in a thin curved margin, the linea semicircularis, the concavity of which is directed downward. Below this level, the aponeurosis of all three muscles passes in front of the rectus. The rectus, in the situation where its sheath is deficient below, is separated from the peritoneum by the transversalis fascia. Since the tendons of the obliquus internus and transversus only reach as high as the costal margin, it follows that above this level, the sheath of the rectus is deficient behind, the muscle resting directly on the cartilages of the ribs and being covered merely by the tendon of the obliquus externus. The pyramidalis is a small triangular muscle placed at the lower part of the abdomen in front of the rectus and contained in the sheath of that muscle. It arises by tendinous fibers from the front of the pubis and the anterior pubic ligament. The fleshy portion of the muscle passes upward, diminishing in size as it ascends, and ends by a pointed extremity which is inserted into the linea alba, midway between the umbilicus and pubis. This muscle may be wanting on one or both sides. 
the lower end of the rectus then becomes proportionately increased in size. Occasionally, it is double on one side, and the muscles of the two sides are sometimes of unequal size. It may extend higher than the level stated. Beside the rectus and pyramidalis, the sheath of the rectus contains the superior and inferior epigastric arteries and the lower intercostal nerves. Variations. The rectus may insert as high as the fourth or third rib or may fail to reach the fifth. Fibers may spring from the lower part of the linea alba. Nerves. The abdominal muscles are supplied by the lower intercostal nerves. The obliquus internus and transversus also receive filaments from the anterior branch of the iliohypogastric and sometimes from the ilioinguinal. The cremaster is supplied by the external spermatic branch of the genitofemoral and the pyramidalis, usually by the twelfth thoracic. The linea alba. The linea alba is a tendinous raphe in the middle line of the abdomen, stretching between the siphoid process and the symphysis pubis. It is placed between the medial borders of the recti and is formed by the blending of the aponeurosis of the obliqui and transversi. It is narrow below, corresponding to the linear interval existing between the recti, but broader above, where these muscles diverge from one another. At its lower end, the linea alba has a double attachment, its superficial fibers passing in front of the medial heads of the recti to the symphysis pubis, while its deeper fibers form a triangular lamina, attached behind the recti to the posterior lip of the crest of the pubis, and named the adminiculum linea albae. It presents apertures for the passage of vessels and nerves. The umbilicus, which in the fetus exists as an aperture and transmits the umbilical vessels, is closed in the adult. The linea semilunaris. The linea semilunaris are two curved tendinous lines placed one on either side of the linea alba. Each corresponds with the lateral border of the rectus extends from the cartilage of the ninth rib to the pubic tubercle, and is formed by the aponeurosis of the obliquus internus at its line of division to enclose the rectus, reinforced in front by that of the obliquus externus and behind by that of the transversus. Actions When the pelvis and thorax are fixed, the abdominal muscles compress the abdominal viscera by constricting the cavity of the abdomen, in which action they are materially assisted by the descent of the diaphragm. By these means, assistance is given in expelling the feces from the rectum, the urine from the bladder, the fetus from the uterus, and the contents of the stomach in vomiting. If the pelvis and the vertebral column be fixed, these muscles compress the lower part of the thorax, materially assisting expiration. If the pelvis alone be fixed, the thorax is bent directly forward when the muscles of both sides act. When the muscles of only one side contract, the trunk is bent toward that side and rotated toward the opposite side. If the thorax be fixed, the muscles, acting together, draw the pelvis upward, as in climbing, or, acting singly, they draw the pelvis upward and bend the vertebral column to one side or the other. The recti, acting from below, depress the thorax and consequently flex the vertebral column. When acting from above, they flex the pelvis upon the vertebral column. The pyramidalis are tensors of the linea alba. The transversalis fascia. The transversalis fascia is a thin aponeurotic membrane which lies between the inner surface of the transversus and the extraperitoneal fat. It forms part of the general layer of fascia lining the abdominal parodies and is directly continuous with the iliac and pelvic fasciae. In the inguinal region, the transversalis fascia is thick and dense in structure and is joined by fibers from the aponeurosis of the transversus, but it becomes thin as it ascends to the diaphragm and blends with the fascia covering the undersurface of this muscle. Behind, it is lost in the fat which covers the posterior surfaces of the kidney. Below, it has the following attachments. Posteriorly, to the whole length of the iliac crest, between the attachments of the transversus and iliacus. 
between the anterior superior iliac spine and the femoral vessels it is connected to the posterior margin of the inguinal ligament and is there continuous with the iliac fascia medial to the femoral vessels it is thin and attached to the pubis and pectineal line behind the inguinal aponeurotic falks with which it is united it descends in front of the femoral vessels to form the anterior wall of the femoral sheath beneath the inguinal ligament it is strengthened by a band of fibrous tissue which is only loosely connected to the ligament and is specialized as a deep crural arch the spermatic cord in the male and the round ligament of the uterus in the female pass through the transversalis fascia at a spot called the abdominal inguinal ring this opening is not visible externally since the transversalis fascia is prolonged on these structures as the infundibuliform fascia the abdominal inguinal ring annulus inguinalis abdominis internal or deep abdominal ring the abdominal inguinal ring is situated in the transversalis fascia midway between the anterior superior iliac spine and the symphysis pubis and about 1.25 cm above the inguinal ligament. It is of an oval form, the long axis of the oval being vertical. It varies in size in different subjects and is much larger in the male than in the female. It is bounded above and laterally by the arched lower margins of the transversus below and medially by the inferior epigastric vessels. It transmits the spermatic cord in the male and the round ligament of the uterus in the female. From its circumference, a thin funnel-shaped membrane, the infundibuliform fascia, is continued around this cord and the testis, enclosing them in a distinct covering. The inguinal canal, canalis inguinalis, spermatic canal. The inguinal canal contains the spermatic cord and the ilioinguinal nerve in the male, and the round ligament of the uterus and the ilioinguinal nerve in the female. It is an oblique canal about 4 cm long, slanting downward and medialward, and placed parallel with and a little above the inguinal ligament. It extends from the abdominal inguinal ring to the subcutaneous inguinal ring. It is bounded in front by the integument and superficial fascia, by the aponeurosis of the obliquus externus throughout its whole length, and by the obliquus internus in its lateral third. Behind, by the reflected inguinal ligament, the inguinal aponeurotic falcs, the transversalis fascia, the extraperitoneal connective tissue, and the peritoneum. Above, by the arched fibers of the obliquus internus and the transversus abdominis. Below, by the union of the transversalis fascia with the inguinal ligament, and at its medial end by the lacunar ligament. Extraperitoneal connective tissue. Between the inner surface of the general layer of the fascia, which lines the interior of the abdominal and pelvic cavities, and the peritoneum, there is a considerable amount of connective tissue termed the extraperitoneal or subperitoneal connective tissue. The parietal portion lines the cavity in varying quantities in different situations. It is especially abundant on the posterior wall of the abdomen, and particularly around the kidneys, where it contains much fat. On the anterior wall of the abdomen, except in the pubic region, and on the lateral wall above the iliac crest, it is scanty, and here the transversalis fascia is more closely connected with the peritoneum. There is a considerable amount of extraperitoneal connective tissue in the pelvis. The visceral portion follows the course of the branches of the abdominal aorta between the layers of the mesenteric and other folds of the peritoneum which connect the various viscera to the abdominal wall. The two portions are directly continuous with each other. The deep crural arch Curving over the external iliac vessels at the spot where they become femoral, on the abdominal side of the inguinal ligaments and loosely connected with it, is a thickened band of fibers called the deep crural arch. It is apparently a thickening of the transversalis fascia joined laterally to the center of the lower margin of the inguinal ligament and arching across the front of the femoral sheath to be inserted by a broad attachment into the pubic tubercle and pectineal line behind the inguinal aponeurotic falcs. In some subjects, this structure is not very prominently marked. 
and not infrequently it is altogether wanting. 2. The posterior muscles of the abdomen. Soas major, soas minor, iliacus, quadratus lumborum. The soas major, the soas minor, and the iliacus, with the fasciae covering them, will be described with the muscles of the lower extremity. See page 466. The fasciae covering the quadratus lumborum. This is a thin layer attached medially to the bases of the transverse processes of the lumbar vertebrae below to the iliolumbar ligament, above to the apex and lower border of the last rib. The upper margin of this fascia, which extends from the transverse process of the first lumbar vertebra to the apex and lower border of the last rib, constitutes the lateral lumbocostal arch, page 405. Laterally, it blends with the lumbodorsal fascia, the anterior layer of which intervenes between the quadratus lumborum and the sacrospinalis. The quadratus lumborum, page 398, is irregularly quadrilateral in shape and broader above than below. It arises by aponeurotic fibers from the iliolumbar ligament and the adjacent portion of the iliac crest for about 5 centimeters and is inserted into the lower border of the last rib for about half its length and by four small tendons into the apices of the transverse processes of the upper four lumbar vertebrae. Occasionally, a second portion of this muscle is found in front of the preceding. It arises from the upper borders of the transverse processes of the lower three or four lumbar vertebrae, and is inserted into the lower margin of the last rib. In front of the quadratus lumborum are the colon, the kidney, the psoas major and minor, and the diaphragm. Between the fascia and the muscle are the 12th thoracic iliolinguinal and iliohypogastric nerves. Variations The number of attachments to the vertebrae and the extent of its attachment to the last rib vary. Nerve supply The 12th thoracic and 1st and 2nd lumbar nerves supply this muscle. Actions The quadratus lumborum draws down the last rib and acts as a muscle of inspiration by helping to fix the origin of the diaphragm. If the thorax and vertebral column are fixed, it may act upon the pelvis, raising it toward its own side when only one muscle is put in action, and when both muscles act together, either from below or above, they flex the trunk. End of section 39。section 40 of Gray's Anatomy Part 2 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. The Muscles and Fascia of the Pelvis. Obturator internus, piriformis, levator ani, coccygius. The muscles within the pelvis may be divided into two groups. One, the obturator internus and the piriformis, which are muscles of the lower extremity, and will be described with these. 2. The levator ani and the coccygis, which together form the pelvic diaphragm, and are associated with the pelvic viscera. The classification of the two groups under a common heading is convenient in connection with the fascia investing the muscles. These fascia are closely related to one another, and to the deep fascia of the perineum and in addition have special connections with the fibrous coverings of the pelvic viscera. It is customary, therefore, to describe them together under the term pelvic fascia. Pelvic fascia. The fascia of the pelvis may be resolved into a. The fascial sheaths of the obturator internus, piriformis, and pelvic diaphragm. b. The fascia associated with the pelvic viscera. The fascia of the obturator internus covers the pelvic surface of, and is attached around, the margin of the origin of the muscle. Above, it is loosely connected to the back part of the arcuate line, and here it is continuous with the iliac fascia. In front of this, as it follows the line of origin of the obturator internus, it gradually separates from the iliac fascia, and the continuity between the two is retained only through the periosteum. 
It arches beneath the obturator vessels and nerve, completing the obturator canal, and at the front of the pelvis is attached to the back of the superior ramus of the pubis. Below, the obturator fascia is attached to the falciform process of the sacrotuberous ligament, and to the pubic arch, where it becomes continuous with the superior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm. Behind, it is prolonged into the gluteal region. The internal pudendal vessels and pudendal nerve cross the pelvic surface of the obturator internus and are enclosed in a special canal, Alcox canal, formed by the obturator fascia. The fascia of the piriformis is very thin and is attached to the front of the sacrum and the sides of the greater sciatic foramen. It is prolonged on the muscle into the gluteal region. At its sacral attachment around the margins of the anterior sacral foramina, it comes into intimate association with and ensheaths the nerves emerging from these foramina. Hence, the sacral nerves are frequently described as lying behind the fascia. The internal iliac vessels and their branches, on the other hand, lie in the subperitoneal tissue in front of the fascia, and the branches to the gluteal region emerge in special sheaths of this tissue, above and below the piriformis muscle. The diaphragmatic part of the pelvic fascia covers both surfaces of the levatores ani. The inferior layer is known as the anal fascia. It is attached above to the obturator fascia, along the line of origin of the levator ani, while below it is continuous with the superior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm, and with the fascia on the sphincter ani internus. The layer covering the upper surface of the pelvic diaphragm follows, above, the line of origin of the levator ani, and is therefore somewhat variable. In front, it is attached to the back of the symphysis pubis, about two centimeters above its lower border. It can then be traced laterally across the back of the superior ramus of the pubis, for a distance of about 1.25 centimeters, when it reaches the obturator fascia. It is attached to this fascia along a line which pursues a somewhat irregular course to the spine of the ischium. The irregularity of this line is due to the fact that the origin of the levator ani, which in lower forms is from the pelvic brim, is in man, lower down, on the obturator fascia. Tendinous fibers of origin of the muscle are therefore often found extending up toward, and in some cases reaching, the pelvic brim, and on these the fascia is carried. It will be evident that the fascia covering that part of the obturator internus, which lies above the origin of the levator ani, is a composite fascia, and includes the following. a. The obturator fascia. b. The fascia of the levator ani. c. Degenerated fibers of origin of the levator ani. The lower margin of the fascia covering the upper surface of the pelvic diaphragm is attached along the line of insertion of the levator ani. At the level of a line extending from the lower part of the symphysis pubis to the spine of the ischium is a thickened whitish band in this upper layer of the diaphragmatic part of the pelvic fascia. It is termed the tendinous arch, or white line of the pelvic fascia, and marks the line of attachment of the special fascia, pars endopelvina fascia pelvis which is associated with the pelvic viscera. The endopelvic part of the pelvic fascia is continued over the various pelvic viscera to form for them fibrous coverings, which will be described later, see section on splanchnology. It is attached to the diaphragmatic part of the pelvic fascia along the tendinous arch, and has been subdivided in accordance with the viscera to which it is related. Thus its anterior part, known as the vesicle layer, forms the anterior and lateral ligaments of the bladder. Its middle part crosses the floor of the pelvis between the rectum and vesiculi seminales as the recto-vesicle layer. In the female, this is perforated by the vagina. Its posterior portion passes to the side of the rectum. It forms a loose sheath for the rectum, but is firmly attached around the anal canal. This portion is known as the rectal layer. 
The levator ani is a broad, thin muscle situated on the side of the pelvis. It is attached to the inner surface of the side of the lesser pelvis, and unites with its fellow of the opposite side, to form the greater part of the floor of the pelvic cavity. It supports the viscera in this cavity, and surrounds the various structures which pass through it. It arises, in front, from the posterior surface of the superior ramus of the pubis, lateral to the symphysis, behind, from the inner surface of the spine of the ischium, and between these two points, from the obturator fascia. Posteriorly, this fascial origin corresponds, more or less closely, with the tendinous arch of the pelvic fascia, but in front the muscle arises from the fascia at a varying distance above the arch, in some cases reaching nearly as high as the canal for the obturator vessels and nerve. The fibers pass downward and backward to the middle line of the floor of the pelvis. The most posterior are inserted into the side of the last two segments of the coccyx. Those placed more anteriorly unite with the muscle of the opposite side, in a median fibrous raphe, anococcygeal raphe, which extends between the coccyx and the margin of the anus. The middle fibers are inserted into the side of the rectum, blending with the fibers of the sphincter muscles. Lastly, the anterior fibers descend upon the side of the prostate, to unite beneath it with the muscle of the opposite side, joining with the fibers of the sphincter ani externus and transversus perineae, at the central tendinous point of the perineum. The anterior portion is occasionally separated from the rest of the muscle by connective tissue. From this circumstance, as well as from its peculiar relation with the prostate, which it supports as in a sling, it has been described as a distinct muscle under the name of levator prostatae. In the female, the anterior fibers of the levator ani descend upon the side of the vagina. The levator ani may be divided into iliococcygeal and pubococcygeal parts. The iliococcygeus arises from the ischial spine and from the posterior part of the tendinous arch of the pelvic fascia, and is attached to the coccyx and anococcygeal raphe. It is usually thin and may fail entirely, or be largely replaced by fibrous tissue. An accessory slip at its posterior part is sometimes named the iliosacralis. The pubococcygeus arises from the back of the pubis and from the anterior part of the obturator fascia, and is directed backward almost horizontally along the side of the anal canal toward the coccyx and sacrum, to which it finds attachment. Between the termination of the vertebral column and the anus, the two pubococcygei muscles come together and form a thick fibromuscular layer lying on the raphe formed by the iliococcygei. Peter Thompson. The greater part of this muscle is inserted into the coccyx and into the last one or two pieces of the sacrum. This insertion into the vertebral column is, however, not admitted by all observers. The fibers which form a sling for the rectum are named the puborectalis, or sphincter recti. They arise from the lower part of the symphysis pubis, and from the superior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm. They meet with the corresponding fibers of the opposite side around the lower part of the rectum, and form for it a strong sling. Nerve Supply The levator ani is supplied by a branch from the fourth sacral nerve, and by a branch which is sometimes derived from the perineal, sometimes from the inferior hemorrhoidal division of the pudendal nerve. The coccygeus is situated behind the preceding. It is a triangular plane of muscular and tendinous fibers, arising by its apex from the spine of the ischium and sacrospinous ligament, and inserted by its base into the margin of the coccyx and into the side of the lowest piece of the sacrum. It assists the levator ani and piriformis in closing in the back part of the outlet of the pelvis. Nerve supply. The coccygeus is supplied by a branch from the fourth and fifth sacral nerves. Actions. The levatories ani constrict the lower end of the rectum and vagina. 
they elevate and invert the lower end of the rectum after it has been protruded and everted during the expulsion of the feces. They are also muscles of forced expiration. The coccygii pull forward and support the coccyx after it has been pressed backward during defecation or parturition. The levatories ani and coccygii together form a muscular diaphragm which supports the pelvic viscera. End of section 40《the pubic arch and the arcuate ligament of the pubis, behind the tip of the coccyx, and on either side the inferior rami of the pubis and ischium, and the sacrotuberous ligament. The space is somewhat lozenge-shaped, and is limited on the surface of the body by the scrotum in front, by the buttocks behind, and laterally by the medial side of the thigh. A line drawn transversely across in front of the ischial tuberosities divides the space into two portions. The posterior contains the termination of the anal canal, and is known as the anal region. The anterior, which contains the external urogenital organs, is termed the urogenital region. The muscles of the perineum may therefore be divided into two groups. One, those of the anal region. Two, those of the urogenital region. A in the male. B in the female. 1. The muscles of the anal region. Corrugator cutis ani, sphincter ani externus, sphincter ani internus. The superficial fascia. The superficial fascia is very thick, areolar in texture, and contains much fat in its meshes. On either side a pad of fatty tissue extends deeply between the levator ani and obturator internus into a space known as the ischiorectal fossa. The deep fascia. The deep fascia forms the lining of the ischiorectal fossa. It comprises the anal fascia and the portion of the obturator fascia below the origin of levator ani. Ischiorectal fossa. Fossa ischiorectalis. The fossa is somewhat prismatic in shape, with its base directed to the surface of the perineum and its apex at the line of meeting of the obturator and anal fascia. It is bounded mediately by the sphincter ani externus and the anal fascia, laterally by the tuberosity of the ischium and the obturator fascia, anteriorly by the fascia of collies covering the transversus perinei superficialis, and by the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm, posteriorly by the gluteus maximus and the sacrotuberous ligament, Crossing the space transversely are the inferior hemorrhoidal vessels and nerves. At the back part are the perineal and perforating cutaneous branches of the pudendal plexus, while from the forepart the posterior scrotal or labial vessels and nerves emerge. The internal pudendal vessels and pudendal nerve lie in Alcock's canal on the lateral wall. The fossa is filled with fatty tissue, across which numerous fibrous bands extend from side to side. The corrugator cutis ani. Around the anus is a thin stratum of involuntary muscular fiber, which radiates from the orifice. Medially, the fibers fade off into the submucous tissue, while laterally they blend with the true skin. By its contraction, it raises the skin into ridges around the margin of the anus. The sphincter ani externus, external sphincter ani, is a flat plane of muscular fibers, elliptical in shape, and intimately adherent to the integument surrounding the margin of the anus. It measures about 8 to 10 centimeters in length, from its anterior to its posterior extremity, and is about 2.5 centimeters broad, opposite the anus. It consists of two strata, superficial and deep. The superficial, constituting the main portion of the muscle, 
arises from a narrow, tendinous band, the anococcygeal rothae, which stretches from the tip of the coccyx to the posterior margin of the anus. It forms two flattened planes of muscular tissue, which encircle the anus and meet in front to be inserted into the central tendinous point of the perineum, joining with the transversus perinei superficialis, the levator ani, and the bulbo cavernosus. The deeper portion forms a complete sphincter to the anal canal. Its fibers surround the canal, closely applied to the sphincter ani internus, and in front blend with the other muscles at the central point of the perineum. In a considerable proportion of cases, the fibers decusate in front of the anus, and are continuous with the transversi perinei superficialis. Posteriorly, they are not attached to the coccyx, but are continuous with those of the opposite side behind the anal canal. The upper edge of the muscle is ill-defined, since fibers are given off from it to join the levator ani. Nerve supply. A branch from the fourth sacral and twigs from the inferior hemorrhoidal branch of the pudendal supply the muscle. Actions. The action of this muscle is peculiar. 1. It is, like other muscles, always in a state of tonic contraction, and having no antagonistic muscle, it keeps the anal canal and orifice closed. 2. It can be put into a condition of greater contraction under the influence of the will, so as more firmly to occlude the anal aperture in expiratory efforts unconnected with defecation. 3. Taking its fixed point at the coccyx, it helps to fix the central point of the perineum, so that the bulbocavernosus may act from this fixed point. The sphincter ani internus, internal sphincter ani, is a muscular ring which surrounds about 2.5 centimeters of the anal canal. Its inferior border is in contact with, but quite separate from, the sphincter ani externus. It is about 5 millimeters thick, and is formed by an aggregation of the involuntary circular fibers of the intestine. Its lower border is about 6 millimeters from the orifice of the anus. Actions Its action is entirely involuntary. It helps the sphincter ani externus to occlude the anal aperture and aids in the expulsion of the feces. 2. A. The muscles of the urogenital region in the male transversus perinei superficialis, bulbocavernosus, ischiocavernosus, transversus perinei profundus, sphincter urethrae membranaceae. Superficial fascia. The superficial fascia of this region consists of two layers, superficial and deep. The superficial layer is thick, loose, areolar in texture, and contains in its meshes much adipose tissue, the amount of which varies in different subjects. In front, it is continuous with the dartos tunic of the scrotum, behind with the subcutaneous areolar tissue surrounding the anus, and on either side with the same fascia on the inner sides of the thigh. In the middle line, it is adherent to the skin on the raphe and to the deep layer of the superficial fascia. The deep layer of superficial fascia, fascia of collies, is thin, aponeurotic in structure, and of considerable strength serving to bind down the muscles of the root of the penis. It is continuous in front with the dartos tunic, the deep fascia of the penis, the fascia of the spermatic cord, and scarpa's fascia upon the anterior wall of the abdomen. On either side it is firmly attached to the margins of the rami of the pubis and ischium, lateral to the crust penis, and as far back as the tuberosity of the ischium. Posteriorly, it curves around the transversi perinei superficialis to join the lower margin of the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm. In the middle line, it is connected with the superficial fascia and with the median septum of the bulbocavernosus. This fascia not only covers the muscles in this region, but at its back part sends upward a vertical septum from its deep surface which separates the posterior portion of the subjacent space into two. The central tendinous point of the perineum. This is a fibrous point in the middle line of the perineum, between the urethra and anus, and about 1.25 centimeters in front of the latter. 
At this point six muscles converge and are attached, that is, the sphincter ani externus, the bulbo cavernosus, the two transversi perineae superficialis, and the anterior fibers of the levatorius ani. The transversus perineae superficialis, transversus perineae, superficial transverse perineal muscle, is a narrow muscular slip which passes more or less transversely across the perineal space in front of the anus. It arises by tendinous fibers from the inner and forepart of the tuberosity of the ischium, and, running medialward, is inserted into the central tendinous point of the perineum, joining in this situation with the muscle of the opposite side, with the sphincter ani externus behind, and with the bulbo cavernosus in front. In some cases, the fibers of the deeper layer of the sphincter ani externus decusate in front of the anus and are continued into this muscle. Occasionally it gives off fibers which join with the bulbo cavernosus of the same side. Variations are numerous. It may be absent or double or insert into the bulbo cavernosus or external sphincter. Actions the simultaneous contraction of the two muscles serves to fix the central tendinous point of the perineum. The bulbo cavernosus, ejaculator urinae, accelerator urinae, is placed in the middle line of the perineum, in front of the anus. It consists of two symmetrical parts, united along the median line by a tendinous raphe. It arises from the central tendinous point of the perineum and from the median raphe in front. Its fibers diverge like the barbs of a quill pen. The most posterior form a thin layer, which is lost on the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm. The middle fibers encircle the bulb and adjacent parts of the corpus cavernosum urethri, and join with the fibers of the opposite side on the upper part of the corpus cavernosum urethri, in a strong aponeurosis. The anterior fibers spread out over the side of the corpus cavernosum penis, to be inserted partly into that body, anterior to the ischiocavernosus, occasionally extending to the pubis, and partly ending in a tendinous expansion which covers the dorsal vessels of the penis. The latter fibers are best seen by dividing the muscle longitudinally, and reflecting it from the surface of the corpus cavernosum urethri. Actions This muscle serves to empty the canal of the urethra, after the bladder has expelled its contents, during the greater part of the act of micturition, its fibers are relaxed, and it only comes into action at the end of the process. The middle fibers are supposed by Krauss to assist in the erection of the corpus cavernosum urethri by compressing the erectile tissue of the bulb. The anterior fibers, according to Terrell, also contribute to the erection of the penis by compressing the deep dorsal vein of the penis as they are inserted into, and continuous with, the fascia of the penis. The ischiocavernosus, erector penis, covers the crust penis. It is an elongated muscle, broader in the middle than at either end, and situated on the lateral boundary of the perineum. It arises by tendinous and fleshy fibers from the inner surface of the tuberosity of the ischium behind the crust penis, and from the rami of the pubis and ischium on either side of the crust. From these points, fleshy fibers succeed and end in an aponeurosis, which is inserted into the sides and undersurface of the crust penis. Action. The ischiocavernosus compresses the crust penis and retards the return of the blood through the veins, and thus serves to maintain the organ erect. Between the muscles just examined, a triangular space exists, bounded medially by the bulbo cavernosus laterally by the ischiocavernosus, and behind by the transversus perineae superficialis. The floor is formed by the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm. Running from behind forward in the space are the posterior scrotal vessels and nerves, and the perineal branch of the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve. The transverse perineal artery courses along its posterior boundary on the transversus perineae superficialis. The deep fascia. The deep fascia of the urogenital region forms an investment for the transversus perineae profundus and the sphincter urethri membranaceae, 
but within it lie also the deep vessels and nerves of this part, the whole forming a transverse septum, which is known as the urogenital diaphragm. From its shape it is usually termed the triangular ligament, and is stretched almost horizontally across the pubic arch, so as to close, in the front part, the outlet of the pelvis. It consists of two dense membranous laminae, which are united along their posterior borders, but are separated in front by intervening structures. The superficial of these two layers, the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm, is triangular in shape and about four centimeters in depth. Its apex is directed forward and is separated from the arcuate pubic ligament by an oval opening for the transmission of the deep dorsal vein of the penis. Its lateral margins are attached on either side to the inferior rami of the pubis and ischium above the crust penis. Its base is directed toward the rectum and connected to the central tendinous point of the perineum. It is continuous with the deep layer of the superficial fascia behind the transversus perinei superficialis, and with the inferior layer of the diaphragmatic part of the pelvic fascia. It is perforated, about 2.5 centimeters below the symphysis pubis, by the urethra, the aperture for which is circular, and about 6 millimeters in diameter, by the arteries to the bulb and the ducts of the bulbo-urethral glands, close to the urethral orifice, by the deep arteries of the penis, one on either side, close to the pubic arch, and about halfway along the attached margin of the fascia, by the dorsal arteries and nerves of the penis near the apex of the fascia. Its base is also perforated by the perineal vessels and nerves, while between its apex and the arcuate pubic ligament, the deep dorsal vein of the penis passes upward into the pelvis. If the inferior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm be detached on either side, the following structures will be seen between it and the superior fascia. The deep dorsal vein of the penis, the membranous portion of the urethra, the transversus perineae profundus and sphincter urethrae membranaceae muscles, the bulbo-urethral glands and their ducts, the pudendal vessels and dorsal nerves of the penis, the arteries and nerves of the urethral bulb, and a plexus of veins. The superior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm is continuous with the obturator fascia and stretches across the pubic arch. If the obturator fascia be traced medially after leaving the obturator internus muscle, it will be found attached by some of its deeper or anterior fibers to the inner margin of the pubic arch, while its superficial or posterior fibers pass over this attachment to become continuous with the superior fascia of the urogenital diaphragm. Behind, this layer of the fascia is continuous with the inferior fascia and with the fascia of colles. In front, it is continuous with the fascial sheath of the prostate and is fused with the inferior fascia to form the transverse ligament of the pelvis. The transversus perineae profundus arises from the inferior rami of the ischium and runs to the median line, where it interlaces in a tendinous raphe with its fellow of the opposite side. It lies in the same plane as the sphincter urethrae membranaceae. Formerly, the two muscles were described together as the constrictor urethrae. The sphincter urethrae membranaceae surrounds the whole length of the membranous portion of the urethra, and is enclosed in the fascia of the urogenital diaphragm. Its external fibers arise from the junction of the inferior rami of the pubis and ischium to the extent of 1.25 to 2 centimeters, and from the neighboring fascia. They arch across the front of the urethra and bulbo-urethral glands, pass around the urethra, and behind it unite with the muscle of the opposite side by means of a tendinous raphe. Its innermost fibers form a continuous circular investment for the membranous urethra. Nerve supply. The perineal branch of the pudendal nerve supplies this group of muscles. Actions. The muscles of both sides act together as a sphincter, compressing the membranous portion of the urethra. During the transmission of fluids, they, like the bulbocavernosus, are relaxed, and only come into action at the end of the process to eject the last drops of the fluid. 
2b. The muscles of the urogenital region in the female. Transversus perineae superficialis, bulbocavernosus, ischiocavernosus, transversus perineae profundus, sphincter urethri membranaceae. The transversus perineae superficialis, transversus perineae, superficial transverse perineal muscle, in the female is a narrow muscular slip, which arises by a small tendon from the inner and forepart of the tuberosity of the ischium, and is inserted into the central tendinous point of the perineum, joining in this situation with the muscle of the opposite side, the sphincter ani externus behind, and the bulbocavernosus in front. Action. The simultaneous contraction of the two muscles serves to fix the central tendinous point of the perineum. The bulbocavernosus, sphincter vaginae, surrounds the orifice of the vagina. It covers the lateral parts of the vestibular bulbs, and is attached posteriorly to the central tendinous point of the perineum, where it blends with the sphincter ani externus. Its fibers pass forward on either side of the vagina, to be inserted into the corpora cavernosa clitoridis, a fasciculus crossing over the body of the organ, so as to compress the deep dorsal vein. Actions. The bulbocavernosus diminishes the orifice of the vagina. The anterior fibers contribute to the erection of the clitoris, as they are inserted into and are continuous with the fascia of the clitoris, compressing the deep dorsal vein during the contraction of the muscle. The ischiocavernosus, erector clitoridis, is smaller than the corresponding muscle in the male. It covers the unattached surface of the crust clitoridis. It is an elongated muscle, broader at the middle than at either end, and situated on the side of the lateral boundary of the perineum. It arises by tendinous and fleshy fibers from the inner surface of the tuberosity of the ischium, behind the crust clitoridis, from the surface of the crust, and from the adjacent portion of the ramus of the ischium. From these points, fleshy fibers succeed and end in an aponeurosis, which is inserted into the sides and under surface of the crust clitoridis. Actions. The ischiocavernosus compresses the crust clitoridis and retards the return of blood through the veins, and thus serves to maintain the organ erect. The fascia of the urogenital diaphragm in the female is not so strong as in the male. It is attached to the pubic arch, its apex being connected with the arcuate pubic ligament. It is divided in the middle line by the aperture of the vagina, with the external coat of which it becomes blended, and in front of this is perforated by the urethra. Its posterior border is continuous, as in the male, with the deep layer of the superficial fascia around the transversus perineae superficialis. Like the corresponding fascia in the male, it consists of two layers, between which are to be found the following structures the deep dorsal vein of the clitoris, a portion of the urethra and the constrictor urethra muscle, the larger vestibular glands and their ducts, the internal pudendal vessels, and the dorsal nerves of the clitoris, the arteries and nerves of the bulbi vestibuli, and a plexus of veins. The transversus perineae profundus arises from the inferior rami of the ischium and runs across to the side of the vagina. The sphincter urethrae membranaceae, constrictor urethrae, like the corresponding muscle on the male, consists of external and internal fibers. The external fibers arise on either side from the margin of the inferior ramus of the pubis. They are directed across the pubic arch in front of the urethra, and pass around it to blend with the muscular fibers of the opposite side, between the urethra and vagina. The innermost fibers encircle the lower end of the urethra. Nerve supply. The muscles of this group are supplied by the perineal branch of the pudendal. End of section 41. Section 42 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Selena Arter. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. 
7. The fascia and muscles of the upper extremity. A. The muscles connecting the upper extremity to the vertebral column. The muscles of this group are trapezius, latissimus dorsi, rhomboidius major, rhomboidius minor, levator scapulae. Superficial fascia. The superficial fascia of the back forms a layer of considerable thickness and strength and contains a quantity of granular fat. It is continuous with the general superficial fascia. Deep fascia. The deep fascia is a dense fibrous layer attached above to the superior nuchal line of the occipital bone. In the middle line it is attached to the ligamentum nuchae and supraspinal ligament and to the spinous processes of all the vertebrae below the seventh cervical. Laterally, in the neck, it is continuous with the deep cervical fascia. Over the shoulder, it is attached to the spine of the scapula and to the acromion, and is continued downward over the deltoideus to the arm. On the thorax, it is continuous with the deep fascia of the axilla and chest, and on the abdomen with that covering the abdominal muscles. Below, it is attached to the crest of the ilium. The trapezius is a flat, triangular muscle covering the upper and back part of the neck and shoulders. It arises from the external occipital protuberance and the medial third of the superior nuchal line of the occipital bone from the ligamentum nuchae, the spinous process of the seventh cervical, and the spinous processes of all the thoracic vertebrae, and from the corresponding portion of the supraspinal ligament. From this origin, the superior fibers proceed downward and lateralward, the inferior upward and lateralward, and the middle horizontally. The superior fibers are inserted into the posterior border of the lateral third of the clavicle, the middle fibers into the medial margin of the acromion, and into the superior lip of the posterior border of the spine of the scapula. The inferior fibers converge near the scapula and end in an aponeurosis, which glides over the smooth triangular surface on the medial end of the spine to be inserted into a tubercle at the apex of this smooth triangular surface. At its occipital origin, the trapezius is connected to the bone by a thin fibrous lamina, firmly adherent to the skin. At the middle, it is connected to the spinous processes by a broad semi-elliptical aponeurosis which reaches from the sixth cervical to the third thoracic vertebrae and forms, with that of the opposite muscle, a tendinous ellipse. The rest of the muscle arises by numerous short tendinous fibers. The two trapezius muscles together resemble a trapezium, or diamond-shaped quadrangle. Two angles corresponding to the shoulders, a third to the occipital protuberance, and the fourth to the spinous process of the twelfth thoracic vertebra. Variations The attachments to the dorsal vertebrae are often reduced, and the lower ones are often wanting. The occipital attachment is often wanting. Separation between cervical and dorsal portions is frequent. Extensive deficiencies and complete absence occur. The clavicular insertion of this muscle varies in extent. It sometimes reaches as far as the middle of the clavicle and occasionally may blend with the posterior edge of the sternocleidomastoideus or overlap it. The latissimus dorsi is a triangular flat muscle which covers the lumbar region and the lower half of the thoracic region and is generally contracted into a narrow fasciculus at its insertion into the humerus. It arises by tendinous fibers from the spinous processes of the lower six thoracic vertebrae and from the posterior layer of the lumbodorsal fascia, by which it is attached to the spines of the lumbar and sacral vertebrae, to the supraspinal ligament, and to the posterior part of the crest of the ilium. It also arises by muscular fibers from the external lip of the crest of the ilium, lateral to the margin of the sacrospinalis and from the three or four lower ribs by fleshy digitations, which are interposed between similar processes of the obliquus abdominus externus. From this extensive origin, the fibers pass in different directions. 
the upper ones horizontally, the middle obliquely upward, and the lower vertically upward, so as to converge and form a thick fasciculus, which crosses the inferior angle of the scapula and usually receives a few fibers from it. The muscle curves around the lower border of the teres major and is twisted upon itself so that the superior fibers become at first posterior and then inferior, and the vertical fibers at first anterior and then superior. It ends in a quadrilateral tendon, about seven centimeters long, which passes in front of the tendon of the teres major and is inserted into the bottom of the intertubercular groove of the humerus. Its insertion extends higher on the humerus than that of the tendon of the pectoralis major. The lower border of its tendon is united with that of the teres major, the surfaces of the two being separated near their insertions by a bursa. Another bursa is sometimes interposed between the muscle and the inferior angle of the scapula. The tendon of the muscle gives off an expansion to the deep fascia of the arm. Variations The number of dorsal vertebrae to which it is attached vary from four to seven or eight. The number of costal attachments varies. Muscle fibers may or may not reach the crest of the ilium. A muscular slip, the axillary arch, varying from seven to ten centimeters in length and from five to fifteen millimeters in breadth occasionally springs from the upper edge of the latissimus dorsi about the middle of the posterior fold of the axilla and crosses the axilla in front of the axillary vessels and nerves to join the undersurface of the tendon of the pectoralis major, the coracobrachialis, or the fascia over the biceps brachii. This axillary arch crosses the axillary artery, just above the spot usually selected for the application of a ligature, and may mislead the surgeon during the operation. It is present in about 7% of subjects and may be easily recognized by the transverse direction of its fibers. A fibrous slip usually passes from the lower border of the tendon of the latissimus dorsi, near its insertion, to the long head of the triceps brachii. This is occasionally muscular, and is the representative of the dorso epitrochlearis brachii of apes. The lateral margin of the latissimus dorsi is separated below from the obliquus externus abdominis by a small triangular interval, the lumbar triangle of Pettit, the base of which is formed by the iliac crest, and its floor by the obliquus internus abdominis. Another triangle is situated behind the scapula. It is bounded above by the trapezius, below by the latissimus dorsi, and laterally by the vertebral border of the scapula. The floor is partly formed by the rhomboideus major. If the scapula be drawn forward by folding the arms across the chest and the trunk bent forward, parts of the sixth and seventh ribs and the interspace between them become subcutaneous and available for osculation. The space is therefore known as the triangle of osculation. Nerves. The trapezius is supplied by the accessory nerve and by branches from the third and fourth cervical nerves, the latissimus dorsi by the sixth, seventh, and eighth cervical nerves through the thoracodorsal, long subscapular, nerve. The rhomboideus major arises by tendinous fibers from the spinous processes of the second, third, fourth and fifth thoracic vertebrae and the supraspinal ligament and is inserted into a narrow tendinous arch attached above to the lower part of the triangular surface at the root of the spine of the scapula below to the inferior angle the arch being connected to the vertebral border by a thin membrane when the arch extends as it occasionally does only a short distance the muscular fibers are inserted directly into the scapula. The rhomboideus minor arises from the lower part of the ligamentum nuchae and from the spinous processes of the seventh cervical 
and first thoracic vertebrae. It is inserted into the base of the triangular smooth surface at the root of the spine of the scapula, and is usually separated from the rhomboidus major by a slight interval, but the adjacent margins of the two muscles are occasionally united. Variations the vertebral and scapular attachments of the two muscles vary in extent. A small slip from the scapula to the occipital bone close to the minor occasionally occurs. The rhomboidus occipitalis muscle. The levator scapulae, levator anguli scapulae, is situated at the back and side of the neck. It arises by tendinous slips from the transverse processes of the atlas and axis from the posterior tubercles of the transverse processes of the third and fourth cervical vertebrae. It is inserted into the vertebral border of the scapula between the medial angle and the triangular smooth surface at the root of the spine. Variations The number of vertebral attachments varies. A slip may extend to the occipital or mastoid to the trapezius, scalene, or serratus anterior, or to the first or second rib. The muscle may be subdivided into several distinct parts from origin to insertion. Levator claviculae, from the transverse processes of one or two upper cervical vertebrae to the outer end of the clavicle corresponds to a muscle of lower animals, more or less union with the serratus anterior. Nerves. The rhomboid eye are supplied by the dorsal scapular nerve from the fifth cervical, the levator scapulae by the third and fourth cervical nerves, and frequently by a branch from the dorsal scapular. Actions. The movements effected by the preceding muscles are numerous, as may be conceived from their extensive attachments. When the whole trapezius is in action, it retracts the scapula and braces back the shoulder. If the head be fixed, the upper part of the muscle will elevate the point of the shoulder, as in supporting weights. When the lower fibers contract, they assist in depressing the scapula. The middle and lower fibers of the muscle rotate the scapula, causing elevation of the acromion. If the shoulders be fixed, the trapezii, acting together, will draw the head directly backward, or if only one act, the head is drawn to the corresponding side. When the latissimus dorsi acts upon the humerus, it depresses and draws it backward, and at the same time rotates it inward. It is the muscle which is principally employed in giving a downward blow, as in felling a tree or in saber practice. If the arm be fixed, the muscle may act in various ways upon the trunk. Thus, it may raise the lower ribs and assist in forcible inspiration. Or, if both arms be fixed, the two muscles may assist the abdominal muscles and pectoralis in suspending and drawing the trunk forward, as in climbing. If the head be fixed, the levator scapulae raises the medial angle of the scapula, if the shoulder be fixed, the muscle inclines the neck to the corresponding side and rotates it in the same direction. The rhomboid eye carry the inferior angle backward and upward, thus producing a slight rotation of the scapula upon the side of the chest. The rhomboidus major acting especially on the inferior angle of the scapula, through the tendinous arch by which it is inserted. The rhomboid eye, acting together with the middle and inferior fibers of the trapezius, will retract the scapula. End of section 42. Recording by Selena Arter. Section 43 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Selena Arter. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. 
the muscles connecting the upper extremity to the anterior and lateral thoracic walls. The muscles of the anterior and lateral thoracic regions are pectoralis major, pectoralis minor, subclavius, serratus anterior, superficial fascia. The superficial fascia of the anterior thoracic region is continuous with that of the neck and upper extremity above and of the abdomen below. It encloses the mamma and gives off numerous septa which pass into the gland, supporting its various lobes. From the fascia over the front of the mamma, fibrous processes pass forward to the integument and papilla. These were called by Sir A. Cooper the ligamenta suspensoria. Pectoral fascia. The pectoral fascia is a thin lamina covering the surface of the pectoralis major and sending numerous prolongations between its fasciculi. It is attached in the middle line to the front of the sternum, above to the clavicle, laterally and below it is continuous with the fascia of the shoulder, axilla, and thorax. It is very thin over the upper part of the pectoralis major, but thicker in the interval between it and the latissimus dorsi, where it closes in the axillary space and forms the axillary fascia. It divides at the lateral margin of the latissimus dorsi into two layers, one of which passes in front of and the other behind it. These proceed as far as the spinous processes of the thoracic vertebrae to which they are attached. As the fascia leaves the lower edge of the pectoralis major to cross the floor of the axilla, it sends a layer upward under cover of the muscle. This lamina splits to envelop the pectoralis minor, at the upper edge of which it is continuous with the coracoclavicular fascia. The hollow of the armpit, seen when the arm is abducted, is produced mainly by the traction of this fascia on the axillary floor, and hence the lamina is sometimes named the suspensory ligament of the axilla. At the lower part of the thoracic region of the deep fascia is well developed and is continuous with the fibrous sheaths of the recti abdominis. The pectoralis major is a thick, fan-shaped muscle situated at the upper and fore part of the chest, it arises from the anterior surface of the sternal half of the clavicle, from half the breadth of the anterior surface of the sternum, as low down as the attachment of the cartilage of the sixth or seventh rib, from the cartilages of all the true ribs, with the exception frequently of the first or seventh, or both, and from the aponeurosis of the obliquus externus abdominis. From this extensive origin, the fibers converge toward their insertion. Those arising from the clavicle pass obliquely downward and lateralward, and are usually separated from the rest by a slight interval. Those from the lower part of the sternum and the cartilages of the lower true ribs run upward and lateralward, while the middle fibers pass horizontally. They all end in a flat tendon, about 5 centimeters broad, which is inserted into the crest of the greater tubercle of the humerus. This tendon consists of two laminae, placed one in front of the other and usually blended together below. The anterior lamina, the thicker, receives the clavicular and the uppermost sternal fibers. They are inserted in the same order as that in which they arise, that is to say, the most lateral of the clavicular fibers are inserted at the upper part of the anterior lamina. The uppermost sternal fibers pass down to the lower part of the lamina, which extends as low as the tendon of the deltoideus and joins with it. The posterior lamina of the tendon receives the attachment of the greater part of the sternal portion and the deep fibers, i.e., those from the costal cartilages. These deep fibers, and particularly those from the lower costal cartilages, ascend the higher, turning backwards successively behind the superficial and upper ones, so that the tendon appears to be twisted. The posterior lamina reaches higher on the humerus than the anterior one, and from it an expansion is given off, which covers the intertubercular groove and blends with the capsule of the shoulder joint. From the deepest fibers of this lamina at its insertion, an expansion is given off, which lines the intertubercular groove, while from the lower border of the tendon a third expansion passes downward to the fascia of the arm. Variations The more frequent variations are greater or less extent of attachment to the ribs and sternum, varying size of the abdominal part or its absence, 
greater or less extent of separation of sternocostal and clavicular parts, fusion of clavicular part with deltoid, decussation in front of the sternum. Deficiency or absence of the sternocostal part is not uncommon. Absence of the clavicular part is less frequent. Rarely the whole muscle is wanting. Costocoracoideus is a muscular band occasionally found arising from the ribs or aponeurosis of the external oblique between the pectoralis major and latissimus dorsi and inserted into the coracoid process. Chondroepitrochlearis is a muscular slip occasionally found arising from the costal cartilages or from the aponeurosis of the external oblique below the pectoralis major or from the pectoralis major itself. The insertion is variable on the inner side of the arm to fascia, intermuscular septum, or internal condyle. Sternalis. In front of the sternal end of the pectoralis major, parallel to the margin of the sternum, it is supplied by the anterior thoracic nerves and is probably a misplaced part of the pectoralis. Coracoclavicular fascia. Fascia coracoclavicularis. Costocoracoid membrane. Clavipectoral fascia. The coracoclavicular fascia is a strong fascia situated under cover of the clavicular portion of the pectoralis major. It occupies the interval between the pectoralis minor and subclavius and protects the axillary vessels and nerves. Traced upward, it splits to enclose the subclavius and its two layers are attached to the clavicle, one in front of and the other behind the muscle. The latter layer fuses with the deep cervical fascia and with the sheath of the axillary vessels. Medially, it blends with the fascia covering the first two intercostal spaces and is attached also to the first rib medial to the origin of the subclavius. Laterally, it is very thick and dense and is attached to the coracoid process. The portion extending from the first rib to the coracoid process is often whiter and denser than the rest and is sometimes called the costocoracoid ligament. Below this, it is thin and at the upper border of the pectoralis minor, it splits into two layers to invest the muscle. From the lower border of the pectoralis minor, it is continued downward to join the axillary fascia, and lateralward to join the fascia over the short head of the biceps brachii. The coracoclavicular fascia is pierced by the cephalic vein, thoracochromial artery and vein, and external anterior thoracic nerve. The pectoralis minor is a thin, triangular muscle situated at the upper part of the thorax beneath the pectoralis major. It arises from the upper margins and outer surfaces of the third, fourth, and fifth ribs, near their cartilage and from the aponeuroses covering the intercostalis. The fibers pass upward and lateralward and converge to form a flat tendon, which is inserted into the medial border and upper surface of the coracoid process of the scapula. Variations Origin from second, third, and fourth or fifth ribs. The tendon of insertion may extend over the coracoid process to the greater tubercle, may be split into several parts. Absence rare. Pectoralis minimus. First rib cartilage to coracoid process. Rare. The subclavius is a small triangular muscle placed between the clavicle and the first rib. It arises by a short, thick tendon from the first rib and its cartilage at their junction, in front of the costoclavicular ligament. The fleshy fibers proceed obliquely upward and lateralward to be inserted into the groove on the undersurface of the clavicle between the costoclavicular and conoid ligaments. Variations Insertion into coracoid process instead of clavicle or into both clavicle and coracoid process. Sternoscapular fasciculus to the upper border of scapula. Sternoclavicularis from manubrium to clavicle between pectoralis major and coracoclavicular fascia. The serratus anterior, serratus magnus, is a thin muscular sheet situated between the ribs and the scapula at the upper and lateral part of the chest. It arises by fleshy digitations from the outer surfaces and superior borders of the upper eight or nine ribs. 
and from the aponeuroses covering the intervening intercostales. Each digitation, except the first, arises from the corresponding rib. The first springs from the first and second ribs, and from the fascia covering the first intercostal space. From this extensive attachment the fibers pass backward, closely applied to the chest wall, and reach the vertebral border of the scapula, and are inserted into its ventral surface in the following manner. The first digitation is inserted into a triangular area on the ventral surface of the medial angle. The next two digitations spread out to form a thin triangular sheet, the base of which is directed backward and is inserted into nearly the whole length of the ventral surface of the vertebral border. The lower five or six digitations converge to form a fan-shaped mass, the apex of which is inserted by muscular and tendinous fibers into a triangular impression on the ventral surface of the inferior angle. The lower four slips interdigitate at their origins with the upper five slips of the obliquus externus abdominis. Variations Attachment to tenth rib Absence of attachments to first rib to one or more of the lower ribs. Division into three parts. Absence or defect of middle part. Union with levator scapulae, external intercostals or external oblique. Nerves. The pectoralis major is supplied by the medial and lateral anterior thoracic nerves. Through these nerves, the muscle receives filaments from all the spinal nerves entering into the formation of the brachial plexus. The pectoralis minor receives its fibers from the eighth cervical and first thoracic nerves through the medial anterior thoracic nerve. The subclavius is supplied by a filament from the fifth and sixth cervical nerves. The serratus anterior is supplied by the long thoracic, which is derived from the fifth, sixth, and seventh cervical nerves. Actions If the arm has been raised by the deltoideus, the pectoralis major will, conjointly with the latissimus dorsi and teres major, depress it to the side of the chest. If acting alone, it adducts and draws forward the arm, bringing it across the front of the chest and at the same time rotates it inward. The pectoralis minor depresses the point of the shoulder, drawing the scapula downward and medialward toward the thorax and throwing the inferior angle backward. The subclavius depresses the shoulder, carrying it downward and forward. When the arms are fixed, all three of these muscles act upon the ribs, drawing them upward and expanding the chest, and thus becoming very important agents in forced inspiration. The serratus anterior, as a whole, carries the scapula forward and at the same time raises the vertebral border of the bone. It is therefore concerned in the action of pushing. Its lower and stronger fibers move forward the lower angle and assist the trapezius in rotating the bone at the sternoclavicular joint, and thus assist this muscle in raising the acromion and supporting weights upon the shoulder. It is also an assistant to the deltoideus in raising the arm, inasmuch as during the action of this latter muscle it fixes the scapula and so steadies the glenoid cavity on which the head of the humerus rotates. After the deltoideus has raised the arm to a right angle with the trunk, the serratus anterior and the trapezius, by rotating the scapula, raise the arm into an almost vertical position. It is possible that when the shoulders are fixed, the lower fibers of the serratus anterior may assist in raising and everting the ribs, but it is not the important inspiratory muscle it was formerly believed to be. End of section 43. Recording by Selena Arter. Section 44 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. 
the muscles and fasci of the shoulder in this group are included deltoideus subscapularis supraspinatus infraspinatus teres minor teres major deep fascia the deep fascia covering the deltoideus invests the muscle and sends numerous septa between its fasciculi in front it is continuous with the fascia covering the pectoralis major behind where it is thick and strong with that covering the infraspinatus above it is attached to the clavicle the acromion and the spine of the scapula below it is continuous with the deep fascia of the arm the deltoideus deltoid muscle is a large thick triangular muscle which covers the shoulder joint in front behind and laterally it arises from the anterior border and upper surface of the lateral third of the clavicle from the lateral margin and upper surface of the acromion and from the lower lip of the posterior border of the spine of the scapula as far back as the triangular surface at its medial end from this extensive origin the fibers converge toward their insertion the middle passing vertically the anterior obliquely backward and lateralward the posterior obliquely forward and lateralward they unite in a thick tendon which is inserted into the deltoid prominence on the middle of the lateral side of the body of the humerus at its insertion the muscle gives off an expansion to the deep fascia of the arm this muscle is remarkably coarse in texture and the arrangement of its fibers is somewhat peculiar the central portion of the muscle that is to say the part arising from the acromion consists of oblique fibers these arise in a bipenniform manner from the sides of the tendinous intersections generally four in number which are attached above to the acromion and pass downward parallel to one another in the substance of the muscle the oblique fibers thus formed are inserted into similar tendinous intersections generally three in number which pass upward from the insertion of the muscle and alternate with the descending septa the portions of the muscle arising from the clavicle and spine of the scapula are not arranged in this manner but are inserted into the margins of the inferior tendon variations large variations uncommon more or less splitting common continuation into the trapezius fusion with the pectoralis major additional slips from the vertebral border of the scapula infraspinous fascia and axillary border of scapula not uncommon insertion varies in extent or rarely is prolonged to origin of brachioradialis nerves the deltoideus is supplied by the fifth and sixth cervical through the axillary nerve actions the deltoideus raises the arm from the side so as to bring it at right angles with the trunk its anterior fibers assisted by the pectoralis major draw the arm forward and its posterior fibers aided by the teres major and latissimus dorsi draw it backward subscapular fascia fascia subscapularis the subscapular fascia is a thin membrane attached to the entire circumference of the subscapular fossa and affording attachment by its deep surface to some of the fibers of the subscapularis the subscapularis is a large triangular muscle which fills the subscapular fossa and arises from its medial two-thirds and from the lower two-thirds of the groove on the axillary border of the bone some fibers arise from tendinous laminae which intersect the muscle and are attached to ridges on the bone others from an aponeurosis which separates the muscle from the teres major and the long head of the triceps brachii the fibers pass lateralward and gradually converging end in a tendon which is inserted into the lesser tubercle of the humerus and the front of the capsule of the shoulder joint the tendon of the muscle is separated from the neck of the scapula by a large bursa which communicates with the cavity of the shoulder joint through an aperture in the capsule nerves the subscapularis is supplied by the fifth and sixth cervical nerves through the upper and lower subscapular nerves actions the subscapularis rotates the head of the humerus inward when the arm is raised it draws the humerus forward and downward it is a powerful defense to the front of the shoulder joint preventing displacement of the head of the humerus supraspinatus fascia fascia supraspinata the supraspinatus fascia completes the osseofibrous case in which the supraspinatus muscle is contained it affords attachment by its deep surface to some of the fibers of the muscle it is thick medially but thinner laterally under the caracoacromial ligament the supraspinatus occupies the whole of the supraspinatus fossa arising from its medial two-thirds and from the strong supraspinatus fascia the muscular fibers converge to a tendon which crosses the upper part of the shoulder joint and is inserted into the highest of the three impressions on the greater tubercle of the humerus 
the tendon is intimately adherent to the capsule of the shoulder joint. Infraspinatus fascia, fascia infraspinata. The infraspinatus fascia is a dense fibrous membrane covering the infraspinatus muscle and fixed to the circumference of the infraspinatus fossa. It affords attachment by its deep surface to some fibers of that muscle. It is intimately attached to the deltoid fascia along the overlapping border of the deltoideus. The infraspinatus is a thick triangular muscle which occupies the chief part of the infraspinatus fossa. It arises by fleshy fibers from its medial two-thirds and by tendinous fibers from the ridges on its surface. It also arises from the infraspinatus fascia which covers it and separates it from the pterides major and minor. The fibers converge to a tendon which glides over the lateral border of the spine of the scapula, and passing across the posterior part of the capsule of the shoulder joint, is inserted into the middle impression on the greater tubercle of the humerus. The tendon of this muscle is sometimes separated from the capsule of the shoulder joint by a bursa, which may communicate with the joint cavity. The teres minor is a narrow, elongated muscle which arises from the dorsal surface of the axillary border of the scapula for the upper two-thirds of its extent, and from two aponeurotic laminae, one of which separates it from the infraspinatus, the other from the teres major. Its fibers run obliquely upward and lateralward, the upper ones in an tendon which is inserted into the lowest of the three impressions on the greater tubercle of the humerus. The lowest fibers are inserted directly into the humerus immediately below this impression. The tendon of this muscle passes across and is united with the posterior part of the capsule of the shoulder joint. Variations. It is sometimes inseparable from the infraspinatus. The teres major is a thick but somewhat flattened muscle which arises from the oval area on the dorsal surface of the inferior angle of the scapula and from the fibrous septa interposed between the muscle and the teres minor and infraspinatus. The fibers are directed upward and lateralward and end in a flat tendon about five centimeters long which is inserted into the crest of the lesser tubercle of the humerus. The tendon at its insertion lies behind that of the latissimus dorsi from which it is separated by a bursa, the two tendons being, however, united along their lower borders for a short distance. Nerves. The supraspinatus and infraspinatus are supplied by the fifth and sixth cervical nerves through the suprascapular nerve, the teres minor by the fifth cervical through the axillary, and the teres major by the fifth and sixth cervical through the lowest subscapular. Actions. The supraspinatus assists the deltoideus in raising the arm from the side of the trunk and fixes the head of the humerus in the glenoid cavity. The infraspinatus and teres minor rotate the head of the humerus outward. They also assist in carrying the arm backward. One of the most important uses of these three muscles is to protect the shoulder joint, the supraspinatus supporting it above and the infraspinatus and teres minor behind. The teres major assists the latissimus dorsi in drawing the previously raised humerus downward and backward, and in rotating it inward. When the arm is fixed, it may assist the pectoralis and the latissimus dorsi in drawing the trunk forward. End of section 44 of Gray's Anatomy, part 2. Section 45 of Gray's Anatomy, part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. Muscles and Fascia of the Arm. The muscles of the arm are caracobrachialis, brachialis, biceps brachii, triceps brachii. Brachial fascia, fascia brachii, deep fascia of the arm. The brachial fascia is continuous with that covering the deltoidus and the pectoralis major, by means of which it is attached above to the clavicle, acromion, and spine of the scapula. It forms a thin, loose, membranous sheath for the muscles of the arm, and sends septa between them. It is composed of fibres disposed in a circular or spiral direction and connected together by vertical and oblique fibres. It differs in thickness at different parts, being thin over the biceps brachii, but thicker where it covers the triceps brachii, and over the epicondyls of the humerus. 
It is strengthened by fibrous aponeurosis, derived from the pectoralis major and latimus dorsi medially, and from the deltoideus laterally. On either side it gives off a strong intermuscular septum, which is attached to the corresponding supracondylar ridge and epicondyle of the humerus. The lateral intramuscular septum extends from the lowest part of the crest of the greater tubercle, along the lateral supracondylar ridge to the lateral epicondyle. It is blended with the tendon of the deltoideus, gives attachment to the tricep brachii behind, to the brachialis, brachioradialis, and extensor carpi radialis longus in front, and is perforated by the radial nerve and profunda branch of the branchial artery. The medial intermuscular septum, thicker than the preceding, extends from the lower part of the crest of the lesser tubercle of the humerus, below the teres major, along the medial supracondylar ridge to the medial epicondyle. It is blended with the tendon of the corocobrachialis, and affords attachment to the triceps brachii behind and the brachialis in front. It is perforated by the ulnar nerve, the superior ulnar collateral artery, and the posterior branch of the inferior ulnar collateral artery. At the elbow, the deep fascia is attached to the epicondyles of the humerus and the olecranon of the ulna, and is continuous with the deep fascia of the forearm. Just below the middle of the arm, on its medial side, is an oval opening in the deep fascia, which transmits the basilic vein and some lymphatic vessels. The corocobrachialis, the smallest of the three muscles in this region, is situated at the upper and medial part of the arm. It arises from the apex of the coracoid process, in common with the short head of the biceps brachii, and from the intermuscular septum between the two muscles. It is inserted by means of a flat tendon into an impression at the middle of the medial surface and border of the body of the humerus between the origins of the triceps brachii and brachialis. It is perforated by the muscular cutaneous nerve. Variations A bony head may reach the medial epicondyle. A short head, more rarely found, may insert into the lesser tubercle. The biceps brachii, biceps, biceps flexor cubiti, is a long fusiform muscle placed on the front of the arm and arising by two heads, from which circumstance it has received its name. The short head arises by a thick flattened tendon from the apex of the coracoid process, in common with the coracobrachialis. The long head arises from the supraglenoid tuberosity at the upper margin of the glenoid cavity, and is continuous with the glenoidal labrum. This tendon, enclosed in a special sheath of the synovial membrane of the shoulder joint, arches over the head of the humerus. It emerges from the capsule through an opening close to the humeral attachment of the ligament, and descends into the intertubercular groove. It is retained in the groove by the transverse humeral ligament, and by a fibrous prolongation from the tendon of the pectoralis major. Each tendon is succeeded by an elongated muscular belly, and the two bellies, although closely applied to each other, can readily be separated until within about 7.5 centimetres of the elbow joint. Here they end in a flattened tendon, which is inserted into the rough posterior portion of the tuberosity of the radius, a bursa being interposed between the tendon and the front part of the tuberosity. As the tendon of the muscle approaches the radius, it is twisted upon itself, so that its anterior surface becomes lateral and is applied to the tuberosity of the radius at its insertion. Opposite the bend of the elbow, the tendon gives off, from its medial side, a broad aponeurosis, the lacutus fibrosus, bicipital fascia which passes obliquely downward and medialward across the brachial artery and is continuous with the deep fasci covering the origins of the flexor muscles of the forearm. Variations 
A third head, 10 per cent., to the biceps brachii is occasionally found, arising at the upper and medial part of the brachialis, with the fibres of which it is continuous, and inserted into the lacertus fibrosus and medial side of the tendon of the muscle. In most cases, this additional slip lies behind the brachial artery in its course down the arm. In some instances, the third head consists of two slips, which pass down, one in front and the other behind the artery, concealing the vessel in the lower half of the arm. More rarely, a fourth head occurs, arising from the outer side of the humerus, from the intertubercular groove, or from the greater tubercle. Other heads are occasionally found. Slips sometimes pass from the inner border of the muscle over the brachial artery to the medial intermuscular septum, or the media epicondyle, more rarely to the pronator teres or brachialis. The long head may be absent or arise from the intertubercular groove. The brachialis, brachialis anticus, covers the front of the elbow joint and the lower half of the humerus. It arises from the lower half of the front of the humerus, commencing above at the insertion of the deltoideus, which it embraces by two angular processes. Its origin extends below to within 2.5 centimetres of the margin of the articular surface. It also arises from the intermuscular septa, but more extensively from the medial than the lateral. It is separated from the lateral below by the brachioradialis and the extensor carpi radialis longus. Its fibres converge to a thick tendon, which is inserted into the tuberosity of the ulna and the rough depression on the anterior surface of the coronoid process. Variations. Occasionally doubled. Additional slip to the supernata, pronata teres, biceps, lacertus fibrosus, or radius are more rarely found. Nerves. The chorio-brachialis, biceps brachii and brachialis are supplied by the musculocutaneous nerve. The brachialis usually receives an additional filament from the radial. The caracobrachialis receives its supply primary from the seventh cervical, the biceps brachii and the brachialis from the fifth and sixth cervical nerves. Actions. The chorio-brachialis draws the humerus forward and medialward, and at the same time assists in retaining the head of the bone in contact with the glenoid cavity. The biceps brachii is a flexor of the elbow, and to a lesser extent of the shoulder. It is also a powerful supinator, and serves to render tense the deep fasciae of the forearm, by means of the lacertus fibrosus given off from its tendon. The brachialis is a flexor of the forearm, and forms an important defence to the elbow joint. When the forearm is fixed, the biceps brachii and brachialis flex the arm upon the forearm, as in efforts of climbing. The triceps brachii, triceps, triceps extensor cubiti, is situated on the back of the arm, extending the entire length of the dorsal surface of the humerus. It is of a large size, and arises by three heads, long, lateral and medial, hence its name. The long head arises by a flattened tendon from the infraglenoid tuberosity of the scalpula, being blended as its upper part with the capsule of the shoulder joint. The muscular fibres pass downward between the two other heads of the muscle, and join with them in the tendon of insertion. The lateral head arises from the posterior surface of the body of the humerus, between the insertion of the teres minor and the upper part of the groove for the radial nerve, and from the lateral border of the humerus and the lateral intermuscular septum. The fibres from this origin converge towards the tendon of insertion. The medial head arises from the posterior surface of the body of the humerus, below the groove for the radial nerve. It is narrow and pointed above, and extends from the insertion of the teres major to within 2.5 centimetres of the trochlea. It also arises from the medial border of the humerus, and from the back of the whole length of the medial intramuscular septum. 
Some of the fibres are directed downward to the olecranum, while others converge to the tendon of insertion. The tendon of the triceps brachii begins about the middle of the muscle. It consists of two aponeurotic lamina, one of which is subcutaneous and covers the back of the lower half of the muscle. The other is more deeply seated in the substance of the muscle. After receiving the attachment of the muscular fibres, the two lamellae join together above the elbow and are inserted for the most part into the posterior portion of the upper surface of the olecranon. A band of fibres is, however, continued downward on the lateral side over the anconius to bend with the deep fasciae of the forearm. The long head of the triceps brachii descends between the teres minor and the teres major dividing the triangular space between these two muscles and the humerus into two smaller spaces, one triangular, the other quadrangular. The triangular space contains the scapular circumflex vessels. It is bounded by the teres minor above, the teres major below, and the scapular head of the triceps laterally. The quadrangular space transmits the posterior humeral circumflex vessels and the axillary nerve. It is bounded by the teres minor and capsule of the shoulder joint above, the teres major below, the long head of the triceps brachii medially, and the humerus laterally. Variations. A fourth head from the inner part of the humerus, a slip between triceps and latimus dorsi corresponding to the dorso epitrochialis. The subanconius is the name given to a few fibres which spring from the deep surface of the lower part of the triceps brachii and are inserted into the posterior ligament and synovial membrane of the elbow joint. Nerves The triceps brachii is supplied by the seventh and eighth cervical nerves through the radial nerve. Actions The triceps brachii is the great extensor muscle of the forearm and is the direct antagonist of the biceps brachii and brachialis. When the arm is extended, the long head of the muscle may assist the teres major and latissimus dorsi in drawing the humerus backward and in abducting it to the thorax. The long head supports the under part of the shoulder joint. The subanconius draws up the synovial membrane of the elbow joint during extension of the forearm. End of section 45 Section 46 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bologna Times Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray The Muscles and Fascia of the Forearm The Muscles and Fascia of the Forearm Antibrachial Fascia, Fascia Antibrachii, Deep Fascia of the Forearm the antibrachial fascia, continuous above with the brachial fascia, is a dense membranous investment, which forms a general sheath for the muscles in this region. It is attached, behind, to the olecranon and dorsal border of the ulna, and gives off from its deep surface numerous intermuscular septa, which enclose each muscle separately. Over the flexor tendons, as they approach the wrist, it is especially thickened, and forms the volar carpal ligament. This is continuous with the transverse carpal ligament, and forms a sheath for the tendon of the palmaris longus, which passes over the transverse carpal ligament to be inserted into the palmar aponeurosis. Behind, near the wrist joint, it is thickened by the addition of many transverse fibers, and forms the dorsal carpal ligament. It is much thicker on the dorsal than on the volar surface, and at the lower than at the upper part of the forearm, and is strengthened 
above by tendinous fibers derived by the biceps brachii in front and from the triceps brachii behind. It gives origin to muscular fibers, especially at the upper part of the medial and lateral sides of the forearm, and forms the boundaries of a series of cone-shaped cavities in which the muscles are contained. Besides the vertical septa separating the individual muscles, transverse septa are given off both on the volar and dorsal surfaces of the forearm, separating the deep from the superficial layers of muscles. Apertures exist in the fascia for the passage of vessels and nerves. One of these apertures of large size, situated at the front of the elbow, serves for the passage of a communicating branch between the superficial and deep veins. The antibrachial or forearm muscles may be divided into a volar and a dorsal group. The volar antibrachial muscles. These muscles are divided for convenience of description into two groups, superficial and deep. The superficial group, pronator teres, palmaris longus, flexor carpe radialis, flexor carpe ulnaris, flexor digitorum sublimus. The muscles of this group take origin from the media epicondyle of the humerus by a common tendon. They receive additional fibers from the deep fascia of the forearm near the elbow and from the septa, which pass from this fascia between the individual muscles. The pronator teres has two heads of origin, humeral and ulnar. The humeral head, the larger and more superficial, arises immediately above the medial epicondyle and from the tendon common to the origin of the other muscles, also from the intermuscular septum between it and the flexor carpe radialis and from the antibrachial fascia. The ulnar head is a thin fasciculus which arises from the medial side of the coronoid process of the ulna and joins the proceeding at an acute angle. The median nerve enters the forearm between the two heads of the muscle and is separated from the ulnar artery by the ulnar head. The muscle passes obliquely across the forearm and ends in a flat tendon which is inserted into a rough impression at the middle of the lateral surface of the body of the radius. The lateral border of the muscle forms the medial boundary of a triangular hollow situated in front of the elbow joint and containing the brachial artery, median nerve, and tendon of the biceps brachii. Variations. Absence of ulnar head additional slips from the medial intermuscular septum from the biceps and from the brachialis anticus occasionally occur. The flexor carpi radialis lies on the medial side of the preceding muscle. It arises from the medial epicondyle by the common tendon, from the fascia of the forearm, and from the intermuscular septa between it and the pronator teres laterally the palmaris longus medially, and the flexor digitorum sublimus beneath. Slender and aponeurotic in structure at its commencement, it increases in size and ends in a tendon which forms rather more than the lower half of its length. This tendon passes through a canal in the lateral part of the transverse carpal ligament and runs through a groove on the greater multangular bone. The groove is converted into a canal by fibrous tissue and lined by a mucous sheath. The tendon is inserted into the base of the second metacarpal bone and sends a slip to the base of the third metacarpal bone. The radial artery in the lower part of the forearm lies between the tendon and this muscle and the brachioradialis variations. Slips from the tendon of the biceps, the lacertus fibrosus, the coronoid, and the radius have been found. 
Its insertion often varies and may be mostly into the annular ligament, the trapezium, or the fourth metacarpal, as well as the second or third. The muscle may be absent. The palmaris longus is a slender, fusiform muscle lying on the medial side of the proceeding. It arises from the medial epicondyle of the humerus by the common tendon, from the intermuscular septa between it and the adjacent muscles, and from the antibrachial fascia. It ends in a slender, flattened tendon, which passes over the upper part of the transverse carpal ligament and is inserted into the central part of the transverse carpal ligament and lower part of the palmar aponeurosis, frequently sending a tendinous slip to the short muscles of the thumb. Variations One of the most variable muscles in the body. This muscle is often absent about 10% and is subject to many variations. It may be tendinous above and muscular below or it may be muscular in the center with a tendon above and below, or it may be present two muscular bundles with a central tendon, or finally it may consist solely of a tendinous band. The muscle may be double, slips of origin from the coronoid process or from the radius have been seen. Partial or complete insertion into the fascia of the forearm, into the tendon of the flexor carpi ulnaris and pisiform bone, into the navicular, and into the muscles of the little finger have been observed. The flexor carpi ulnaris lies along the ulnar side of the forearm. It arises by two heads, humeral and ulnar connected by a tendinous arch, beneath which the ulnar nerve and posterior ulnar recurrent artery pass. The humeral head arises from the media epicondyle of the humerus by the common tendon. The ulnar head arises from the medial margin of the olecranon and from the upper two-thirds of the dorsal border of the ulna by an aponeurosis common to it and the extensor carpi ulnaris and flexor digitorum profundus, and from the intermuscular septum between it and the flexor digitorum sublimus. The fibers end in a tendon which occupies the anterior part of the lower half of the muscle and is inserted into the pisiform bone. It is prolonged from this to the hamate and fifth metacarpal bones by the pisohamate and pisometacarpal ligaments. It is also attached by a few fibers to the transverse carpal ligament. The ulnar vessels and nerve lie on the lateral side of the tendon of this muscle, in the lower two-thirds of the forearm. Variations Slips of origin from the coronoid. The epitrocleo anoconeus, a small muscle often present, runs from the back of the inner condyle to the olecranon over the ulnar nerve. The flexor digitorum sublimus is placed beneath the previous muscle. It is the largest of the muscles of the superficial group, and arises by three heads, humeral, ulnar, and radial. The humeral head arises from the medial epicondyle of the humerus by the common tendon, from the ulnar collateral ligament of the elbow joint and from the intermuscular septa between it and the preceding muscles. The ulnar head arises from the medial side of the coronoid process above the ulnar origin of the pronator teres. The radial head arises from the oblique line of the radius extending from the radial tuberosity to the insertion of the pronator teres. The muscle speedily separates into two planes of muscular fibers, superficial and deep. The superficial plane divides into two parts, which end in tendons for the middle and ring fingers. The deep plane gives off a muscular slip to join the portion of the superficial plane, which is associated with the tendon of the ring finger, and then divides into two parts, which end in tendons for the index and little fingers. 
as the four tendons thus formed pass beneath the transverse carpal ligament into the palm of the hand they are arranged in pairs the superficial pair going to the middle and ring fingers the deep pair to the index and little fingers the tendons diverge from one another in the palm and form dorsal relations to the superficial volar arch and digital branches of the median and ulnar nerves opposite the bases of the first phalanges each tendon divides into two slips to allow of the passage of the corresponding tendon of the flexor digitorum profundus the two slips then reunite and form a grooved channel for the reception of the accompanying tendon of the flexor digitorum profundus finally the tendon divides and is inserted into the sides of the second phalanx about its middle variations absence of radial head of little finger portion accessory slips from ulnar tuberosity to the index and middle finger portions from the inner head to the flexor profundus from the ulnar to annular ligament to the little finger the deep group flexor digitorum profundus flexor pollicis longus pronator quadratus the flexor digitorum profundus is situated on the ulnar side of the forearm immediately beneath the superficial flexors it arises from the upper three-fourths of the volar and medial surfaces of the body of the ulna embracing the insertion of brachialis above and extending below to within a short distance of the pronator quadratus it also arises from a depression on the medial side of the coronoid process by an aponeurosis from the upper three-fourths of the dorsal border of the ulna in common with the flexor and extensor carpi ulnaris and from the ulnar half of the interosseous membrane the muscle ends in four tendons which run under the transverse carpal ligament dorsal to the tendons of the flexor digitorum sublimus opposite the first phalanges the tendons pass through the openings in the tendons of the flexor digitorum sublimus and are finally inserted into the bases of the last phalanges the portion of the muscle for the index finger is usually distinct throughout but the tendons for the middle ring and little fingers are connected together by areolar tissue and tendinous slips as far as the palm of the hand fibrous sheaths of the flexor tendons after leaving the palm the tendons of the flexorus digitorum sublimus and profundus lie in osseo aponeurotic canals formed behind the phalanges and in front by strong fibrous bands which arch across the tendons and are attached on either side to the margins of the phalanges opposite the middle of the proximal and second phalanges the bands digital vaginal ligaments are very strong and the fibers are transverse but opposite the joints they are much thinner and consist of annular and cruciate ligamentous fibers each canal contains a mucous sheath which is reflected on the contained tendons within each canal the tendons of the flexorus digitorum sublimus and profundus are connected to each other and to the phalanges by slender tendinous bands called vincula tendina there are two sets of these a the vincula brevia which are two in number in each finger and consist of triangular bands of fibers one connecting the tendon of the flexor digitorum sublimus to the front of the the first interphalangeal joint and head of the first phalanx and the other the tendon of the flexor digitorum profundus to the front of the second interphalangeal joint and head of the second phalanx b the vincula longa which connect the under surfaces of the tendons of the flexor digitorum profundus to those of the subjacent flexor sublimus after the tendons of the former have passed through the latter variations the index finger portion may arise partly from the upper part of the radius slips from the inner head of the flexor sublimus 
medial epicondyle or the coronoid are found. Connection with the flexor pollicis longus. Four small muscles, the lumbricals, are connected with the tendons of the flexor profundus in the palm. They will be described with the muscles of the hand. The flexor pollicis longus is situated on the radial side of the forearm, lying in the same plane as the preceding. It arises from the grooved volar surface of the body of the radius, extending from immediately below the tuberosity and oblique line to within a short distance of the pronator quadratus. It arises also from the adjacent part of the interosseous membrane, and generally by a fleshy slip from the medial border of the coronoid process, or from the medial epicondyle of the humerus. The fibers end in a flattened tendon, which passes beneath the transverse carpal ligament, is then lodged between the lateral head of the flexor pollicis brevis and the oblique part of the adductor pollicis, and entering an osseoaponeurotic canal, similar to those for the flexor tendons of the fingers, is inserted into the base of the distal phalanx of the thumb. The volar interosseous nerve and vessels pass downward on the front of the interosseous membrane between the flexor pollicis longus and flexor digitorum profundus. Variations. Slips may connect with flexor sublimus or profundus or pronator teres. An additional tendon to the index finger is sometimes found. The pronator quadratus is a small flat quadrilateral muscle extending across the front of the lower parts of the radius and ulna. It arises from the pronator ridge on the lower part of the volar surface of the body of the ulna, from the medial part of the volar surface of the lower fourth of the ulna, and from a strong aponeurosis which covers the medial third of the muscle. The fibers pass lateralward and slightly downward to be inserted into the lower fourth of the lateral border and the volar surface of the body of the radius. The deeper fibers of the muscle are inserted into the triangular area above the ulnar notch of the radius. An attachment comparable with the origin of the supinator from the triangular area below the radial notch of the ulna. Variations Rarely absent split into two or three layers, increased attachment upward or downward. Nerves. All the muscles of the superficial layer are supplied by the median nerve, excepting the flexor carpi ulnaris, which is supplied by the ulnar. The pronator teres, the flexor carpi radialis, and the palmaris longus derive their supply primarily from the sixth cervical nerve, the flexor digitorum sublimus from the seventh and eighth cervical and first thoracic nerves, and the flexor carpi ulnaris from the eighth cervical and first thoracic. Of the deep layer, the flexor digitorum profundus is applied by the eighth cervical and first thoracic through the ulnar and the volar interosseous branch of the median. The flexor pollicis longus and pronator quadratus are supplied by the eighth cervical and first thoracic through the volar interosseous branch of the median. Actions. These muscles act upon the forearm, the wrist, and hand. The pronator teres rotates the radius upon the ulna, rendering the hand prone. When the radius is fixed, it assists in flexing the forearm. The flexor carpe radialis is a flexor, an abductor of the wrist. It also assists in pronating the hand and in bending the elbow. The flexor carpi ulnaris is a flexor and adductor of the wrist. It also assists in bending the elbow. The palmaris longus is a flexor of the wrist joint. It also assists in flexing the elbow. The flexor digitorum sublimus flexes first the middle and then the proximal phalanges, and then the proximal phalanges. It also assists in flexing the wrist and elbow. The flexor digitorum profundus is one of the flexors of the phalanges. 
After the flexor sublimus has bent the second phalanx, the flexor profundus flexes the terminal one, but it cannot do so until after the contraction of the superficial muscle. It also assists in flexing the wrist. The flexor pollicis longus is a flexor of the phalanges of the thumb. When the thumb is fixed, it assists in flexing the wrist. The pronator quadratus rotates the radius upon the ulna, rendering the hand prone. End of section 46 Recording by Bologna Times, Tampa, Florida Section 47 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. Muscles and Fasci of the Forearm, Part 2. 2. The Dorsal Antibrachial Muscles. These muscles are divided for convenience of description into two groups, superficial and deep. The superficial group, brachioradialis, extensor carpi radialis longus, extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor digitorum communis, extensor digiti quinti proprius, extensor carpi ulnaris, and coneus. The brachioradialis, supinator longus, is the most superficial muscle on the radial side of the forearm. It arises from the upper two-thirds of the lateral supracondylar ridge of the humerus and from the lateral intermuscular septum, being limited above by the groove for the radial nerve. Interposed between it and the brachialis are the radial nerve and the anastomosis between the anterior branch of the profunda artery and the radial recurrent. The fibers end above the middle of the forearm in a flat tendon, which is inserted into the lateral side of the base of the styloid process of the radius. The tendon is crossed near its insertion by the tendons of the abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. On its honor side is the radial artery. Variations Fusion with the brachialis Tendon of insertion may be divided into two or three slips, insertion partial or complete into the middle of the radius, fasciculi to the tendon of the biceps, the tuberosity or oblique line of the radius, slips to the extensor carpi radialis longus or abductor pollicis longus, absence rarely doubled. The extensor carpi radialis longus extensor carpi radialis longeur is placed partly beneath the brachioradialis. It arises from the lower third of the lateral supracondylar ridge of the humerus, from the lateral intermuscular septum, and by a few fibers from the common tendon of origin of the extensor muscles of the forearm. The fibers end at the upper third of the forearm in a flat tendon, which runs along the lateral border of the radius beneath the abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis. It then passes beneath the dorsal carpal ligament, where it lies in a groove on the back of the radius common to it and the extensor carpi radialis brevis, immediately behind the styloid process. It is inserted into the dorsal surface of the base of the second metacarpal bone on its radial side. The extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor carpi radialis brevior, is shorter and thicker than the preceding muscle beneath which it is placed. It arises from the lateral epicondyle of the humerus by a tendon common to it and the three following muscles. From the radial collateral ligament of the elbow joint, from a strong aponeurosis which covers its surface, and from the intermuscular septa between it and the adjacent muscles. The fibers end about the middle of the forearm in a flat tendon, which is closely connected with that of the preceding muscle, and accompanies it to the wrist. It passes beneath the abductor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis, then beneath the dorsal carpal ligament, 
and is inserted into the dorsal surface of the base of the third metacarpal bone on its radial side. Under the dorsal carpal ligament, the tendon lies on the back of the radius in a shallow groove. To the ulnar side of that which lodges the tendon of the extensor carpi radialis, longus, and separated from it by a faint ridge. The tendons of the two preceding muscles pass through the same compartment of the dorsal carpal ligament in a single mucous sheath. Variations Either muscle may split into two or three tendons of insertion to the second and third or even the fourth metacarpal. The two muscles may unite into a single belly with two tendons. Cross slips between the two muscles may occur. The extensor carpi radialis intermedius rarely arises as a distinct muscle from the humerus, but is not uncommon as an accessory slip from one or both muscles to the second or third or both metacarpals. The extensor carpi radialis accessorius is occasionally found arising from the humerus with or below the extensor carpi radialis longus and inserted into the first metacarpal the abductor pollicis brevis, the first dorsal interosseus, or elsewhere. The extensor digitorum communis arises from the lateral epicondyle of the humerus by the common tendon from the intermuscular septa between it and the adjacent muscles and from the antibrachial fascia. It divides below into four tendons which pass together with that of the extensor indices proprius through a separate compartment of the dorsal carpal ligament within a mucous sheath. The tendons then diverge on the back of the hand and are inserted into the second and third phalanges of the fingers in the following manner. Opposite the metacarpophalangeal articulation, each tendon is bound by fasciculi to the collateral ligaments and serves as the dorsal ligament of this joint. After having crossed the joint, it spreads out into a broad aponeurosis, which covers the dorsal surface of the first phalanx and is reinforced in this situation by the tendons of the interossei and lumbar callus. Opposite the first interphalangeal joint, this aponeurosis divides into three slips, an intermediate and two collateral. The former is inserted into the base of the second phalanx and the two collateral, which are continued onward along the sides of the second phalanx, unite by their contiguous margins and are inserted into the dorsal surface of the last phalanx. As the tendons cross the interphalangeal joints, they furnish them with dorsal ligaments. The tendon to the index finger is accompanied by the extensor indices proprius, which lies on its honor side. On the back of the hand, the tendons to the middle, ring, and little fingers are connected by two obliquely placed bands, one from the third tendon passing downward and lateralward to the second tendon, and the other passing from the same tendon downward and medialward to the fourth. Occasionally, the first tendon is connected to the second by a thin transverse band. Variations an increase or decrease in the number of tendons is common. An additional slip to the thumb is sometimes present. The extensor digiti quinti proprius, extensor minimi digiti, is a slender muscle placed on the medial side of the extensor digitorum communis, with which it is generally connected. It arises from the common extensor tendon by a thin tendinous slip from the intermuscular septa between it and the adjacent muscles. Its tendon runs through a compartment of the dorsal carpal ligament behind the distal radio ulnar joint, then divides into two as it crosses the hand, and finally joins the expansion of the extensor digitorum communis tendon on the dorsum of the first phalanx of the little finger. Variations An additional fibrous slip from the lateral epicondyle. The tendon of insertion may not divide or may send a slip to the ring finger. Absence of muscle rare, fusion of the belly with the extensor digitorum communis not uncommon. The extensor carpi ulnaris lies on the ulnar side of the forearm. It arises from the lateral epicondyle of the humerus by the common tendon, 
by an aponeurosis from the dorsal border of the ulna in common with the flexor carpi ulnaris and the flexor digitorum profundus, and from the deep fascia of the forearm. It ends in a tendon, which runs in a groove between the head and the styloid process of the ulna, passing through a separate compartment of the dorsal carpal ligament, and is inserted into the prominent tubercle on the ulnar side of the base of the fifth metacarpal bone. Variations Doubling Reduction to tendinous band Insertion partially into fourth metacarpal In many cases, 52%, a slip is continued from the insertion of the tendon anteriorly over the opponent's digiti quinti to the fascia covering that muscle, the metacarpal bone, the capsule of the metacarpophalangeal articulation, or the first phalanx of the little finger. This slip may be replaced by a muscular fasciculus arising from or near the pisiform. The anconeus is a small triangular muscle which is placed on the back of the elbow joint and appears to be a continuation of the triceps brachii. It arises by a separate tendon from the back part of the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. Its fibers diverge and are inserted into the side of the olecranon and upper fourth of the dorsal surface of the body of the ulna. The deep group, supinator, abductor pollicis longus extensor pollicis brevis, extensor pollicis longus, extensor indicis proprius. The supinator, supinator brevis, is a broad muscle curved around the upper third of the radius. It consists of two planes of fibers, between which the deep branch of the radial nerve lies. The two planes arise in common, the superficial one by tendinous and the deeper by muscular fibers from the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, from the radial collateral ligament of the elbow joint and the annular ligament, from the ridge on the ulna, which runs obliquely downward from the dorsal end of the radial notch, from the triangular depression below the notch, and from a tendinous expansion which covers the surface of the muscle. The superficial fibers surround the upper part of the radius and are inserted into the lateral edge of the radial tuberosity and the oblique line of the radius, as low down as the insertion of the pronator teres. The upper fibers of the deeper plane form a sling-like fasciculus, which encircles the neck of the radius above the tuberosity and is attached to the back part of its medial surface. The greater part of this portion of the muscle is inserted into the dorsal and lateral surfaces of the body of the radius midway between the oblique line and the head of the bone. The abductor pollicis longus, extensor os metacarpi pollicis, lies immediately below the supinator and is sometimes united with it. It arises from the lateral part of the dorsal surface of the body of the ulna, below the insertion of the anconeus, from the interosseous membrane, and from the middle third of the dorsal surface of the body of the radius. Passing obliquely downward and lateralward, it ends in a tendon, which runs through a groove on the lateral side of the lower end of the radius, accompanied by the tendon of the extensor pollicis brevis, and is inserted into the radial side of the base of the first metacarpal bone. It occasionally gives off two slips near its insertion, one to the greater multangular bone, and the other to blend with the origin of the abductor pollicis brevis. Variations More or less doubling of muscle and tendon with insertion of the extra tendon into the first metacarpal, the greater multangular, or into the abductor pollicis brevis or opponens pollicis. The extensor pollicis brevis, extensor primi internatii pollicis, lies on the medial side of and is closely connected with the abductor pollicis longus. It arises from the dorsal surface of the body of the radius below that muscle and from the interosseous membrane. Its direction is similar to that of the abductor pollicis longus, its tendon passing the same groove on the lateral side of the lower end of the radius to be inserted into the base of the first phalanx of the thumb. Variations Absence Fusion of tendon with that of the extensor pollicis longus the extensor pollicis longus, 
extensor secondi internatii pollicis, is much larger than the preceding muscle, the origin of which it partly covers. It arises from the lateral part of the middle third of the dorsal surface of the body of the ulna, below the origin of the abductor pollicis longus, and from the enterosseous membrane. It ends in a tendon, which passes through a separate compartment in the dorsal carpal ligament, lying in a narrow oblique groove on the back of the lower end of the radius. It then crosses obliquely the tendons of the extensoris carpi radialis longus and brevis, and is separated from the extensor brevis pollicis by a triangular interval in which the radial artery is found, and is finally inserted into the base of the last phalanx of the thumb. The radial artery is crossed by the tendons of the abductor pollicis longus and of the extensoris pollicis longus and brevis. The extensor indices proprius, extensor indices, is a narrow, elongated muscle placed medial to and parallel with the preceding. It arises from the dorsal surface of the body of the ulna below the origin of the extensor pollicis longus and from the enterosseous membrane. Its tendon passes under the dorsal carpal ligament in the same compartment as that which transmits the tendons of the extensor digitorum communis, and opposite the head of the second metacarpal bone, joins the ulnar side of the tendon of the extensor digitorum communis, which belongs to the index finger. Variations Doubling The ulnar part may pass beneath the dorsal carpal ligament with the extensor digitorum communis. A slip from the tendon may pass to the index finger. Nerves. The brachioradialis is supplied by the fifth and sixth, the extensoris carpi radialis longus and brevis by the sixth and seventh, and the anconeus by the seventh and eighth cervical nerves through the radial nerve. The remaining muscles are innervated through the deep radial nerve, the supinator being supplied by the sixth, and all the other muscles by the seventh cervical. Actions. The muscles of the lateral and dorsal aspects of the forearm, which comprise all the extensor muscles and the supinator, act upon the forearm, wrist, and hand. They are the direct antagonists of the pronator and flexor muscles. The anconeus assists the triceps in extending the forearm. The brachioradialis is a flexor of the elbow joint but only acts as such when the movement of flexion has been initiated by the biceps brachii and brachialis. The action of the supinator is suggested by its name. It assists the biceps in bringing the hand into the supine position. The extensor carpi radialis longus extends the wrist and abducts the hand. It may also assist in bending the elbow joint. At all events, it serves to fix or steady this articulation. The extensor carpi radialis brevis extends the wrist and may also act slightly as an abductor of the hand. The extensor carpi ulnaris extends the wrist, but when acting alone, inclines the hand toward the ulnar side. By its continued action, it extends the elbow joint. The extensor digitorum communis extends the phalanges, then the wrist, and finally the elbow. It acts principally on the proximal phalanges, the middle and terminal phalanges being extended mainly by the enterosei and lumbricales. It tends to separate the fingers as it extends them. The extensor digiti quinti proprius extends the little finger, and by its continued action assists in extending the wrist. It is owing to this muscle that the little finger can be extended or pointed while the others are flexed. The chief action of the abductor pollicis longus is to carry the thumb laterally from the palm of the hand. By its continued action it helps to extend and abduct the wrist. The extensor pollicis brevis extends the proximal phalanx, and the extensor pollicis longus the terminal phalanx of the thumb. By their continued action, they help to extend and abduct the wrist. The extensor indices proprius extends the index finger, and by its continued action, assists in extending the wrist. End of section 47. Recording by Selena Arter.
Section 48 of Grey's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Grey. Muscles and Fasciae of the Hand. 1F. The Muscles and Fasciae of the Hand The muscles of the hand are subdivided into three groups. 1. Those of the thumb, which occupy the radial side and produce the thena eminence. 2. Those of the little finger, which occupy the ulnar side and give rise to the hypothena eminence. 3. Those in the middle of the palm and between the metacarpal bones. Volar Carpal Ligament Ligamentum carpi volare. The volar carpal ligament is the thickened band of the antibrachial fascia which extends from the radius to the ulna over the flexor tendons as they enter the wrist. Transverse carpal ligament. Ligamentum carpi transversum, anterior annular ligament. The transverse carpal ligament is a strong fibrous band which arches over the carpus converting the deep groove on the front of the carpal bones into a tunnel, through which the flexor tendons of the digits and the median nerve pass. It is attached medially to the pisiform and the hamulus of the hamate bones, laterally to the tuberosity of the navicular, and to the medial part of the volar surface and the ridge of the greater multangular. It is continuous, above, with the volar carpal ligament, and below, with the palmar aponeurosis. It is crossed by the ulnar vessels and nerve, and the cutaneous branches of the median and ulnar nerves. At its lateral end is the tendon of the flexor carpi radialis, which lies in the groove on the greater multangular between the attachments of the ligament to the bone. On its volar surface, the tendons of the palmaris longus and flexor carpi ulnaris are partially inserted. Below it gives origin to the short muscles of the thumb and little finger the mucous sheaths of the tendons on the front of the wrist. Two sheaths envelop the tendons as they pass beneath the transverse carpal ligament, one for the flexoris digitorum sublimis and profundis, and the other for the flexor pollicis longus. They extend into the forearm for about 2.5 centimetres above the transverse carpal ligament, and occasionally communicate with each other under the ligament. The sheath which surrounds the flexoris digitorum extends downward about halfway along the metacarpal bones, where it ends in blind diverticula around the tendons to the index, middle, and ring fingers. It is prolonged on the tendons to the little finger and usually communicates with the mucous sheath of these tendons. The sheath of the tendon of the flexor pollicis longus is continued along the thumb as far as the insertion of the tendon. The mucous sheaths enveloping the terminal parts of the tendons of the flexoris digitorum have been described on page 449. Dorsal carpal ligament. Ligamentum carpi dorsali. Posterior annular ligament. The dorsal carpal ligament is a strong fibrous band extending obliquely downward and medialward across the back of the wrist and consisting of part of the deep fascia of the back of the forearm strengthened by the addition of some transverse fibres. It is attached medially to the styloid process of the ulna and to the triangular and pisiform bones, laterally to the lateral margin of the radius, and, in its passage across the wrist, to the ridges on the dorsal surface of the radius. The mucous sheaths of the tendons on the back of the wrist. Between the dorsal carpal ligament and the bones, six compartments are formed for the passage of tendons, each compartment having a separate mucous sheath. One is found in each of the following positions. 1. On the lateral side of the styloid process, for the tendons of the abductor pollicis longus and the extensor pollicis brevis. 2. Behind the styloid process, for the tendons of the extensores carpi radialis longus and brevis. 3. About the middle of the dorsal surface of the radius, for the tendon of the extensor pollicis longus. 4. To the medial side of the latter, for the tendons of the extensor digitorum communis and extensor indicus proprius. 5. Opposite the interval between the radius and ulna, for the extensor digiti quinti proprius. 6. Between the head and styloid process of the ulna, for the tendon of the extensor carpi ulnaris. 
The sheaths lining these compartments extends from above the dorsal carpal ligament. Those for the tendons of abductor pollicis longus, extensor brevis pollicis, extensoris carpi radialis, and extensor carpi ulnaris stop immediately proximal to the bases of the metacarpal bones, while the sheaths for extensor communis digitorum, extensor indicus proprius, and extensor digiti quinti proprius are prolonged to the junction of the proximal and intermediate thirds of the metacarpus. Palmar aponeurosis, aponeurosis palmaris, palmar fascia. The palmar aponeurosis invests the muscles of the palm, and consists of central, lateral, and medial portions. The central portion occupies the middle of the palm, is triangular in shape, and of great strength and thickness. Its apex is continuous with the lower margin of the transverse carpal ligament, and receives the expanded tendon of the palmaris longus. Its base divides below into four slips, one for each finger. Each slip gives off superficial fibres to the skin of the palm and finger, those to the palm joining the skin at the furrow corresponding to the metacarpophalangeal articulations, and those to the fingers passing into the skin at the transverse fold at the bases of the fingers. The deeper part of each slip subdivides into two processes, which are inserted into the fibrous sheaths of the flexor tendons. From the sides of these processes, offsets are attached to the transverse metacarpal ligament. By this arrangement, short channels are formed on the front of the heads of the metacarpal bones. Through these, the flexor tendons pass. The intervals between the four slips transmit the digital vessels and nerves and the tendons of the lumbricales. At the points of division into the slips mentioned, numerous strong transverse fasciculi bind the separate processes together. The central part of the palmar aponeurosis is intimately bound to the integument by dense fibroareolar tissue forming the superficial palmar fascia, and gives origin by its medial margin to the palmaris brevis. It covers the superficial volar arch, the tendons of the flexor muscles, and the branches of the median and ulnar nerves, and on either side it gives off a septum, which is continuous with the interosseous aponeurosis, and separates the intermediate from the collateral groups of muscles. The lateral and medial portions of the palmar aponeurosis are thin, fibrous layers which cover, on the radial side, the muscles of the ball of the thumb, and on the ulnar side, the muscles of the little finger. They are continuous with the central portion and with the fascia on the dorsum of the hand. The superficial transverse ligament of the fingers is a thin band of transverse fasciculi. It stretches across the roots of the four fingers and is closely attached to the skin of the clefts, and medially to the fifth metacarpal bone, forming a sort of rudimentary web. Beneath it the digital vessels and nerves pass to their destinations. The lateral volar muscles Abductor pollicis brevis Flexor pollicis brevis Opponens pollicis Adductor pollicis obliquus Adductor pollicis transversus The abductor pollicis brevis Abductor pollicis is a thin, flat muscle, placed immediately beneath the integument. It arises from the transverse carpal ligament, the tuberosity of the navicular, and the ridge of the greater multangular, frequently by two distinct slips. Running lateralward and downward, it is inserted by a thin, flat tendon into the radial side of the base of the first phalanx of the thumb and the capsule of the metacarpophalangeal articulation. The opponent's pollicis is a small, triangular muscle, placed beneath the preceding. It arises from the ridge on the greater multangular and from the transverse carpal ligament, passes downward and lateralward, and is inserted into the whole length of the metacarpal bone of the thumb on its radial side. The flexor pollicis brevis consists of two portions, lateral and medial. The lateral and more superficial portion arises from the lower border of the transverse carpal ligament and the lower part of the ridge on the greater multangular bone. It passes along the radial side of the tendon of the flexor pollicis longus and, becoming tendinous, is inserted into the radial side of the base of the first phalanx of the thumb. In its tendon of insertion there is a sesamoid bone. The medial and deeper portion of the muscle is very small and arises from the ulnar side of the first metacarpal bone between the adductor pollicis obliquus and the lateral head of the first interosseus dorsalis and is inserted into the ulnar side of the base of the first phalanx with the adductor pollicis obliquus. 
The medial part of the flex of brevis pollicis is sometimes described as the first interosseus volaris. The adductor pollicus, obliquus, adductor obliquus pollicis, arises by several slips from the capitate bone. The bases of the second and third metacarpals, the intercarpal ligaments, and the sheath of the tendon of the flexor carpi radialis. From this origin the greater number of fibres pass obliquely downward and converge to a tendon, which, uniting with the tendons of the medial portion of the flexor pollicis brevis and the transverse part of the adductor, is inserted into the ulna side of the base of the first phalanx of the thumb, a sesamoid bone being present in the tendon. A considerable fasciculus, however, passes more obliquely beneath the tendon of the flexor pollicis longus to join the lateral portion of the flexor brevis and the abductor pollicis brevis. The adductor pollicis transversus, adductor transversus pollicis, is the most deeply seated of this group of muscles. It is of a triangular form arising by a broad base from the lower two-thirds of the volar surface of the third metacarpal bone. The fibres converge, to be inserted with the medial part of the flexor pollicis brevis and the adductor pollicis obliquus, into the ulnar side of the base of the first phalanx of the thumb. Variations The abductor pollicis brevis is often divided into an outer and an inner part. Accessory slips from the tendon of the abductor pollicis longus or palmaris longus, more rarely from the extensor carpi radialis longus, from the styloid process or opponens pollicis, or from the skin over the thena eminence. The deep head of the flexor pollicis brevis may be absent or enlarged. The two adductors vary in their relative extent and in the closeness of their connection. The adductor obliquus may receive a slip from the transverse metacarpal ligament. Nerves the abductor brevis, opponens, and lateral head of the flexor pollicis brevis are supplied by the sixth and seventh cervical nerves through the median nerve, the medial head of the flexor brevis, and the adductor by the eighth cervical through the ulnar nerve. Actions The abductor pollicis brevis draws the thumb forward in a plane at right angles to that of the palm of the hand. The adductor pollicis is the opponent of this muscle and approximates the thumb to the palm. The opponent's pollicis flexes the metacarpal bone, i.e., draws it medialward over the palm. The flexor pollicis brevis flexes and adducts the proximal phalanx. 2. The medial volar muscles. Palmaris brevis. Abductor digiti quinti. Flexor digiti quinti brevis. Opponent's digiti quinti. The palmaris brevis is a thin quadrilateral muscle placed beneath the integument of the ulnar side of the hand. It arises by tenderness fasciculi from the transverse carpal ligament and palmar aponeurosis. The fleshy fibres are inserted into the skin on the ulnar border of the palm of the hand. The abductor digiti quinti, abductor minimi digiti, is situated on the ulnar border of the palm of the hand. It arises from the pisiform bone, and from the tendon of the flexor carpi ulnaris, and ends in a flat tendon, which divides into two slips. One is inserted into the ulnar side of the base of the first phalanx of the little finger, the other into the ulnar border of the aponeurosis of the extensor digiti quinti proprius. The flexor digiti quinti brevis, flexor brevis minimi digiti, lies on the same plane as the preceding muscle, on its radial side. It arises from the convex surface of the hamulus of the hamate bone, and the volar surface of the transverse carpal ligament, and is inserted into the ulnar side of the base of the first phalanx of the little finger. It is separated from the abductor, at its origin, by the deep branches of the ulnar artery and nerve. This muscle is sometimes wanting. The abductor is then, usually, of large size. The opponens digiti quinti, opponens minimi digiti, is of a triangular form, and placed immediately beneath the preceding muscles. It arises from the convexity of the hamulus of the hamate bone and contiguous portion of the transverse carpal ligament. It is inserted into the whole length of the metacarpal bone of the little finger, along its ulnar margin. Variations The palmaris brevis varies greatly in size. The abductor digiti quinti may be divided into two or three slips, or united with the flex or digiti quinti brevis. Accessory head from the tendon of the flex or carpi ulnaris the transverse carpal ligament, the fascia of the forearm or the tendon of the palmaris longus. A portion of the muscle may insert into the metacarpal or separate slips of the pisimetacarpus, 
pisciansinatus or the pisciannularis muscle may exist. Nerves All the muscles of this group are supplied by the eighth cervical nerve through the ulnar nerve. Actions The abductor and flexor digiti quinti brevis abduct the little finger from the ring finger and assist in flexing the proximal phalanx. The opponent's digiti quinti draws forward the fifth metacarpal bone, so as to deepen the hollow of the palm. The palmaris brevis corrugates the skin on the ulnar side of the palm. 3. The intermediate muscles. Lumbricalis interossi. The lumbricalis are four small fleshy fasciculi associated with the tendons of the flexor digitorum profundus. The first and second arise from the radial sides and volar surfaces of the tendons of the index and middle fingers respectively. The third from the contiguous sides of the tendons of the middle and ring fingers, and the fourth from the contiguous sides of the tendons of the ring and little fingers. Each passes to the radial side of the corresponding finger, and opposite the metacarpophalangeal articulation is inserted into the tendinous expansion of the extensor digitorum communis covering the dorsal aspect of the finger. Variations The lumbricales vary in number from two to five or six, and there is considerable variation in insertions. The interossi are so named from occupying the intervals between the metacarpal bones, and are divided into two sets, a dorsal and a volar. The interossi dorsalis, dorsal interossi, are four in number, and occupy the intervals between the metacarpal bones. They are bipeniform muscles, each arising by two heads from the adjacent sides of the metacarpal bones but more extensively from the metacarpal bone of the finger into which the muscle is inserted. They are inserted into the bases of the first phalanges and into the aponeuroses of the tendons of the extensor digitorum communis. Between the double origin of each of these muscles is a narrow triangular interval. Through the first of these the radial artery passes. Through each of the other three a perforating branch from the deep volar arch is transmitted. The first, or abductor indicus, is larger than the others. It is flat, triangular in form, and arises by two heads, separated by a fibrous arch for the passage of the radial artery from the dorsum to the palm of the hand. The lateral head arises from the proximal half of the ulnar border of the first metacarpal bone. The medial head, from almost the entire length of the radial border of the second metacarpal bone, the tendon is inserted into the radial side of the index finger. The second and third are inserted into the middle finger, the former into its radial, the latter into its ulnar side. The fourth is inserted into the ulnar side of the ring finger. The interossi volaris, palma interossi, three in number, are smaller than the interossi dorsalis and placed upon the volar surfaces of the metacarpal bones rather than between them. Each arises from the entire length of the metacarpal bone of one finger and is inserted into the side of the base of the first phalanx and aponeurotic expansion of the extensor communis tendon to the same finger. The first arises from the ulnar side of the second metacarpal bone, and is inserted into the same side of the first phalanx of the index finger. The second arises from the radial side of the fourth metacarpal bone, and is inserted into the same side of the ring finger. The third arises from the radial side of the fifth metacarpal bone, and is inserted into the same side of the little finger. From this account it may be seen that each finger is provided with two interossi, with the exception of the little finger, in which the abductor takes the place of one of the pair. As already mentioned, the medial head of the flexor pollicis brevis is sometimes described as the interosseus volaris primus. Nerves. The two lateral lumbricales are supplied by the sixth and seventh cervical nerves. Through the third and fourth digital branches of the median nerve, the two medial lumbricales and all the interossi are supplied by the eighth cervical nerve through the deep palmar branch of the ulnar nerve. The third lumbricalis frequently receives a twig from the median. Actions The interossi volaris adduct the fingers to an imaginary line drawn longitudinally through the centre of the middle finger, and the interossi dorsalis abduct the fingers from that line. In addition to this, the interossi, in conjunction with the lumbricales, flex the first phalanges at the metacarpophalangeal joints, and extend the second and third phalanges in consequence of their insertions into the expansions of the extensor tendons. The extensor digitorum communis is believed to act almost entirely on the first phalanges. End of section number 48. 
Section number 49 of Grey's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Morgan Scorpion. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2 by Henry Gray. Muscles and Fasciae of the Iliac Region. The muscles of the lower extremity are subdivided into groups corresponding with the different regions of the limb. 1. Muscles of the iliac region. 2. Muscles of the thigh. 3. Muscles of the leg. 4. Muscles of the foot. The muscles and fasciae of the iliac region. Psoas major, psoas minor, iliacus. The fascia covering the psoas and iliacus is thin above and becomes gradually thicker below as it approaches the inguinal ligament. The portion covering the psoas is thickened above to form the medial lumbar costal arch, which stretches from the transverse process of the first lumbar vertebra to the body of the second. Medially, it is attached by a series of arched processes to the intervertebral fibre cartilages and prominent margins of the bodies of the vertebrae, and to the upper part of the sacrum. The intervals left, opposite the constricted portions of the bodies, transmit the lumbar arteries and veins and filaments of the sympathetic trunk. Laterally, above the crest of the ilium, it is continuous with the fascia covering the front of the quadratus lumborum, while below the crest of the ilium it is continuous with the fascia covering the iliacus. The portions investing the iliacus, fascia iliaca, iliac fascia, is connected, laterally, to the whole length of the inner lip of the iliac crest, and medially to the linear terminalis of the lesser pelvis, where it is continuous with the periosteum. At the iliopectineal eminence it receives the tendon of insertion of the psoas minor when that muscle exists. Lateral to the femoral vessels it is intimately connected to the posterior margin of the inguinal ligament, and is continuous with the transversalis fascia. Immediately lateral to the femoral vessels the iliac fascia is prolonged backward and medialward from the inguinal ligament as a band, the iliopectineal fascia, which is attached to the iliopectineal eminence. This fascia divides the space between the inguinal ligament and the hip bone into two lacunae or compartments, the medial of which transmits the femoral vessels, the lateral the psoas major and iliacus and the femoral nerve. Medial to the vessels the iliac fascia is attached to the pectineal line behind the inguinal aponeurotic falx, where it is again continuous with the transversalis fascia. On the thigh, the fascia of the iliacus and psoas form a single sheet termed the iliopectineal fascia. Where the external iliac vessels pass into the thigh, the fascia descends behind them, forming the posterior wall of the femoral sheath. The portion of the iliopectineal fascia which passes behind the femoral vessels is also attached to the pectineal line beyond the limits of the attachment of the inguinal aponeurotic fox. At this part, it is continuous with the pectineal fascia. The external iliac vessels lie in front of the iliac fascia, but all the branches of the lumbar plexus are behind it. It is separated from the peritoneum by a quantity of loose areolar tissue. The psoas major, psoas magnus, is a long fusiform muscle placed on the side of the lumbar region of the vertebral column and brim of the lesser pelvis. It arises, one, from the anterior surfaces of the bases and lower borders of the transverse processes of all the lumbar vertebra. Two, from the sides of the bodies and the corresponding intervertebral fibre cartilages of the last thoracic and all the lumbar vertebrae by five slips, each of which is attached to the adjacent upper and lower margins of two vertebrae, and to the intervertebral fibre cartilage. 3. From a series of tenderness arches which extend across the constricted parts of the bodies of the lumbar vertebrae between the previous slips, the lumbar arteries and veins, and filaments from the sympathetic trunk pass beneath these tenderness arches. The muscle proceeds downward across the brim of the lesser pelvis, and, diminishing gradually in size, passes beneath the inguinal ligament and in front of the capsule of the hip joint and ends in a tendon. The tendon receives nearly the whole of the fibres of the iliacus and is inserted into the lesser trochanter of the femur. A large bursa which may communicate with the cavity of the hip joint separates the tendon from the pubis and the capsule of the joint. The psoas minor, psoas parvus, is a long slender muscle, placed in front of the psoas major. It arises from the sides of the bodies of the twelfth thoracic and first lumbar vertebra, and from the fibrocartilage between them. 
It ends in a long flat tendon which is inserted into the pectineal line and iliopectineal eminence, and, by its lateral border, into the iliac fascia. This muscle is often absent. The iliacus is a flat, triangular muscle, which fills the iliac fossa. It arises from the upper two-thirds of this fossa, and from the inner lip of the iliac crest, behind, from the anterior sacroiliac and the iliolumbar ligaments, and base of the sacrum. In front, it reaches as far as the anterior superior and anterior inferior iliac spines, and the notch between them. The fibers converge to be inserted into the lateral side of the tendon of the psoas major, some of them being prolonged on the body of the femur for about 2.5 centimeters below and in front of the lesser trochanter. Note 85. The psoas major and iliacus are sometimes regarded as a single muscle named the iliopsoas. End of note 85. Variations. The iliacus minor, or iliocapsularis, a small detached part of the iliacus, is frequently present. It arises from the anterior inferior spine of the ilium, and is inserted into the lower part of the intertrochanteric line of the femur, or into the iliofemoral ligament. Nerves. The psoas major is supplied by branches of the second and third lumbar nerve, the psoas minor by a branch of the first lumbar nerve, and the iliacus by branches of the second and third lumbar nerves through the femoral nerve. Actions. The psoas major, acting from above, flexes the thigh upon the pelvis, being assisted by the iliacus. Acting from below, with the femur fixed, it bends the lumbar portion of the vertebral column forward and to its own side, and then, in conjunction with the iliacus, tilts the pelvis forward. When the muscles of both sides are acting from below, they serve to maintain the erect posture by supporting the vertebral column and pelvis upon the femora or in continued action bend the trunk and pelvis forward, as in raising the trunk from the recumbent posture. The psoas minor is a tensor of the iliac fascia. End of section number 49section fifty of gray's anatomy part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org anatomy of the human body part two by henry gray the muscles and fasci of the thigh part one one the anterior femoral muscles sartorius quadriceps femoris rectus femoris vastus lateralis vastus medialis vastus intermedius articularis genu superficial fascia the superficial fascia forms a continuous layer over the whole of the thigh it consists of areolar tissue containing in its meshes much fat and may be separated into two or more layers between which are found the superficial vessels and nerves. It varies in thickness in different parts of the limb. In the groin it is thick, and the two layers are separated from one another by the superficial inguinal lymph glands, the great saphenous vein, and several smaller vessels. The superficial layer is continuous above with the superficial fascia of the abdomen. The deep layer of the superficial fascia is a very thin, fibrous stratum, best marked on the medial side of the great saphenous vein and below the inguinal ligament. It is placed beneath the subcutaneous vessels and nerves and upon the surface of the fasciolata. It is intimately adherent to the fasciolata a little below the inguinal ligament. It covers the fossa ovalis, saphenous opening being closely united to its circumference and is connected to the sheath of the femoral vessels the portion of fascia covering this fossa is perforated by the great saphenous vein and by numerous blood and lymphatic vessels hence it has been termed the fascia cribrosa the openings for these vessels having been likened to the holes in a sieve a large subcutaneous bursa is found in the superficial fascia over the patella deep fascia the deep fascia of the thigh is named, from its great extent, the fascia lata. It constitutes an investment for the whole of this region of the limb, 
but varies in thickness in different parts thus it is thicker in the upper and lateral part of the thigh where it receives a fibrous expansion from the gluteus maximus and where the tensor fasciolati is inserted between its layers it is very thin behind and at the upper and medial part where it covers the adductor muscles and again becomes stronger around the knee receiving fibrous expansions from the tendon of the biceps femoris laterally from the sartorius medially and from the quadriceps femoris in front the fascia lata is attached above and behind to the back of the sacrum and cossacks laterally to the iliac crest in front to the inguinal ligament and to the superior ramus of the pubis and medially to the inferior ramus of the pubis to the inferior ramus and tuberosity of the ischium and to the lower border of the sacrotuberous ligament from its attachment to the iliac crest it passes down over the gluteus medius to the upper border of the gluteus maximus where it splits into two layers one passing superficial to and the other beneath this muscle at the lower border of the muscle the two layers reunite laterally the fascia lata receives the greater part of the tendon of insertion of the gluteus maximus and becomes proportionately thickened the portion of the fascia lata attached to the front part of the iliac crest and corresponding to the origin of the tensor fasciolati extends down the lateral side of the thigh as two layers one superficial to and the other beneath this muscle at the lower end of the muscle these two layers unite and form a strong band having first received the insertion of the muscle this band is continued downward under the name of the iliotibial band tractus iliotibialis and is attached to the lateral condyle of the tibia the part of the iliotibial band which lies beneath the tensor fasciolati is prolonged upward to join the lateral part of the capsule of the hip joint below the fasciolata is attached to all the prominent points around the knee joint viz the condyles of the femur and tibia and the head of the fibula on either side of the patella it is strengthened by transverse fibers from the lower parts of the vasti which are attached to and support this bone of these the lateral are the stronger and are continuous with the iliotibial band the deep surface of the fascia lata gives off two strong intermuscular septa which are attached to the whole length of the linea aspera and its prolongations above and below the lateral and stronger one which extends from the insertion of the gluteus maximus to the lateral condyle separates the vastus lateralis in front from the short head of the biceps femoris behind and gives partial origin to these muscles the medial and thinner one separates the vastus medialis from the adductores and pectineus besides these there are numerous smaller septa separating the individual muscles and enclosing each in a distinct sheath the fossa ovalis saphenous opening at the upper and medial part of the thigh a little below the medial end of the inguinal ligament is a large oval-shaped aperture in the fascia lata it transmits the great saphenous vein and other smaller vessels and is termed the fossa ovalis the fascia cribrosa which is pierced by the structures passing through the opening closes the aperture and must be removed to expose it the fascia lata in this part of the thigh is described as consisting of a superficial and a deep portion the superficial portion of the fascia lata is the part on the lateral side of the fossa ovalis it is attached laterally to the crest and anterior superior spine of the ilium to the whole length of the inguinal ligament and to the pectineal line in conjunction with the lacunar ligament from the tubercle of the pubis it is reflected downward and lateralward as an arched margin the fossiform margin forming the lateral boundary of the fossa ovalis this margin overlies and is adherent to the anterior layer of the sheath of the femoral vessels to its edge is attached the fascia cribrosa the upward and medial prolongation of the falciform margin is named the superior cornu its downward and medial prolongation the inferior cornu the latter is well defined and is continuous behind the great saphenous vein with the pectineal fascia the deep portion is situated on the medial side of the fossa ovalis and at the lower margin of the fossa is continuous with the superficial portion 
traced upward it covers the pectineus adductor longus and gracilis and passing behind the sheath of the femoral vessels to which it is closely united is continuous with the iliopectineal fascia and is attached to the pectineal line from this description it may be observed that the superficial portion of the fascia lata lies in front of the femoral vessels and the deep portion behind them so that an apparent aperture exists between the two through which the great saphenous passes to join the femoral vein the sartorius the longest muscle in the body is narrow and ribbon-like it arises by tendinous fibres from the anterior superior iliac spine and the upper half of the notch below it it passes obliquely across the upper and anterior part of the thigh from the lateral to the medial side of the limb then descends vertically as far as the medial side of the knee passing behind the medial condyle of the femur to end in a tendon this curves obliquely forward and expands into a broad aponeurosis which is inserted in front of the gracilis and semitendinous into the upper part of the medial surface of the body of the tibia nearly as far forward as the anterior crest the upper part of the aponeurosis is curved backward over the upper edge of the tendon of the gracilis so as to be inserted behind it an offset from its upper margin blends with the capsule of the knee joint and another from its lower border with the fascia on the medial side of the leg variations slips of origin from the outer end of the inguinal ligament the notch of the ilium the iliopectineal line or the pubis occur the muscle may be split into two parts and one part may be inserted into the fascia lata the femur the ligament of the patella or the tendon of the semitendinosus the tendon of insertion may end in the fascia lata the capsule of the knee joint or the fascia of the leg the muscle may be absent the quadriceps femoris quadriceps extensor includes the four remaining muscles on the front of the thigh it is the great extensor muscle of the leg forming a large fleshy mass which covers the front and sides of the femur it is subdivided into separate portions which have received distinctive names one occupying the middle of the thigh and connected above with the ilium is called from its straight course the rectus femoris the other three lie in immediate connection with the body of the femur which they cover from the trochanters to the condyles the portion on the lateral side of the femur is termed the vastus lateralis that covering the medial side the vastus medialis and that in front the vastus intermedius the rectus femoris is situated in the middle of the front of the thigh it is fusiform in shape and its superficial fibres are arranged in a bipeniform manner the deep fibres running straight down to the deep aponeurosis it arises by two tendons one the anterior or straight from the anterior inferior iliac spine the other the posterior or reflected from a groove above the brim of the acetabulum the two unite at an acute angle and spread into an aponeurosis which is prolonged downward on the anterior surface of the muscle and from this the muscular fibres arise the muscle ends in a broad and thick aponeurosis which occupies the lower two-thirds of its posterior surface and gradually becoming narrowed into a flattened tendon is inserted into the base of the patella the vastus lateralis vastus externus is the largest part of the quadriceps femoris it arises by a broad aponeurosis which is attached to the upper part of the intertrochanteric line to the anterior and inferior borders of the greater trochanter to the lateral lip of the gluteal tuberosity and to the upper half of the lateral lip of the linea aspera this aponeurosis covers the upper three-fourths of the muscle and from its deep surface many fibres take origin a few additional fibres arise from the tendon of the gluteus maximus and from the lateral intramuscular septum between the vastus lateralis and short head of the biceps femoris 
the fibers form a large fleshy mass which is attached to a strong aponeurosis placed on the deep surface of the lower part of the muscle this aponeurosis becomes contracted and thickened into a flat tendon inserted into the lateral border of the patella blending with the quadriceps femoris tendon and giving an expansion to the capsule of the knee joint the vastus medialis and vastus intermedius appear to be inseparably united but when the rectus femoris has been reflected a narrow interval will be observed extending upward from the medial border of the patella between the two muscles and the separation may be continued as far as the lower part of the intertrochanteric line where however the two muscles are frequently continuous the vastus medialis vastus internus arises from the lower half of the intertrochanteric line the medial lip of the linea aspera the upper part of the medial supracondylar line the tendons of the adductor longus and the adductor magnus and the medial intermuscular septum its fibers are directed downward and forward and are chiefly attached to an aponeurosis which lies on the deep surface of the muscle and is inserted into the medial border of the patella and the quadriceps femoris tendon an expansion being sent to the capsule of the knee joint the vastus intermedius crorius arises from the front and lateral surfaces of the body of the femur in its upper two-thirds and from the lower part of the lateral intermuscular septum its fibers end in a superficial aponeurosis which forms the deep part of the quadriceps femoris tendon the tendons of the different portions of the quadriceps unite at the lower part of the thigh so as to form a single strong tendon which is inserted into the base of the patella some few fibers passing over it to blend with the ligamentum patelli more properly the patella may be regarded as a sesamoid bone developed in the tendon of the quadriceps and the ligamentum patelli which is continued from the apex of the patella to the tuberosity of the tibia as the proper tendon of insertion of the muscle the medial and lateral patellar retinacula being expansions from its borders a bursa which usually communicates with the cavity of the knee joint is situated between the femur and the portion of the quadriceps tendon above the patella another is interposed between the tendon and the upper part of the front of the tibia and a third the prepatellar bursa is placed over the patella itself the articularis genu subcroreus is a small muscle usually distinct from the vastus intermedius but occasionally blended with it it arises from the anterior surface of the lower part of the body of the femur and is inserted into the upper part of the synovial membrane of the knee joint it sometimes consists of several separate muscular bundles nerves the muscles of this region are supplied by the second third and fourth lumbar nerves through the femoral nerve actions the sartorius flexes the leg upon the thigh and continuing to act flexes the thigh upon the pelvis it next abducts and rotates the thigh outward when the knee is bent the sartorius assists the semitendinosus semimembranosus and popliteus in rotating the tibia inward taking its fixed point from the leg it flexes the pelvis upon the thigh and if one muscle acts assists in rotating the pelvis the quadriceps femoris extends the leg upon the thigh the rectus femoris assists the psoas major and iliacus in supporting the pelvis and trunk upon the femur it also assists in flexing the thigh on the pelvis or if the thigh be fixed it will flex the pelvis the vastus medialis draws the patella medial ward as well as upward two the medial femoral muscles gracilis pectineus adductor longus adductor brevis adductor magnus the gracilis is the most superficial muscle on the medial side of the thigh it is thin and flattened broad above narrow and tapering below it arises by a thin aponeurosis from the anterior margins of the lower half of the symphysis pubis and the upper half of the pubic arch 
the fibers run vertically downward and end in a rounded tendon which passes behind the medial condyle of the femur curves around the medial condyle of the tibia where it becomes flattened and is inserted into the upper part of the medial surface of the body of the tibia below the condyle a few of the fibers of the lower part of the tendon are prolonged into the deep fascia of the leg at its insertion the tendon is situated immediately above that of the semitendinosus and its upper edge is overlapped by the tendon of the sartorius with which it is in part blended it is separated from the tibial collateral ligament of the knee joint by a bursa common to it and the tendon of the semitendinosus the pectineus is a flat quadrangular muscle situated at the anterior part of the upper and medial aspect of the thigh it arises from the pectineal line and to a slight extent from the surface of bone in front of it between the iliopectineal eminence and tubercle of the pubis and from the fascia covering the anterior surface of the muscle the fibers pass downward backward and lateralward to be inserted into a rough line leading from the lesser trochanter to the linea aspera the adductor longus the most superficial of the three adductories is a triangular muscle lying in the same plane as the pectineus it arises by a flat narrow tendon from the front of the pubis at the angle of junction of the crest with the symphysis and soon expands into a broad fleshy belly this passes downward backward and lateralward and is inserted by an aponeurosis into the linea aspera between the vastus medialis and the adductor magnus with both of which it is usually blended the adductor brevis is situated immediately behind the two preceding muscles it is somewhat triangular in form and arises by a narrow origin from the outer surfaces of the superior and inferior rami of the pubis between the gracilis and obturator externus its fibers passing backward lateralward and downward are inserted by an aponeurosis into the line leading from the lesser trochanter to the linea aspera and into the upper part of the linea aspera immediately behind the pectineus and upper part of the adductor longus the adductor magnus is a large triangular muscle situated on the medial side of the thigh it arises from a small part of the inferior ramus of the pubis from the inferior ramus of the ischium and from the outer margin of the inferior part of the tuberosity of the ischium those fibers which arise from the ramus of the pubis are short horizontal in direction and are inserted into the rough line leading from the greater trochanter to the linea aspera medial to the gluteus maximus those from the ramus of the ischium are directed downward and lateralward with different degrees of obliquity to be inserted by means of a broad aponeurosis into the linea aspera and the upper part of its medial prolongation below the medial portion of the muscle composed principally of the fibers arising from the tuberosity of the ischium forms a thick fleshy mass consisting of coarse bundles which descend almost vertically and end about the lower third of the thigh in a rounded tendon which is inserted into the adductor tubercle on the medial condyle of the femur and is connected by a fibrous expansion to the line leading upward from the tubercle to the linea aspera at the insertion of the muscle there is a series of osseoaponeurotic openings formed by tendinous arches attached to the bone the upper four openings are small and give passage to the perforating branches of the profunda femoris artery the lowest is of large size and transmits the femoral vessels to the popliteal fossa variations the pectineus is sometimes divided into an outer part supplied by the femoral nerve and an inner part supplied by the obturator nerve the muscle may be attached to or inserted into the capsule of the hip joint the adductor longus may be double may extend to the knee or be more or less united with the pectineus the adductor brevis may be divided into two or three parts or it may be united to the adductor magnus the adductor magnus may be more or less segmented the anterior and superior portion is often described as a separate muscle the adductor minimus the muscle may be fused with the quadratus femoris 
nerves the three adductories and the gracilis are supplied by the third and fourth lumbar nerves through the obturator nerve the adductor magnus receiving an additional branch from the sacral plexus through the sciatic the pectineus is supplied by the second third and fourth lumbar nerves through the femoral nerve and by the third lumbar through the accessory obturator when this latter exists occasionally it receives a branch from the obturator nerve note eighty six the pectineus may consist of two incompletely separated strata the lateral or dorsal stratum which is constant is supplied by a branch from the femoral nerve or in the absence of this branch by the accessory obturator nerve the medial or ventral stratum when present is supplied by the obturator nerve a m patterson journal of anatomy and physiology twenty six forty three actions the pectineus and three adductories adduct the thigh powerfully they are especially used in horse exercise the size of the saddle being grasped between the knees by the contraction of these muscles in consequence of the obliquity of their insertions into the linea aspera they rotate the thigh outward assisting the external rotators and when the limb has been abducted they draw it medialward carrying the thigh across that of the opposite side the pectineus and adductoris brevis and longus assist the psoas major and iliacus in flexing the thigh upon the pelvis in progression all these muscles assist in drawing forward the lower limb the gracilis assists the sartorius in flexing the leg and rotating it inward it is also an adductor of the thigh if the lower extremities be fixed these muscles taking their fixed points below may act upon the pelvis serving to maintain the body in an erect posture or if their action be continued flex the pelvis forward upon the femur end of section fifty recording by selena arter section fifty one of gray's anatomy part two this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. The Muscles and Fasci of the Thigh, Part 2. 3. The Muscles of the Gluteal Region. Gluteus Maximus. Gluteus Medius. Gluteus Minimus. Tensor Fasci Lati. Piriformis. Obturator Internus. Gemellus Superior. Gemellus Inferior quadratus femoris obturator externus the gluteus maximus the most superficial muscle in the gluteal region is a broad and thick fleshy mass of a quadrilateral shape and forms the prominence of the nates its large size is one of the most characteristic features of the muscular system in man connected as it is with the power he has of maintaining the trunk in the erect posture the muscle is remarkably coarse in structure being made up of fasciculi lying parallel with one another and collected together into large bundles separated by fibrous septa. It arises from the posterior gluteal line of the ilium and the rough portion of bone including the crest immediately above and behind it. From the posterior surface of the lower part of the sacrum and the side of the cossacks. From the aponeurosis of the sacrospinalis, the sacrotuberous ligament, and the fascia gluteal aponeurosis covering the gluteus medius the fibers are directed obliquely downward and lateralward those forming the upper and larger portion of the muscle together with the superficial fibers of the lower portion end in a thick tendinous lamina which passes across the greater trochanter and is inserted into the iliotibial band of the fascia lata. the deeper fibers of the lower portion of the muscle are inserted into the gluteal tuberosity between the vastus lateralis and adductor magnus bursi three bursi are usually found in relation with the deep surface of this muscle one of these of large size and generally multilocular separates it from the greater trochanter a second often wanting is situated on the tuberosity of the ischium a third is found between the tendon of the muscle and that of the vastus lateralis the gluteus medius is a broad thick radiating muscle situated on the outer surface of the pelvis its posterior third is covered by the gluteus maximus 
its anterior two-thirds by the gluteal aponeurosis, which separates it from the superficial fascia and integument. It arises from the outer surface of the ilium between the iliac crest and posterior gluteal line above, and the anterior gluteal line below. It also arises from the gluteal aponeurosis covering its outer surface. The fibers converge to a strong flattened tendon, which is inserted into the oblique ridge which runs downward and forward on the lateral surface of the greater trochanter. A bursa separates the tendon of the muscle from the surface of the trochanter over which it glides variations the posterior border may be more or less closely united to the piriformis or some of the fibers end on its tendon the gluteus minimus the smallest of the three glutei is placed immediately beneath the preceding it is fan-shaped arising from the outer surface of the ilium between the anterior and inferior gluteal lines and behind from the margin of the greater sciatic notch the fibers converge to the deep surface of a radiated aponeurosis, and this ends in a tendon which is inserted into an impression on the anterior border of the greater trochanter, and gives an expansion to the capsule of the hip joint. A bursa is interposed between the tendon and the greater trochanter. Between the gluteus medius and gluteus minimus are the deep branches of the superior gluteal vessels and the superior gluteal nerve. The deep surface of the gluteus minimus is in relation with the reflected tendon of the rectus femoris and the capsule of the hip joint. Variations The muscle may be divided into an anterior and a posterior part, or it may send slips to the piriformis, the gemellus superior, or the outer part of the origin of the vastus lateralis. The tensor fasci lati, tensor fasci femoris, arises from the anterior part of the outer lip of the iliac crest, from the outer surface of the anterior superior iliac spine, and part of the outer border of the notch below it, between the gluteus medius and sartorius, and from the deep surface of the fascia lata. It is inserted between the two layers of the iliotibial band of the fascia lata about the junction of the middle and upper thirds of the thigh. The piriformis is a flat muscle, pyramidal in shape, lying almost parallel with the posterior margin of the gluteus medius. It is situated partly within the pelvis against its posterior wall, and partly at the back of the hip joint. It arises from the front of the sacrum by three fleshy digitations, attached to the portions of bone between the first, second, third and fourth anterior sacral foramina, and to the grooves leading from the foramina. A few fibers also arise from the margin of the greater sciatic foramen and from the anterior surface of the sacrotuberous ligament. The muscle passes out of the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen, the upper part of which it fills, and is inserted by a rounded tendon into the upper border of the greater trochanter behind, but often partly blended with the common tendon of the obturator internus and gemelli. Variations it is frequently pierced by the common peroneal nerve, and thus divided more or less into two parts. It may be united with the gluteus medius, or send fibers to the gluteus minimus, or receive fibers from the gemellus superior. It may have only one or two sacral attachments, or be inserted into the capsule of the hip joint. It may be absent. Obturator Membrane The obturator membrane is a thin fibrous sheet which almost completely closes the obturator foramen. Its fibers are arranged in interlacing bundles mainly transverse in direction. The uppermost bundle is attached to the obturator tubercles and completes the obturator canal for the passage of the obturator vessels and nerve. The membrane is attached to the sharp margin of the obturator foramen except at its lower lateral angle, where it is fixed to the pelvic surface of the inferior ramus of the ischium, i.e., within the margin. Both obturator muscles are connected with this membrane. The obturator internus is situated partly within the lesser pelvis and partly at the back of the hip joint. It arises from the inner surface of the anterolateral wall of the pelvis, where it surrounds the greater part of the obturator foramen, 
being attached to the inferior rami of the pubis and ischium, and at the side to the inner surface of the hip bone, below and behind the pelvic brim, reaching from the upper part of the greater sciatic foramen above and behind to the obturator foramen below and in front. It also arises from the pelvic surface of the obturator membrane except in the posterior part from the tendinous arch which completes the canal for the passage of the obturator vessels and nerve, and to a slight extent from the obturator fascia, which covers the muscle. The fibers converge rapidly toward the lesser sciatic foramen, and end in four or five tendinous bands, which are found on the deep surface of the muscle. These bands are reflected at a right angle over the grooved surface of the ischium between its spine and tuberosity. This bony surface is covered by smooth cartilage, which is separated from the tendon by a bursa, and presents one or more ridges corresponding with the furrows between the tendinous bands. These bands leave the pelvis through the lesser sciatic foramen and unite into a single flattened tendon, which passes horizontally across the capsule of the hip joint, and after receiving the attachments of the gemelli, is inserted into the forepart of the medial surface of the greater trochanter above the trochanteric fossa. A bursa, narrow and elongated in form, is usually found between the tendon and the capsule of the hip joint. It occasionally communicates with the bursa between the tendon and the ischium. The gemelli are two small muscular fasciculi, accessories to the tendon of the obturator internus, which is received into a groove between them. The gemellus superior, the smaller of the two, arises from the outer surface of the spine of the ischium, blends with the upper part of the tendon of the obturator internus, and is inserted with it into the medial surface of the greater trochanter. It is sometimes wanting. The gemellus inferior arises from the upper part of the tuberosity of the ischium, immediately below the groove for the obturator internus tendon. It blends with the lower part of the tendon of the obturator internus and is inserted with it into the medial surface of the greater trochanter, rarely absent. The quadratus femoris is a flat quadrilateral muscle between the gemellus inferior and the upper margin of the adductor magnus. It is separated from the latter by the terminal branches of the medial femoral circumflex vessels. It arises from the upper part of the external border of the tuberosity of the ischium and is inserted into the upper part of the linea quadrata, that is, the line which extends vertically downward from the intertrochanteric crest. A bursa is often found between the front of this muscle and the lesser trochanter, sometimes absent. The obturator externus is a flat, triangular muscle which covers the outer surface of the anterior wall of the pelvis. It arises from the margin of bone immediately around the medial side of the obturator foramen, viz., from the rami of the pubis and the inferior ramus of the ischium. It also arises from the medial two-thirds of the outer surface of the obturator membrane and from the tendinous arch which completes the canal for the passage of the obturator vessels and nerves. The fibers springing from the pubic arch extend on to the inner surface of the bone, where they obtain a narrow origin between the margin of the foramen and the attachment of the obturator membrane. The fibers converge and pass backward, lateralward, and upward, and end in a tendon which runs across the back of the neck of the femur and lower part of the capsule of the hip joint and is inserted into the trochanteric fossa of the femur. The obturator vessels lie between the muscle and the obturator membrane. The anterior branch of the obturator nerve reaches the thigh by passing in front of the muscle and the posterior branch by piercing it. Nerves The gluteus maximus is supplied by the fifth lumbar and first and second sacra nerves through the inferior gluteal nerve, the glutei medius and minimus and the tensor fasci lati by the fourth and fifth lumbar and first sacral nerves through the superior gluteal. The piriformis is supplied by the first and second sacral nerves, the gemellus inferior and quadrilateral quadratus femoris by the last lumbar and first sacral nerves, the gemellus superior and obturator internus by the first, second, and third sacral nerves, and the obturator externus by the third and fourth lumbar nerves through the obturator. Actions when the gluteus maximus takes its fixed point from the pelvis, it extends the femur and brings the bent thigh into a line with the body. 
taking its fixed point from below it acts upon the pelvis supporting it and the trunk upon the head of the femur this is especially obvious in standing on one leg its most powerful action is to cause the body to regain the erect position after stooping by drawing the pelvis backward being assisted in this action by the biceps femoris semitendinosus and semimembranosus the gluteus maximus is a tensor of the fascia lata and by its connection with the iliotibial band steadies the femur on the articular surfaces of the tibia during standing when the extensor muscles are relaxed the lower part of the muscle also acts as an adductor and external rotator of the limb the glutei medius and minimus abduct the thigh when the limb is extended and are principally called into action in supporting the body on one limb in conjunction with the tensor fasci lati their anterior fibers by drawing the greater trochanter forward rotate the thigh inward in which action they are also assisted by the tensor fasci lati the tensor fasci lati is a tensor of the fascia lata continuing its action the oblique direction of its fibers enables it to abduct the thigh and to rotate it inward in the erect posture acting from below it will serve to steady the pelvis upon the head of the femur and by means of the iliotibial band it steadies the condyles of the femur on the articular surfaces of the tibia and assists the gluteus maximus in supporting the knee in the extended position the remaining muscles are powerful external rotators of the thigh in the sitting posture when the thigh is flexed upon the pelvis their action as rotators ceases and they become abductors with the exception of the obturator externus which still rotates the femur outward four the posterior femoral muscles hamstring muscles biceps femoris semitendinosus semimembranosus the biceps femoris biceps is situated on the posterior and lateral aspect of the thigh it has two heads of origin one the long head arises from the lower and inner impression on the back part of the tuberosity of the ischium by a tendon common to it and the semitendinosus and from the lower part of the sacrotuberous ligament the other the short head arises from the lateral lip of the linea aspera between the adductor magnus and vastus lateralis extending up almost as high as the insertion of the gluteus maximus from the lateral prolongation of the linea aspera to within five centimeters of the lateral condyle and from the lateral intermuscular septum the fibers of the long head form a fusiform belly which passes obliquely downward and lateralward across the sciatic nerve to end in an aponeurosis which covers the posterior surface of the muscle and receives the fibers of the short head this aponeurosis becomes gradually contracted into a tendon which is inserted into the lateral side of the head of the fibula and by a small slip into the lateral condyle of the tibia at its insertion the tendon divides into two portions which embrace the fibular collateral ligament of the knee joint from the posterior border of the tendon a thin expansion is given off to the fascia of the leg the tendon of insertion of this muscle forms the lateral hamstring the common personeal nerve descends along its medial border variations the short head may be absent additional heads may arise from the ischial tuberosity the linea aspera the medial supracondylar ridge of the femur or from various other parts a slip may pass to the gastrocnemius the semitendinosus remarkable for the great length of its tendon of insertion is situated at the posterior and medial aspect of the thigh it arises from the lower and medial impression on the tuberosity of the ischium by a tendon common to it and the long head of the biceps femoris it also arises from an aponeurosis which connects the adjacent surfaces of the two muscles to the extent of about seven and a half centimeters from their origin the muscle is fusiform and ends a little below the middle of the thigh in a long round tendon which lies along the medial side of the popliteal fossa it then curves around the medial condyle of the tibia and passes over the tibial collateral ligament of the knee joint from which it is separated by a bursa 
and is inserted into the upper part of the medial surface of the body of the tibia, nearly as far forward as its anterior crest. At its insertion, it gives off from its lower border a prolongation to the deep fascia of the leg and lies behind the tendon of the sartorius and below that of the gracilis to which it is united. A tendinous intersection is usually observed about the middle of the muscle. The semimembranosus, so called from its membranous tendon of origin, is situated at the back and medial side of the thigh. It arises by a thick tendon from the upper and outer impression on the tuberosity of the ischium, above and lateral to the biceps femoris and semitendinosus. The tendon of origin expands into an aponeurosis, which covers the upper part of the anterior surface of the muscle. From this aponeurosis, muscular fibers arise and converge to another aponeurosis, which covers the lower part of the posterior surface of the muscle and contracts into the tendon of insertion. It is inserted mainly into the horizontal groove on the posterior medial aspect of the medial condyle of the tibia. The tendon of insertion gives off certain fibrous expansions. One, of considerable size, passes upward and lateralward to be inserted into the back part of the lateral condyle of the femur, forming part of the oblique popliteal ligament of the knee joint. A second is continued downward to the fascia which covers the popliteus muscle, while a few fibers join the tibial collateral ligament of the the joint and the fascia of the leg. The muscle overlaps the upper part of the popliteal vessels. Variations. It may be reduced or absent or double, arising mainly from the sacrotuberous ligament and giving a slip to the femur or adductor magnus. The tendons of insertion of the two preceding muscles form the medial hamstrings. Nerves. The muscles of this region are supplied by the fourth and fifth lumbar and the first, second, and third sacral nerves. The nerve to the short head of the biceps femoris is derived from the common perineal. The other muscles are supplied through the tibial nerve. Actions. The hamstring muscles flex the leg upon the thigh. When the knee is semi-flexed, the biceps femoris, in consequence of its oblique direction, rotates the leg slightly outward and the semitendinosus, and to a slight extent the semimembranosus, rotate the leg inward, assisting the popliteus. Taking their fixed point from below, these muscles serve to support the pelvis upon the head of the femur, and to draw the trunk directly backward, as in raising it from the stooping position, or in feats of strength, when the body is thrown backward in the form of an arch. As already indicated, Complete flexion of the hip cannot be effected unless the knee joint is also flexed, on account of the shortness of the hamstring muscles. End of section 51. Recording by Selena Arter. Section 52 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Laurie Ann Walden. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. The Muscles and Fascia of the Leg, Part 1. The muscles of the leg may be divided into three groups, anterior, posterior, and lateral. 1. The anterior crural muscles. Tibialis anterior, extensor digitorum longus, Extensor hallucis longus, perineus tertius. Deep fascia, fascia cruris. The deep fascia of the leg forms a complete investment to the muscles and is fused with the periosteum over the subcutaneous surfaces of the bones. It is continuous above with the fascia lata and is attached around the knee to the patella, the ligamentum patellae, the tuberosity and condyles of the tibia, and the head of the fibula. Behind it forms the popliteal fascia, covering in the popliteal fossa. Here it is strengthened by transverse fibers, and perforated by the small saphenous vein. It receives an expansion from the tendon of the biceps femoris laterally, and from the tendons of the sartorius, gracilis, semitendinosus, and semimembranosus medially. In front it blends with the periosteum covering the subcutaneous surface of the tibia and with that covering the head and malleolus of the fibula. Below it is continuous with the transverse crural and laciniate ligaments. 
It is thick and dense in the upper and anterior part of the leg, and gives attachment, by its deep surface, to the tibialis anterior and extensor digitorum longus, but thinner behind, where it covers the gastrocnemius and soleus. It gives off, from its deep surface, on the lateral side of the leg, two strong intermuscular septa, the anterior and posterior perineal septa, which enclose the perinei longus and brevis, and separate them from the muscles of the anterior and posterior cruel regions, and several more slender processes, which enclose the individual muscles in each region. A broad transverse intermuscular septum, called the deep transverse fascia of the leg, intervenes between the superficial and deep posterior crural muscles. The tibialis anterior, tibialis anticus, is situated on the lateral side of the tibia. It is thick and fleshy above, tendinous below. It arises from the lateral condyle and upper half, or two-thirds of the lateral surface, of the body of the tibia from the adjoining part of the interosseous membrane, from the deep surface of the fascia, and from the intermuscular septum between it and the extensor digitorum longus. The fibers run vertically downward and end in a tendon, which is apparent on the anterior surface of the muscle at the lower third of the leg. After passing through the most medial compartments of the transverse and cruciate crural ligaments, it is inserted into the medial and under surface of the first cuneiform bone and the base of the first metatarsal bone this muscle overlaps the anterior tibial vessels and deep perineal nerve in the upper part of the leg variations a deep portion of the muscle is rarely inserted into the talus or a tendinous slip may pass to the head of the first metatarsal bone or the base of the first phalanx of the great toe the tibiofascialis anterior, a small muscle from the lower part of the tibia to the transverse or cruciate crural ligaments or deep fascia. The extensor hallucis longus, extensor proprius hallucis, is a thin muscle situated between the tibialis anterior and the extensor digitorum longus. It arises from the anterior surface of the fibula for about the middle two-fourths of its extent medial to the origin of the extensor digitorum longus. It also arises from the interosseous membrane to a similar extent. The anterior tibial vessels and deep perineal nerve lie between it and the tibialis anterior. The fibers pass downward and end in a tendon, which occupies the anterior border of the muscle, passes through a distinct compartment in the cruciate crural ligament, crosses from the lateral to the medial side of the anterior tibial vessels near the bend of the ankle, and is inserted into the base of the distal phalanx of the great toe. Opposite the metatarsophalangeal articulation, the tendon gives off a thin prolongation on either side to cover the surface of the joint. An expansion from the medial side of the tendon is usually inserted into the base of the proximal phalanx. Variations occasionally united at its origin with the extensor digitorum longus, extensor ossus metatarsi hallucis, a small muscle, sometimes found as a slip from the extensor hallucis longus, or from the tibialis anterior, or from the extensor digitorum longus, or as a distinct muscle, it traverses the same compartment of the transverse ligament with the extensor hallucis longus. The extensor digitorum longus is a pinniform muscle, situated at the lateral part of the front of the leg. It arises from the lateral condyle of the tibia, from the upper three-fourths of the anterior surface of the body of the fibula, from the upper part of the interosseous membrane, from the deep surface of the fascia, and from the intermuscular septa between it and the tibialis anterior on the medial, and the perinei on the lateral side. Between it and the tibialis anterior are the upper portions of the anterior tibial vessels and deep perineal nerve. The tendon passes under the transverse and cruciate crural ligaments, in company with the perineus tertius, and divides into four slips, which run forward on the dorsum of the foot, and are inserted into the second and third phalanges of the four lesser toes. 
The tendons to the second, third, and fourth toes are each joined opposite the metatarsophalangeal articulation, on the lateral side by a tendon of the extensor digitorum brevis. The tendons are inserted in the following manner. Each receives a fibrous expansion from the interossei and lumbricalis, and then spreads out into a broad aponeurosis, which covers the dorsal surface of the first phalanx. This aponeurosis, at the articulation of the first with the second phalanx, divides into three slips, an intermediate, which is inserted into the base of the second phalanx, and two collateral slips, which, after uniting on the dorsal surface of the second phalanx, are continued onward, to be inserted into the base of the third phalanx. Variations. This muscle varies considerably in the modes of origin and the arrangement of its various tendons. The tendons to the second and fifth toes may be found doubled, or extra slips are given off from one or more tendons to their corresponding metatarsal bones, or to the short extensor, or to one of the interosseous muscles. A slip to the great toe from the innermost tendon has been found. The perineus tertius is a part of the extensor digitorum longus, and might be described as its fifth tendon. The fibers belonging to this tendon arise from the lower third or more of the anterior surface of the fibula, from the lower part of the interosseous membrane, and from an intermuscular septum between it and the perineus brevis. The tendon, after passing under the transverse and cruciate crural ligaments, in the same canal as the extensor digitorum longus, is inserted into the dorsal surface of the base of the metatarsal bone of the little toe. This muscle is sometimes wanting. Nerves. These muscles are supplied by the fourth and fifth lumbar and first sacral nerves through the deep perineal nerve. Actions. The tibialis anterior and perineus tertius are the direct flexors of the foot at the ankle joint. The former muscle, when acting in conjunction with the tibialis posterior, raises the medial border of the foot, i.e., inverts the foot, and the latter, acting with the perinei brevis and longus, raises the lateral border of the foot, i.e., everts the foot. The extensor digitorum longus and extensor hallucis longus extend the phalanges of the toes, and, continuing their action, flex the foot upon the leg. Taking their fixed points from below, in the erect posture, all these muscles serve to fix the bones of the leg in the perpendicular position, and give increased strength to the ankle joint. 2. The posterior crural muscles. The muscles of the back of the leg are subdivided into two groups, superficial and deep. Those of the superficial group constitute a powerful muscular mass, forming the calf of the leg. Their large size is one of the most characteristic features of the muscular apparatus in man, and bears a direct relation to his erect attitude and his mode of progression. The superficial group. Gastrocnemius, soleus, plantaris. The gastrocnemius is the most superficial muscle, and forms the greater part of the calf. It arises by two heads, which are connected to the condyles of the femur by strong, flat tendons. The medial and larger head takes its origin from a depression at the upper and back part of the medial condyle, and from the adjacent part of the femur. The lateral head arises from an impression on the side of the lateral condyle, and from the posterior surface of the femur, immediately above the lateral part of the condyle. Both heads, also, arise from the subjacent part of the capsule of the knee. Each tendon spreads out into an aponeurosis, which covers the posterior surface of that portion of the muscle to which it belongs. From the anterior surfaces of these tendinous expansions, muscular fibers are given off, those of the medial head being thicker and extending lower than those of the lateral. The fibers unite at an angle in the middle line of the muscle in a tendinous rothe, which expands into a broad aponeurosis on the anterior surface of the muscle, and into this the remaining fibers are inserted. The aponeurosis, gradually contracting, unites with the tendon of the soleus, and forms with it the tendo calcaneus. 
Variations Absence of the outer head or of the entire muscle. Extra slips from the popliteal surface of the femur. The soleus is a broad, flat muscle situated immediately in front of the gastrocnemius. It arises by tendinous fibers from the back of the head of the fibula and from the upper third of the posterior surface of the body of the bone, from the popliteal line and the middle third of the medial border of the tibia. Some fibers also arise from a tendinous arch placed between the tibial and fibular origins of the muscle, in front of which the popliteal vessels and tibial nerve run. The fibers end in an aponeurosis which covers the posterior surface of the muscle, and, gradually becoming thicker and narrower, joins with the tendon of the gastrocnemius, and forms with it the tendocalcaneus. Variations Accessory head to its lower and inner part, usually ending in the tendocalcaneus, or the calcaneus, or the liciniate ligament. The gastrocnemius and soleus together form a muscular mass which is occasionally described as the triceps surae. Its tendon of insertion is the tendocalcaneus. Tendocalcaneus, tendo Achilles. The tendocalcaneus, the common tendon of the gastrocnemius and soleus, is the thickest and strongest in the body. It is about 15 centimeters long and begins near the middle of the leg, but receives fleshy fibers on its anterior surface almost to its lower end. Gradually becoming contracted below, it is inserted into the middle part of the posterior surface of the calcaneus, a bursa being interposed between the tendon and the upper part of this surface. The tendon spreads out somewhat at its lower end, so that its narrowest part is about four centimeters above its insertion. It is covered by the fascia and the integument, and is separated from the deep muscles and vessels by a considerable interval filled up with areolar and adipose tissue. Along its lateral side, but superficial to it, is the small saphenous vein. The plantaris is placed between the gastrocnemius and soleus. It arises from the lower part of the lateral prolongation of the linea aspera and from the oblique popliteal ligament of the knee joint. It forms a small fusiform belly, from seven to ten centimeters long, ending in a long, slender tendon which crosses obliquely between the two muscles of the calf, and runs along the medial border of the tendocalcaneus, to be inserted with it into the posterior part of the calcaneus. This muscle is sometimes double, and at other times wanting. Occasionally its tendon is lost in the liciniate ligament, or in the fascia of the leg. Nerves. The gastrocnemius and soleus are supplied by the first and second sacral nerves, and the plantaris by the fourth and fifth lumbar and first sacral nerves, through the tibial nerve. Actions. The muscles of the calf are the chief extensors of the foot at the ankle joint. They possess considerable power, and are constantly called into use in standing, walking, dancing, and leaping, hence the large size they usually present. In walking, these muscles raise the heel from the ground. The body being thus supported on the raised foot, the opposite limb can be carried forward. In standing, the soleus, taking its fixed point from below, steadies the leg upon the foot and prevents the body from falling forward. The gastrocnemius, acting from below, serves to flex the femur upon the tibia, assisted by the popliteus. The plantaris is the rudiment of a large muscle which, in some of the lower animals, is continued over the calcaneus to be inserted into the plantar aponeurosis. In man it is an accessory to the gastrocnemius, extending the ankle if the foot be free, or bending the knee if the foot be fixed. End of section 52《セクション53 of Gray's Anatomy Part 2。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Laurie Ann Walden。Anatomy of the Human Body Part 2 by Henry Gray。The Muscles and Fascia of the Leg Part 2 。The Deep Group。Popliteus, flexor digitorum longus, flexor hallucis longus, 
Tibialis posterior. Deep transverse fascia. The deep transverse fascia of the leg is a transversely placed intermuscular septum between the superficial and deep muscles of the back of the leg. At the sides it is connected to the margins of the tibia and fibula. Above, where it covers the popliteus, it is thick and dense, and receives an expansion from the tendon of the semimembranosus. It is thinner in the middle of the leg. But below, where it covers the tendons passing behind the malleoli, it is thickened and continuous with the liciniate ligament. The popliteus is a thin, flat, triangular muscle, which forms the lower part of the floor of the popliteal fossa. It arises by a strong tendon about 2.5 centimeters long, from a depression at the anterior part of the groove on the lateral condyle of the femur, and, to a small extent, from the oblique popliteal ligament of the knee joint, and is inserted into the medial two-thirds of the triangular surface above the popliteal line on the posterior surface of the body of the tibia and into the tendinous expansion covering the surface of the muscle. Variations Additional head from the sesamoid bone and the outer head of the gastrocnemius. Popliteus minor, rare, origin from femur on the inner side of the plantaris, insertion into the posterior ligament of the knee joint. Peroneotibialis, 14%, origin, inner side of the head of the fibula, Insertion into the upper end of the oblique line of the tibia. It lies beneath the popliteus. The flexor hallucis longus is situated on the fibular side of the leg. It arises from the inferior two-thirds of the posterior surface of the body of the fibula, with the exception of 2.5 centimeters at its lowest part. From the lower part of the interosseous membrane, from an intermuscular septum between it and the perineae laterally, and from the fascia covering the tibialis posterior medially. The fibers pass obliquely downward and backward, and end in a tendon which occupies nearly the whole length of the posterior surface of the muscle. This tendon lies in a groove which crosses the posterior surface of the lower end of the tibia, the posterior surface of the talus, and the under surface of the sustentaculum talli of the calcaneus. In the sole of the foot it runs forward between the two heads of the flexor hallucis brevis, and is inserted into the base of the last phalanx of the great toe. The grooves on the talus and calcaneus, which contain the tendon of the muscle, are converted by tendinous fibers into distinct canals lined by a mucous sheath. As the tendon passes forward in the sole of the foot, it is situated above and crosses from the lateral to the medial side of the tendon of the flexor digitorum longus, to which it is connected by a fibrous slip. Variations Usually a slip runs to the flexor digitorum, and frequently an additional slip runs from the flexor digitorum to the flexor hallucis. Peroneocalcaneus internus, rare, origin below or outside the flexor hallucis from the back of the fibula, passes over the sustentaculum talli with the flexor hallucis, and is inserted into the calcaneum. The flexor digitorum longus is situated on the tibial side of the leg. At its origin it is thin and pointed, but it gradually increases in size as it descends. It arises from the posterior surface of the body of the tibia, from immediately below the popliteal line to within seven or eight centimeters of its lower extremity, medial to the tibial origin of the tibialis posterior. It also arises from the fascia covering the tibialis posterior. The fibers end in a tendon, which runs nearly the whole length of the posterior surface of the muscle. This tendon passes behind the medial malleolus in a groove common to it and the tibialis posterior, but separated from the latter by a fibrous septum, each tendon being contained in a special compartment lined by a separate mucous sheath. It passes obliquely forward and lateralward, superficial to the deltoid ligament of the ankle joint, into the sole of the foot, where it crosses below the tendon of the flexor hallucis longus, and receives from it a strong tendinous slip. It then expands and is joined by the quadratus plantae, 
and finally divides into four tendons which are inserted into the bases of the last phalanges of the second, third, fourth, and fifth toes, each tendon passing through an opening in the corresponding tendon of the flexor digitorum brevis, opposite the base of the first phalanx. Variations Flexor accessorius longus digitorum, not infrequent, origin from fibula or tibia or the deep fascia, and ending in a tendon which, after passing beneath the licinate ligament, joins the tendon of the long flexor or the quadratus plantae. The tibialis posterior, tibialis posticus, lies between the two preceding muscles and is the most deeply seated of the muscles on the back of the leg. It begins above by two pointed processes, separated by an angular interval, through which the anterior tibial vessels pass forward to the front of the leg. It arises from the whole of the posterior surface of the interosseous membrane, excepting its lowest part, from the lateral portion of the posterior surface of the body of the tibia, between the commencement of the popliteal line above and the junction of the middle and lower thirds of the body below, and from the upper two-thirds of the medial surface of the fibula. Some fibers also arise from the deep transverse fascia and from the intermuscular septa, separating it from the adjacent muscles. In the lower fourth of the leg, its tendon passes in front of that of the flexor digitorum longus, and lies with it in a groove behind the medial malleolus, but enclosed in a separate sheath. It next passes under the liciniate and over the deltoid ligament into the foot, and then beneath the plantar calcaneonavicular ligament. The tendon contains a sesamoid fibrocartilage, as it runs under the plantar calcaneonavicular ligament. It is inserted into the tuberosity of the navicular bone, and gives off fibrous expansions, one of which passes backward to the sustentaculum talli of the calcaneus, others forward and lateralward to the three cuneiforms, the cuboid, and the bases of the second, third, and fourth metatarsal bones. Nerves the popliteus is supplied by the fourth and fifth lumbar and first sacral nerves, the flexor digitorum longus and tibialis posterior by the fifth lumbar and first sacral, and the flexor hallucis longus by the fifth lumbar and the first and second sacral nerves through the tibial nerve. Actions The popliteus assists in flexing the leg upon the thigh. When the leg is flexed, it will rotate the tibia inward. It is especially called into action at the beginning of the act of bending the knee, inasmuch as it produces the slight inward rotation of the tibia, which is essential in the early stage of this movement. The tibialis posterior is a direct extensor of the foot at the ankle joint. Acting in conjunction with the tibialis anterior, it turns the sole of the foot upward and medialward, i.e., inverts the foot, antagonizing the perineae, which turn it upward and lateralward, or evert it. In the sole of the foot, the tendon of the tibialis posterior lies directly below the plantar calcaneonavicular ligament, and is therefore an important factor in maintaining the arch of the foot. The flexor digitorum longus and flexor hallucis longus are the direct flexors of the phalanges, and, continuing their action, extend the foot upon the leg. They assist the gastrocnemius and soleus in extending the foot, as in the act of walking, or in standing on tiptoe. In consequence of the oblique direction of its tendons, the flexor digitorum longus would draw the toes medialward, were it not for the quadratus plantae, which is inserted into the lateral side of the tendon, and draws it to the middle line of the foot. Taking their fixed point from the foot, these muscles serve to maintain the upright posture by steadying the tibia and fibula perpendicularly upon the talus. 3. The lateral crural muscles, perineus longus, perineus brevis. The perineus longus is situated at the upper part of the lateral side of the leg, and is the more superficial of the two muscles. It arises from the head and upper two-thirds of the lateral surface of the body of the fibula from the deep surface of the fascia, and from the intermuscular septa between it and the muscles on the front and back of the leg, occasionally also by a few fibers from the lateral condyle of the tibia. 
Between its attachments to the head and to the body of the fibula, there is a gap through which the common perineal nerve passes to the front of the leg. It ends in a long tendon, which runs behind the lateral malleolus, in a groove common to it and the tendon of the perineus brevis, behind which it lies. The groove is converted into a canal by the superior perineal retinaculum, and the tendons in it are contained in a common mucous sheath. The tendon then extends obliquely forward across the lateral side of the calcaneus, below the trochlear process, and the tendon of the perineus brevis, and under cover of the inferior perineal retinaculum. It crosses the lateral side of the cuboid, and then runs on the under surface of that bone, in a groove which is converted into a canal by the long plantar ligament. The tendon then crosses the sole of the foot obliquely, and is inserted into the lateral side of the base of the first metatarsal bone, and the lateral side of the first cuneiform. Occasionally it sends a slip to the base of the second metatarsal bone. The tendon changes its direction at two points, first behind the lateral malleolus, secondly on the cuboid bone. In both of these situations the tendon is thickened, and in the latter a sesamoid fibrocartilage, sometimes a bone, is usually developed in its substance. The perineus brevis lies under cover of the perineus longus, and is a shorter and smaller muscle. It arises from the lower two-thirds of the lateral surface of the body of the fibula, medial to the perineus longus, and from the intermuscular septa separating it from the adjacent muscles on the front and back of the leg. The fibers pass vertically downward and end in a tendon which runs behind the lateral malleolus, along with, but in front of, that of the preceding muscle, the two tendons being enclosed in the same compartment and lubricated by a common mucous sheath. It then runs forward on the lateral side of the calcaneus, above the trochlear process and the tendon of the perineus longus, and is inserted into the tuberosity at the base of the fifth metatarsal bone on its lateral side. On the lateral surface of the calcaneus, the tendons of the perinei longus and brevis occupy separate osseoaponeurotic canals formed by the calcaneus and the perineal retinacula. Each tendon is enveloped by a forward prolongation of the common mucous sheath. Variations. Fusion of the two perinei is rare. A slip from the perineus longus to the base of the third, fourth, or fifth metatarsal bone, or to the adductor hallucis, is occasionally seen. Perineus accessorius, origin from the fibula between the longus and brevis, joins the tendon of the longus in the sole of the foot. Perineus quinti digiti, rare origin lower fourth of the fibula, under the brevis, insertion into the extensor aponeurosis of the little toe, more common as a slip of the tendon of the perineus brevis. Perineus cortis, 13%, gruber, origin back of fibula between the brevis and the flexor hallucis, insertion into the perineal spine of the calcaneum, peroneocalcaneus externum, or, less frequently, into the tuberosity of the cuboid, peroneocuboideus. Nerves. The perinei longus and brevis are supplied by the fourth and fifth lumbar and first sacral nerves through the superficial perineal nerve. Actions. The perinei longus and brevis extend the foot upon the leg, in conjunction with the tibialis posterior, antagonizing the tibialis anterior and perineus tertius, which are flexors of the foot. The perineus longus also everts the sole of the foot, and from the oblique direction of the tendon across the sole of the foot is an important agent in the maintenance of the transverse arch. Taking their fixed points below, the perinei serve to steady the leg upon the foot. This is especially the case in standing upon one leg, when the tendency of the superincumbent weight is to throw the leg medialward. The perineus longus overcomes this tendency by drawing on the lateral side of the leg. End of section 53。section 54 of Gray's Anatomy, Part 2。this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray The Fasciae Around the Ankle Fibrous bands, or thickened portions of the fascia, bind down the tendons in front of and behind the ankle in their passage to the foot. They comprise three ligaments, that is, the transverse cruel, the cruciate cruel, and the laciniate, and the superior and inferior perineal retinacula. Transverse cruel ligament. Ligamentum transversum cruris. Upper part of anterior annular ligament. The transverse cruel ligament binds down the tendons of extensor digitorum longus, extensor hallucis longus, perineus tertius, and tibialis anterior, as they descend on the front of the tibia and fibula. Under it are found also the anterior tibial vessels and deep perineal nerve. It is attached laterally to the lower end of the fibula, and medially to the tibia. Above, it is continuous with the fascia of the leg. Cruciate Cruel Ligament Ligamentum Cruciatum Cruris Lower part of anterior annular ligament The cruciate cruel ligament is a Y-shaped band placed in front of the ankle joint, the stem of the Y being attached laterally to the upper surface of the calcaneus, in front of the depression for the interosseous talocanian ligament. It is directed medialward as a double layer, one lamina passing in front of and the other behind, the tendons of the perineus tertius and extensor digitorum longus. At the medial border of the latter tendon, these two layers join together, forming a compartment in which the tendons are enclosed. From the medial extremity of this sheath, the two limbs of the Y diverge. One is directed upward and medialward, to be attached to the tibial malleolus passing over the extensor hallucis longus and the vessels and nerves, but enclosing the tibialis anterior by a splitting of its fibers. The other limb extends downward and medialward to be attached to the border of the plantar aponeurosis, and passes over the tendons of the extensor hallucis longus and tibialis anterior, and also the vessels and nerves. Laciniate Ligament Ligamentum laciniatum, internal annular ligament. The laciniate ligament is a strong fibrous band, extending from the tibial malleolus above to the margin of the calcaneus below, converting a series of bony grooves in this situation into canals for the passage of the tendons of the flexor muscles and the posterior tibial vessels and the tibial nerve into the sole of the foot. It is continuous by its upper border with the deep fascia of the leg, and by its lower border with the plantar aponeurosis, and the fibers of origin of the abductor hyacinth muscle. Enumerated from the medial side, the four canals which it forms transmit the tendon of the tibialis posterior, the tendon of the flexor digitorum longus, the posterior tibial vessels and tibial nerve, which run through a broad space beneath the ligament, and lastly, in a canal formed partly by the talus, the tendon of the flexor hallucis longus. Perineal Retinacula The perineal retinacula are fibrous bands which bind down the tendons of the perinei longus and brevis, as they run across the lateral side of the ankle. The fibers of the superior retinaculum external annular ligament, are attached above to the latter malleolus and below to the lateral surface of the calcaneus. The fibers of the inferior retinaculum are continuous in front with those of the cruciate cruel ligament. Behind, they are attached to the lateral surface of the calcaneus. Some of the fibers are fixed to the perineal trochlea, forming a septum between the tendons of the perinei longus and brevis. The mucus sheaths of the tendons around the ankle. 
All the tendons crossing the ankle joint are enclosed for part of their length in mucus sheaths, which have an almost uniform length of about eight centimeters each. On the front of the ankle, the sheath for the tibialis anterior extends from the upper margin of the transverse cruel ligament to the interval between the diverging limbs of the cruciate ligament. Those for the extensor digitorum longus and extensor hyacis longus reach upward to just above the level of the tips of the malleoli, the former being the higher. The sheath of the extensor hyacis longus is prolonged on the base of the first metatarsal bone, while that of the extensor digitorum longus reaches only to the level of the base of the fifth metatarsal. On the medial side of the ankle, the sheath for the tibialis posterior extends highest up, to about four centimeters above the tip of the malleolus, while below it stops just short of the tuberosity of the navicular. The sheath for the flexor hyacis longus reaches up to the level of the tip of the malleolus, while that for the flexor digitorum longus is slightly higher. The former is continued to the base of the first metatarsal, but the latter stops opposite the first cuneiform bone. On the lateral side of the ankle, a sheath, which is single for the greater part of its extent, encloses the perinei longus and brevis. It extends upward for about four centimeters above the tip of the malleolus, and downward and forward for about the same distance. End of section 54、section、55 of Gray's Anatomy Part、two. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by The Bodster. Anatomy of the Human Body Part、two、by Henry Gray. Section 8E. The muscles and fascia of the foot. The dorsal muscle of the foot, extensor digitorum brevis. The fascia on the dorsum of the foot is a thin membranous layer, continuous above with the transverse and cruciate crural ligaments. On either side, it blends with the plantar aponeurosis. Anteriorly, it forms a sheath for the tendons on the dorsum of the foot. The extensor digitorum brevis is a broad, thin muscle which arises from the forepart of the upper and lateral surfaces of the calcaneus, in front of the groove for the peroneus brevis, from the lateral talocalcanean ligament, and from the common limb of the cruciate crural ligament. It passes obliquely across the dorsum of the foot, and ends in four tendons. The most medial, which is the largest, is inserted into the dorsal surface. Of the base of the first phalanx of the great toe, crossing the dorsalis pedis artery. It is frequently described as a separate muscle, the extensor hallucis brevis. The other three are inserted into the lateral sides of the tendon of the extensor digitorum longus of the second, third, and fourth toes. Variations. Accessory slips of origin from the talus and navicula. Or from the external cuneiform and third metatarsal bones to the second slip of the muscle, and one from the cuboid to the third slip, have been observed. The tendons vary in number and position; they may be reduced to two, or one of them may be doubled, or an additional slip may pass to the little toe. A supernumerary slip ending on one of the metatarsophalangeal articulations. Or joining a dorsal interosseous muscle is not uncommon. Deep slips between the muscle and the dorsal interosseae occur. Nerves. It is supplied by the deep peroneal nerve. Actions. The extensor digitorum brevis extends the phalanges of the four toes into which it is inserted, but in the great toe acts only on the first phalanx. The obliquity of its direction counteracts the oblique movement given to the toes by the long extensor, so that when both muscles act, the toes are evenly extended. The plantar muscles of the foot. Plantar aponeurosis, aponeurosis plantaris, plantar fascia. The plantar aponeurosis is of great strength. 
and consists of pearly white glistening fibres, disposed for the most part longitudinally. It is divided into central, lateral and media portions. The central portion, the thickest, is narrow behind and attached to the medial process of the tuberosity of the calcaneus, posterior to the origin of the flexor digitorum brevis, and becoming broader and thinner in front, divides near the heads of the metatarsal bones into five processes, one for each of the toes. Each of these processes divides opposite the metatarsophalangeal articulation into two strata, superficial and deep. The superficial stratum is inserted into the skin of the transverse sulcus, which separates the toes from the sole. The deeper stratum divides into two slips which embrace the side of the flexor tendons of the toes and blend with the sheaths of the tendons and with the transverse metatarsal ligament, thus forming a series of arches through which the tendons of the short and long flexors pass to the toes. The intervals left between the five processes allow the digital vessels and nerves and the tendons of the lumbricales to become superficial. At the point of division of the aponeurosis, numerous transverse fasciculi are superadded. These serve to increase the strength of the aponeurosis at this part by binding the processes together and connecting them with the integument. The central portion of the plantar aponeurosis is continuous with the lateral and medial portions that sends upward to the foot at the lines of junction two strong vertical intermuscular septa, broader in front than behind, which separate the intermediate from the lateral and medial plantar groups of muscles. From these again are derived thinner transverse septa, which separate the various layers of muscles in this region. The upper surface of this aponeurosis gives origin behind to the flexor digitorum brevis. The lateral and medial portions of the plantar aponeurosis are thinner than the central piece and cover the sides of the sole of the foot. The lateral portion covers the undersurface of the abductor digiti quinti. It is thin in front and thick behind, where it forms a strong band between the lateral process of the tuberosity of the calcaneus and the base of the fifth metatarsal bone. It is continuous medially with the central portion of the plantar aponeurosis and laterally with the dorsal fascia. The medial portion is thin and covers the undersurface of the abductor hallucis. It is attached behind to the laciniate ligament and is continuous around the side of the foot with the dorsal fascia and laterally with the central portion of the plantar aponeurosis. The muscles in the plantar region of the foot may be divided into three groups, in a similar manner to those in the hand. Those of the medial plantar region are connected with the great toe and correspond with those of the thumb. Those of the lateral plantar region are connected with the little toe and correspond with those of the little finger. And those of the intermediate plantar region are connected with the tendons intervening between the two former groups. But in order to facilitate the description of these muscles, it is more convenient to divide them into four layers in the order in which they are successively exposed. The first layer. Abductor hallucis, flexor digitorum brevis, and abductor digiti quinti. The abductor hallucis lies along the medial border of the foot and covers the origins of the plantar vessels and nerves. It arises from the medial process of the tuberosity of the calcaneus, from the laciniate ligament and from the plantar aponeurosis, and from the intermuscular septum between it and the flexor digitorum brevis. The fibres end in a tendon, which is inserted together with the medial tendon of the flexor hallucis brevis, into the tibial side of the base of the phalanx of the great toe. Variations slip to the base of the first phalanx of the second toe. The flexor digitorum brevis lies in the middle of the sole of the foot, immediately above the central part of the plantar aponeurosis, with which it is firmly united. Its deep surface is separated from the lateral plantar vessels and nerves by a thin layer of fascia. It arises by a narrow tendon from the medial process of the tuberosity of the calcaneus from the central part of the plantar aponeurosis 
and from the intermuscular scepter between it and the adjacent muscles. It passes forward and divides into four tendons, one for each of the four lesser toes. Opposite the bases of the first phalanges, each tendon divides into two slips to allow the passage of the corresponding tendon of the flexor digitorum longus. The two portions of the tendon then unite and form a grooved channel for the reception of the accompanying long flexor tendon. Finally, it divides a second time and is inserted into the sides of the second phalanx about its middle. The mode of division of the tendons of the flexor digitorum brevis and of their insertion into the phalanges is analogous to that of the tendons of the flexor digitorum sublimus in the hand. Variations. Slip to the little toe frequently wanting, 23%, or it may be replaced by a small fusiform muscle arising from the long flexor tendon or from the quadratus plantae. Fibrous sheaths of the flexor tendons. The terminal portions of the tendons of the long and short flexor muscles are contained in the osseoaponeurotic canals similar in their arrangement to those in the fingers. These canals are formed above by the phalanges and below by the fibrous bands which arch across the tendons and are attached on either side to the margins of the phalanges. Opposite the bodies of the proximal and second phalanges, the fibrous bands are strong and the fibres are transverse, but opposite the joints they are much thinner and the fibres are directed obliquely. Each canal contains a mucous sheath which is reflected on the contained tendons. The abductor digiti quinti, abductor minimi digiti, lies along the lateral border of the foot and is in relation to its medial margin with the lateral plantar vessels and nerves. It arises, by a broad origin, from the lateral process of the tuberosity of the calcaneus, from the undersurface of the calcaneus between the two processes of the tuberosity, from the forepart of the medial process, from the plantar aponeurosis, and from the intermuscular septum between it and the flexor digitorum brevis. Its tendon, after gliding over a smooth facet on the undersurface of the base of the fifth metatarsal bone, is inserted, with the flexor digiti quinti brevis, into the fibular side of the base of the first phalanx of the fifth toe. Variations. Slips of origin from the tuberosity at the base of the fifth metatarsal. Abductor ossus metatarsi quinti, origin external tubercle of the calcaneus, insertion into the tuberosity of the fifth metatarsal bone in common with or beneath the outer margin of the plantar fascia. The second layer, quadratus plantae and lumbricalis. The quadratus plantae, flexor accessorius, is separated from the muscles of the first layer by the lateral plantar vessels and nerve. It arises by two heads, which are separated from each other by the long plantar ligament. The medial or larger head is muscular and is attached to the medial concave surface of the calcaneus below the groove which lodges the tendon of the flexor hallucis longus. The lateral head, flat and tendinous, arises from the lateral border of the inferior surface of the calcaneus in front of the lateral process of its tuberosity and from the long plantar ligament. The two portions join at an acute angle and end in a flattened band which is inserted into the lateral margin and upper and under surfaces of the tendon of the flexor digitorum longus, forming a kind of groove in which the tendon is lodged. It usually sends slips to those tendons of the flexor digitorum longus which pass to the second, third and fourth toes. Variations. Lateral head often wanting, entire muscle absent. Variation in the number of digital tendons to which fibres can be traced. Most frequent offsets are sent to the second, third and fourth toes, in many cases to the fifth as well, occasionally to two toes only. The lumbricalis are four small muscles, accessory to the tendons of the flexor digitorum longus and numbered from the medial side of the foot. They arise from these tendons as far back as their angles of division, each springing from two tendons, except the first. The muscles end in tendons, which pass forward on the medial sides of the four lesser toes and are inserted into the expansions of the tendons of the extensor digitorum longus on the dorsal surfaces of the first phalanges. 
variations, absence of one or more, doubling of the third or fourth, insertion partly or wholly into the first phalanges. The third layer, flexor hallucis brevis, adductor hallucis, flexor digiti quinti brevis. The flexor hallucis brevis arises by a pointed tenderness process from the medial part of the undersurface of the cuboid bone, from the contiguous portion of the third cuneiform, and from the prolongation of the tendon of the tibialis posterior, which is attached to that bone. It divides in front into two portions, which are inserted into the medial and lateral sides of the base of the first phalanx of the great toe, a sesamoid bone being present in each tendon at its insertion. The medial portion is blended with the abductor hallucis previous to its insertion, the lateral portion of the adductor hallucis. The tendon of the flexor hallucis longus lies in a groove between them. The lateral portion is sometimes described as the first interosseous plantaris. Variations. Origin subject to considerable variation. It often receives fibres from the calcaneus or long plantar ligament. Attachment to the cuboid, sometimes wanting. Slip to first phalanx of second toe. The adductor hallucis, adductor obliquus hallucis, arises by two heads, oblique and transverse. The oblique head is a large, thick, fleshy mass, crossing the foot obliquely and occupying the hollow space under the first, second, third and fourth metatarsal bones. It arises from the bases of the second, third and fourth metatarsal bones and from the sheath of the tendon of the peroneus longus and is inserted together with the lateral portion of the flexor hallucis brevis, into the lateral side of the base of the first phalanx of the great toe. The transverse head, transversus pedis, is a narrow, flat fasciculus, which arises from the plantar, metatarsophalangeal ligaments of the third, fourth and fifth toes, sometimes only from the third and fourth, and from the transverse ligament of the metatarsus. It is inserted into the lateral side of the base of the first phalanx of the great toe, its fibres blending with the tendon of insertion of the oblique head. Variations. Slips to the base of the first phalanx of the second toe, opponens hallucis, occasional slips from the adductor to the metatarsal bone of the great toe. The abductor, flexor brevis and adductor of the great toe like the similar muscles of the thumb, give off, at their insertions, fibrous expansions to blend with the tendons of the extensor digitorum longus. The flexor digiti quinti brevis, flexor brevis minimi digiti, lies under the metatarsal bone of the little toe, and resembles one of the interossi. It arises from the base of the fifth metatarsal bone, and from the sheath of the perioneus longus. Its tendon is inserted into the lateral side of the base of the first phalanx of the fifth toe. Occasionally, a few of the deeper fibres are inserted into the lateral part of the distal half of the fifth metatarsal bone. These are described by some as a distinct muscle, the opponens digiti quinti. The fourth layer, interossei. The interossei in the foot are similar to those in the hand, with this exception that they are grouped around the middle line of the second digit instead of that of the third. They are seven in number and consist of two groups, dorsal and plantar. The interossei dorsalis, dorsalis interossei, four in number, are situated between the metatarsal bones. They are bipenniform muscles, each arising by two heads from the adjacent sides of the metatarsal bones between which it is placed. Their tendons are inserted into the bases of the first phalanges, and into the aponeurosis of the tendons of the extensor digitorum longus. In the angular interval left between the heads of each of the three lateral muscles, one of the perforating arteries passes to the dorsum of the foot. Through the space between the heads of the first muscle, the deep plantar branch of the dorsalis pedis artery enters the sole of the foot. The first is inserted into the medial side of the second toe. The other three are inserted into the lateral sides of the second, third and fourth toes. The interossei plantaris, plantar interossei, three in number, lie beneath rather than between the metatarsal bones 
and each is connected with but one metatarsal bone. They arise from the bases and medial sides of the bodies of the third, fourth and fifth metatarsal bones and are inserted into the medial sides of the bases of the first phalanges of the same toes and into the aponeuroses of the tendons of the extensor digitorum longus. Nerves The flexor digitorum brevis, the flexor hallucis brevis, the abductor hallucis and the first lumbricalis are supplied by the medial plantar nerve, all the other muscles in the sole of the foot by the lateral plantar. The first interosseous dorsalis frequently receives an extra filament from the medial branch of the deep perineal nerve on the dorsum of the foot, and the second interosseous dorsalis a twig from the lateral branch of the same nerve. Actions All the muscles of the foot act upon the toes and may be grouped as abductors, adductors, flexors or extensors. The abductors are the interossei dorsalis, the abductor hallucis and the abductor digiti quinti. The interossei dorsalis are abductors from an imaginary line passing through the axis of the second toe, so that the first muscle draws the second toe medialward toward the great toe. The second muscle draws the same toe lateralward, and the third and fourth draw the third and fourth toes in the same direction. Like the interossei in the hand, each assists in flexing the first phalanx and extending the second and third phalanges. The abductor hallucis abducts the great toe from the second and also flexes its proximal phalanx. In the same way, the action of the abductor digiti quinti is twofold, as an abductor of this toe from the fourth and also as a flexor of its proximal phalanx. The adductors are the interossei plantaris and the adductor hallucis. The interossei plantaris adduct the third, fourth and fifth toes towards the imaginary line passing through the second toe, and by means of their insertions into the aponeuroses of the extensor tendons, they assist in flexing the proximal phalanges and extending the middle and terminal phalanges. The oblique head of the adductor hallucis is chiefly concerned in adducting the great toe toward the second one, but also assists in flexing this toe. The transverse head approximates all the toes and thus increases the curve of the transverse arch of the metatarsus. The flexors are the flexor digitorum brevis, the quadratus plantae, the flexor hallucis brevis, the flexor digiti quinti brevis, and the lumbricalis. The flexor digitorum brevis flexes the second phalanges upon the first, and continuing its action, flexes the first phalanges also and brings the toes together. The quadratus plantae assists the flexor digitorum longus and converts the oblique pull of the tendons of that muscle into a direct backward pull upon the toes. The flexor digiti quinti brevis flexes the little toe and draws its metatarsal bone downward and medialward. The lumbricalis, like the corresponding muscles in the hand, assist in flexing the proximal phalanges and by their insertions into the tendons of the extensor digitorum longus, aid that muscle in straightening the middle and terminal phalanges. The extensor digitorum brevis extends the first phalanx of the great toe and assists the long extensor in extending the next three toes, and at the same time gives to the toes a lateral direction when they are extended. End of section 55, and also the end of Anatomy of the Human Body, Part 2, by Henry Gray. Recording by The Bodster.